Your pages have numbers, by the way, which is unusual for me, as you know. And so um, um, let's start at page four. <laughs> um, <laughs> it looks like that. And uh, I presume that, um, that probably all of you, well, let me do it the other way. Is there anybody in here who has not read Think and Grow Rich? Elliot, really? You're kidding me. Did you raise your hand too? I've read it all. <laughs> it, it, well, it ain't that thick. I mean, you know. I mean, I know you're skinny, but you got to go. To the, you go to the bathroom once a day, don't you? You know, a couple pages every day. I mean, in a month or so, you're done, you know, unless you're stopped up. I mean, <laughs> gee whiz. Um, <laughs> Jim, Jim Rohn used to talk about recommending the book to people when it was still only in hardcover and have people tell them, well, you know, I'm going to wait till it comes out in paperback. Um, uh, may I make a recommendation? Yeah. Uh, uh, how many of Red Hill's other stuff? The, the laws of success that it came from, uh, Grow Rich with Peace of Mind, uh, not so many. Best book, best book of the bunch. You should, you should get your hands on uh, that one. It's the one he wrote latest in life, and uh, it's probably uh, Grow Rich with Peace of Mind. Um, it's probably the best of the bunch. Uh, how about uh, Succeed and Grow Rich Through Persuasion? Oh, hardly any. Isn't that interesting? Was that by Hill? Napoleon Hill. Uh, it was written for a uh, company called Holiday Magic, which was a, uh, a what today we would call multi-level, um, what the regulatory folks call pyramid scheme. Uh, it was written for a guy by the name of William Penpatrick at Holiday Magic um, as a combination sales tool for the distributors and a credibility device for Penn Patrick and Holiday Magic because he's all through the book. You don't know looking at it that it was written for Holiday Magic. That in fact was the point. Uh, as an aside, by the way, you can trace a lot of the self-improvement industry back to that. Um, um, uh, uh, Zig was in Holiday Magic, um, Warner Earhart, was in Holiday Magic before he was called Warner Earhart. Um, uh, Jim Rohn, who of course essentially birthed Tony. Um, and so you can trace the lineage of a lot of this back to Penn Patrick. Uh, anyway, so you're all familiar with, uh, with uh, Hill's work. Oh, and Phil brought me, which I'll show you later because there's something in it I want to quote. Um, Phil Alexander, who's all the way in the back next to the camera, um, Phil is a great finder of, of ancient artifacts, uh, and he's got two copies of the Napoleon Hill magazine from 1921, uh, which sold for 25 cents a copy, by the way, and um, was one of the many uh, Hill business ventures that lasted a relatively short period of time, so there's not a lot of additions, but it's a real interesting thing to see. Um, what a lot of people are not real cognizant of, and I want to be careful about this because I don't want to in any way invalidate uh, anything in the books, um, but like so many of us, there's a vast difference between um, identifying what works, putting what works down in a book, and then actually doing it. And um, uh, Hill uh, spent the latter years of his life fundamentally broke. And uh, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, but uh, at one point in time, um, um, I remember seeing a classified ad in Success Magazine where he, his original uh, typewriter was for sale for 50 bucks or best bid above 50. Um, and um, Hill was, Napoleon Hill was basically rescued late in life by Clem Stone and uh, put to work as a sales trainer. 
four combined insurance companies of America. And um, uh, that was like pretty much the last things he did in his career before he retired. And Stone basically kind of made him economically whole. Uh, but when Stone got him, he was basically broke. By the way, there's another product you might want. Nightingale Conant has, and they don't advertise it, but they have a set of videos of Napoleon Hill uh, the title of which completely escapes me, but what they really are, they're black and white, and what they really are are films of the sales training classes uh, at Clemstone's insurance company. And I think they're the only video available with Hill on them. Phil, you can, prob you can probably find a set on uh, eBay, God help us all, for $18.72 or something, but I think they're 300 bucks if you buy them from Nightingale, and and undoubtedly one of the reasons Nightingale doesn't advertise them much is their underwear tightens up at the thought of asking anybody for three hundred dollars. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but but they do have them, and they will grudgingly let you buy them if you if you pursue them. Uh, and I recommend them; they're they're really fascinating. Uh, anyway, uh, Hill, who you know more. According to Inc. Magazine, more self-made millionaires put Think and Grow Rich on their list of books that have influenced them than any other book other than the Bible. And um, um, just about everybody in my circle, I mean, you couldn't walk into one of my client's offices and not find the whole library. And, uh, so here's the guy who wrote, if you will, the, um, the Bible about... Uh, prosperity who winds up broke and isn't that disturbing and why is that and Clem Stone who was inspired by Napoleon Hill's work winds up very 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 rich uh, Stone finally he passed away not too long ago uh, at the ripe old age of 212 or something <laughs> and, uh, 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 um, basically he was he was he, he was too mean to die uh, um, I'm sure that was one of those funerals where there were people there out of respect and there were people there who wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, um, he, uh, we, I met him and spent a little time with him when we did the Think and Grow Rich infomercial at Guthy Ranker. And uh, he, 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 he was then way up there and uh, tough as nails. Uh, but he and now the Napoleon Hill Foundation, which he created, own all the intellectual property rights to all of the Hill stuff, and they believe they own the rights to, like, any word that might somewhere have been said once by Napoleon Hill. Um, and um, they, they have a very aggressive law firm. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one I know. How, anybody in here uh, deal with that yet besides me? You have, haven't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, Phil, you have. Um, they, they actually uh, will come after you for using the word success or uh, philosophy. Um, and, <laughs> and pretty aggressively, too. Um, uh, but uh, they, they, they and Disney, I think, are the two most aggressive protectors of intellectual property on the planet. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, so Stone winds up really, really, really rich, and Hill winds up really, really, really poor, although for a brief period in his time in his life, he was loaded. He was what the millionaire next door guys call, what the financial planning industry calls, high income underinvested, um, uh, and having, meaning Rolls Royces, um, you know, um, overbuilt mansions that when they are sold, they sell for 20% of what they cost to build, that kind of stuff. Um, um, having been one of those myself, I have some empathy for them. Uh, but uh, anyway, he winds up broke, Stone winds up rich. And um, when I first heard this, um, it was disturbing to me. And then my curiosity was enormously aroused. And um, one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit uh, today and wind up with. Uh, what I'll end with today is the paramount and primary reason I believe that um, 
that, uh, that Stone was rich and Hill was poor. Uh, but one is that uh, Napoleon Hill had a philosophy built upon mostly observation, research, interviews. You guys all know the story, um, which like all stories, incidentally, is slightly romanticized. Um, uh, but um, uh, predominantly through observation, he had a philosophy. Stone took it and applied it, um, and the key word is applied or application, in an environment where it had a reasonable opportunity to produce money. And there's a real practical lesson there, um, uh, which we'll come back to. The first half of the day, I thought we'd spend on the, somebody asked a question, uh, it's in the questions, the stack of questions, um, about me often referring to metaphysical stuff as, you know, airy-fairy, uh, you know, sort of in a joking, or they took it as a derogatory manner, and then, but you use it. And um, I took a class once in metaphysics, by the way. I failed the final exam. I was caught cheating, looking into the soul of the person next to me. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, that's for you. You, you can use it. Um, um, I, uh, I've tried to, to approach these things from a practical standpoint. And I find that a whole lot of the people who talk about this stuff, a whole lot of the people I've read, a whole lot of the people that I've met, uh, their flaw in the ointment, in my opinion, is they uh, are in, Dick Sutphin used to call them the sackcloth and ashes crowd. Um, uh, 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 you know, they're into every part of the metaphysics except practical application. And, uh, you know, you can't, I had an early mentor who said you can't eat philosophy. And uh, you can't go down to the bank and put philosophy on a bank deposit slip. Uh, and uh, he's, he's absolutely right. And so practical application is, is critically important. But there are some conceptual things. And so I thought the first half of the day we talk about some conceptual things. Um, and uh, during the course of the day, uh, I know there's, there's a couple of people came up this morning, again, impressed me. I know there's immense curiosity about um, uh, my personal sort of rituals and use of these things, which I'll be happy to tell you. Uh, but a lot of what I have to tell you is also from observation. Uh, one of the neat things about the way I've made my living is uh, I've got to hang around with a whole lot of uh, very affluent people, most of whom uh, did not start with much and have built large incomes and in many cases, some of them just large incomes and no wealth, but in many cases, um, a great deal of uh, wealth. And uh, I tried to figure it up before this seminar. I actually went through old client lists and current client lists. And I finally stopped at 130 some odd people that I, that I know for a fact are in the double digit millions to $10 million net worth range who pretty much were at, at zero or you know just a decent income but no real wealth um, uh, at one point in time. And so I've spent a lot of time with 130 plus of these people, more time with some than others. And um, in recent years, I've seen a fair number of people. We commented on it yesterday. Those of you that weren't here yesterday, the difference between the, uh, the growth that has occurred, and this is a compliment, by the way, for many of you, the growth that has occurred in many of the people who are at this alumni event from as recently as the prior alumni event uh, is striking, and, and, and the growth is in two areas. It's in mechanical or technical skill. I mean, the, the effectiveness of their marketing, what they had to show versus what they had shown us before, um, uh, uh, their, the improvement in their copywriting skills, the improvement in their ability to craft offers, all of that um, is really quite remarkable. Uh, and there are any number of people in this room who've gone in the last two or three years from 
modest incomes to very big incomes. A number of people in this room who their current monthly income was their annual income. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, um, uh, it, 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 there's commonalities there too. You watch enough of them, you notice a few things. Um, the other kind of growth is attitudinal, which is a little harder to put your finger on, but, you know, it's a closed loop. Um, so I thought we'd do the conceptual stuff this morning and uh, then the practical application stuff this afternoon. And, uh, and if we have time, which I suspect we will, a bunch of you have turned in questions. Um, this time I've looked at them. Um, <laughs> and uh, thrown out a few, um, none of which rival the first question of uh, yesterday. Um, so. You should be on page number five. And page five and six, actually. Um, people actually think, and, and get ingrained in their heads, that there's some kind of zero-sum game going on here that money taken from this person and moved to this person um, enriches this person at the expense of that person. And um, uh, certainly the liberal politicians either believe it or pander to it, one or the other. Uh, but a whole lot of people have it operating at a beneath the surface level that affects a lot of what they do and, um, and inhibits uh, them in a lot of different ways. What they'll charge, for example, uh, who they'll ask for money. Uh, everybody in direct sales, um, Zig has a true story, uh, Glenn Turner has a true story, I've got a true story. Everybody who's ever done direct sales much by the way, is Bill Dris Driscoll here today, or did Bill leave? Oh, Bill's here? Okay. I'll bet you got a story. Because um, um, what's the current price point for an uh, average house for a fire alarm installation? Uh, $17,800. Okay. Um, what, 10 years ago, $800? $900? $900. Yeah, okay. So 10 years ago, my frame of reference for a fire alarm sale, a vacuum cleaner sale, uh, a water purifier sale, a pot and pan sale, about 800 bucks. 20 years ago, 500, right? Yeah. And now you guys have got it up to 1,700. Um, so this salesman, by the way, if any of you ever, let's see, how many of you have had a pot and pan pitch made to you in your house? God, you guys are deprived. How many of you have had a vacuum cleaner pitch made to you in your house? Okay, there's more of that. How many of you have had a fire alarm pitch made, made to you in your house? Oh, good. Hey, guys, somebody's out there. Um, uh, okay, now how many of you have done any one of the three for a living? All right, well, every one of you has this story. All right? Because, oh, let's do books, too. It's like encyclopedia. Okay, there you go. Okay. Every one of you who's done this has some version of this story. You've seen it. Um, uh, and, and now it's 1700 bucks. of course, it's probably even more profound. So the fire alarm salesman with the stuffed Dalmatian under his arm and the, and, 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 and the crying dog film and, the, you know, marches into the house and, and, and discovers that uh, he is in a place of relative poverty, at least by his standards. He is sitting across the table. The two kids uh, are in on a threadbare carpet in the living room. Um, they probably have a good television, but pretty much everything else in the house, um, um, pretty much everything else in the house um, is obviously uh, hand-me-down, beat up, fallen apart, springs sticking up out of the couch seat. Um, uh, you know, it, you just clearly uh, know that these people, you know, aren't doing well. Conversationally, you know, you discover, you know, Papa hadn't worked in four months and, 
you know, the kid's got some kind of problem that causes big medical bills, and on and on and on and on. And uh, the salesperson becomes increasingly queasy about closing these people on the $1,700 fire alarm sale or the, or the what's a vac now? $1,700, bucks, huh? On the $1,700 vacuum cleaner. And so the salesperson becomes increasingly queasy about this. And, um, and in many cases, will not close. He'll deliberately throw the game at the end and uh, toss that one aside and get out of there. Okay. And uh, everybody then who has done this for any period of time has the person who, who rises up in the middle of the weak, wimpy attempt to throw the ball game close and is almost offended that they are not trying to sell it to them. Um, Glenn tells the story of actually being chased uh, by somebody who was mad that he wouldn't sell him a sewing machine. Zig has a similar pot and pan story. Uh, if you've heard Zig's story about the indoor plumbing customer that was saving up the money to put in indoor plumbing, um, and then uh, he backed off and the people were annoyed and they really wanted the pots and pans. Um, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They put indoor plumbing in next year, but, you know, got to get the pots now. And, of course, the pots pay for themselves, you know, because they say, you know. Um, <laughs> so, really, they're free after 24 months of what you saved on utilities. Um, uh, <laughs> the queasiness about price about who somebody is selling to, uh, about their ability to pay, their ability to afford it. Anytime you start to make those decisions for other people, um, uh, it, it really reflects more about what's going on internally with you than it does with anything else. And the other thing to remember is, is that uh, people who are without money that you perceive to be disadvantaged for one reason or another, and you question whether you should uh, sell them something. Regardless of whether you get any of their money or not, they're going to be without money next week too. The reason they're without money has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with your existence, nor does it have to do with the way money works in the real world. It has to do with them. And whether you take it, somebody else takes it, the liquor store takes it, the, the church takes it, whoever takes it, I promise you somebody's getting it. Because if they're without money now, they're going to be without money again. And most of them are going to be without money permanently because they never fix the things that we're talking about that have to do with whether or not you have money. And it happens at all levels. I mean, we have people selling $50,000 programs to doctors um, at one time, uh, Tracy's, I get all confused with familial relationships. Is Rod your uncle? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, Rodney and I were selling a $36,000 program to doctors in the early 80s. And at least 70% of the doctors who bought couldn't afford to pay attention. I mean, let alone a $36,000 program. Uh, but when you're selling help to people, when you're selling, when you're a success merchant, you always, you, there's only two buyers. There's the already extremely successful who don't need it, who buy everything because they practice the principle of a slight edge, and there's the starving and desperate looking for a life raft. The middle is not the market. And so if you only took the rich, you would starve. Um, and so the queasiness has to go away. You got this doctor... Who, uh, who just had his car repossessed, is having trouble keeping the lights on in the office, and uh, um, uh, is getting more calls from bill collectors than he is from new patients, 
and uh, you're going to walk him down to four different finance companies and blast six of his credit cards to get $36,000 from him to put him into a management program. You can't have any queasiness. You can't have any a reluctance. And you have to understand that the reason he's where he is has nothing to do with you, the guy who came before you, the guy who came after you. It all has to do with him. And there's plenty of money to go around. Nobody's ever go run out of dough. And there's no excuse to be broke in America. Anybody can tomorrow start from zero and they can get a bucket and a sponge or they can, you know, and these chiropractors. I mean, it's, I, I know lawyers who are broke. Can you imagine this? <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. They get out of school with a license to steal money. Mm -hmm. And some of these people can't cut it. Well, it has nothing to do with any shortages. It has nothing to do with any money anybody takes from them. It totally has to do with them. There's plenty of dough. And now we have all the recession stuff going on, you know, and the media is desperately trying to sell everybody the idea uh, that things are bad and are going to get worse um, for a variety of reasons. And so some people will believe that now that there's a shortage of money because there's a war. Other people think there's a shortage of money because there's a tax cut. Other people think there's no shortage of money. There's money everywhere. Just walk around, look around, you know. And you got to get past the zero-sum game idea that when somebody gives up money to you that you've profited and they've lost and there's less money over here now than there is over here, the, the money just keeps replenishing. It's always there, it's just some people don't see it, and some people aren't smart enough to bend over and pick it up. But it's always there, and there's plenty of it. The other big thing to get is there's mountains of dumb money out there. Right? And so if you want to, you can more than satisfy your needs just dipping into the pond of dumb money. One of my favorites, this is, I forget what catalog this is from. It's not Neiman Marcus, which you usually find this stuff in Neiman's. It's not Neiman Marcus, but here's, I don't know what catalog this is. Gentleman's Domain. This is owned by Frontgate. This thing's been in for three catalogs. They ain't wasting the space to have fun. For, where's the price point here? The, uh, the Eli Bridge Company in Jacksonville, Illinois. And I give these guys points if they initiated this for getting themselves in a catalog. The Eli Bridge Company um, builds amusement park rides, like the famous Scrambler, which is this thing. Okay. They've been building them for 100 years. And now, for only 300,000 bucks, <laughs> They'll put that thing in your backyard. <laughs> They'll build you a 67-foot high, 16-seat Ferris wheel. You'll need a 220-volt power outlet. Gee, no shit. Um, and since it weighs almost 20 tons, you may want to have the patio checked out before getting started. <laughs> Forrest, Forrest. <laughs> For it. By the way, that's right, you saw the Shed Shop infomercial. The, the, the happy couple with the two sheds in their backyard, the his and her sheds, they're both retired and they're on Social Security and he's got one small pension. They're totally on fixed incomes. Two sheds. One ain't enough. <laughs> the guy with the shed and the big pond in his backyard, you remember him? Oh, you should have heard his sob story. If you heard the sob story first, you would never think this guy's going to pop for 20 grand of landscaping, a koi pond, and a shed in his backyard. I mean, the poor soul hadn't got two nickels. His whole family doesn't have two nickels. But somebody sold him a koi pond. And he likes his koi pond. 
For a $75,000 upsell, you can get the mobile model. <laughs> These guys are funny. That folds for compact storage in, in, in any 80 foot long garage. <laughs> You can take care of this, by the way, on three easy payments. Um, Nokia has a new uh, line of cell phones. And I know there are some of you in the room who like the latest doohickey. So if you don't have this, you got to have it. It's made out of gold and platinum. And it sells for $20,000. It is an experiment in exquisite design and craftsmanship. Oh, it's also large, because obviously you don't want to have a $20,000 phone and have somebody let not see it. <laughs> um, um, remember, years ago, a friend of mine, got rather, I thought, oversized breast implants and began to dress rather provocatively. And her answer to that was, if you buy a new Jaguar, you don't leave it in the garage with a tarp on it. <laughs> um, um, anyway, this, um, this oversized phone, here's how they explain this. There's a size to proportion balance that has a calming effect. <laughs> yeah, twenty thousand dollar phone. Um, I had a client that sold a three thousand dollar coffee pot. I mean, that's even better than a seventeen hundred dollar vacuum cleaner. Um, there's plenty of money. And by the way, everybody, including everybody in here, has some kind of interest on which they spend dumb money. They spend silly amounts of money. Every single person on the planet does. You play golf, dumb money. Well, first of all, golf only exists because of marriage. Okay. No, there would be no golf. It had to have been invented. It was invented in Scotland, right? The guys had to be married. This is a conversation of we can't get out of the house. How are we going to get out of the house? We'll invent this game, okay? and we'll make it look so stupid, they'll actually feel sorry for us playing it. So we won't use a straight stick. We'll have a doofusy looking bent stick. Okay? We'll make the game about hitting on a little ball into a little hole, but let's put the hole like 400 yards away. <laughs> That'll be good. Okay? We'll make it a long walk. I mean, seriously, the only reason golf exists is because four guys can't figure out how to get out of the house with a better excuse than this. And, and, and if they all go to their wives and say, we're going to go hang out for four hours in a bar and tell our dirty jokes to each other, the wives say, no, you're not. But they say, we're going to go play golf. Oh, well, all right, go play golf. So golf was invented because of marriage. But I mean, if you play golf, think of the dumb money you spend. I mean, and the people who sell to golfers know. It's what Jeff Paul calls the irrationally rabid market, meaning all, san all sanity goes out the window. We'll spend any amount of money on that pastime. Every one of you has one of them. Might be boats, might be airplanes, might be raising Vietnamese pot belly pigs, might be racehorses, might be whatever it is, but we all got something we spend dumb money on. In, um, any amount, doesn't make any difference, right? Everybody's got at least one. Some people have like multiples, all right? Um, and, and everybody's got one. Even poor people got them. Even poor people got them. Now it's proportionate spending, but even poor people got it. My brother's got no money, but he's got one of the most expensive pool tables you can buy. He's got a handmade scientifically bioengineered, computer designed, imported from somewhere, personal cue stick. Yeah, he's got a car, 
that none of you would get in. But he's got a Q-stick. The Q-stick's worth more than the car. Right? Doesn't bother him. Pool is his thing. Yeah, he is pretty good. Not good enough to make any money. But, but that's, I mean, he probably is good enough to make money. But, um, so, so there's all this money floating around, being spent on all this stuff. And then people get tight about, oh, I'm a little queasy about closing this guy on $1,700 worth of firearms. Hey, at least you're keeping him from burning to death. You know? I mean, a vacuum cleaner, at least the house is going to be clean. Uh, you know, the $1,700 pool cue ain't doing him a whole lot of good. I mean, so there's all this money floating around, and yet people are all kind of tight. And I mean, you've seen it in our group, how hard I've had to work just on price. Just to get people to inch up their prices. And some of that, fear-based, but some of it is this issue of taking too much money from somebody. Mm, you know, I'm taking an unfair amount of money from them. I'm handicapping them. Well, what's all that based on? It's based on the thought that there's not enough money to go around and that it's very hard for them to replace that money. It's based on the idea that money's hard to replace. If you substitute the idea that money's easy to replace, then all the trepidation about how much you take from any one given person for whatever it is that you do goes out the window because it's easily replaceable. Very fluid. And it is easily replaceable. It's the easiest thing there is on the planet to replace. House burns down. The house you can replace, furniture, you, can, you know, the pictures, your family heirlooms, your, that kind of stuff you can't replace. But the rest of it's easily replaceable. Money's easy to replace. But people think it's hard to replace, and everything they do is then kind of governed by that conditioning. The people who attract tons of money and have no hang-ups about taking it have come to the conclusion that there's an abundant supply of it more than anybody could ever possibly use, and that it's easy to get more of it. We did the show of hands yesterday. Uh, the incredible commonality amongst successful entrepreneurs of those who have been broke or formerly gone through bankruptcy. And for those of you that won't hear yesterday, I mean, it's like the majority of the hands. Um, um, and as somebody said, the rest of them are lying. <laughs> um, uh, but I believe the reason that is is because it's a ma that whole experience is a major step in discovering how easy it is to replace it. Because at the time you think it's terminal, at the time you think it's fatal, because you think money's hard to replace. And then when you recover, realization begins to dawn. So the first big impediment to getting money is the idea that there are limits to it, that it's a zero-sum game, that it's hard to replace, that you harm somebody by taking their hard-to-replace money from them. There's a term people use. You know the term? We use it when, in some cases in sales copy. You have to be careful about the vocabulary you use when you sell versus the vocabulary you believe. Here's the term, hard-earned dollar. All recognize the term, don't you? Hard-earned dollars. It's the implication. Hard to get them. Those of you that got, how many got kids? And how many times in the past month have you explained to the kids that money doesn't grow on <laughs> trees? Where does that come from? Well, it's because everybody becomes their father, right? That's the deal. You know, and you find yourself saying the same crap that used to annoy you when they said, we don't even think about it. It's been programmed in, and now at a particular point in time in life, we're regurgitating it and spitting it back out with no thought about what it's doing to us or what it's doing to the person that we're saying it to. But when we say it, what belief system are we, we communicating? Hard to get. Yeah. 
And any reinforcement of that that's going on for you is detrimental to you. It'll bind you up in all sorts of ways that you can't imagine. If you're thinking, it's hard to get. Um, this, this is not in your manual, but I like it. Here's the caption. I know you missed the Wayne writes Bobby, but they were weak and stupid people, and that's why we have wolves and other large predators. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think this is your page eight. Here's programming that doesn't help you any. There's a whole now economic political push about excessive profits. Right. And you will hear that term more and more and more and more and more in the media. It's in places it shouldn't be, like the Wall Street Journal. Fortune, yeah, you won't find it. I haven't found it in Forbes, by the way, and I read Forbes every month. I haven't found it in Forbes, but you'll find it in the Wall Street Journal. It's a lot of talk about this whole issue of excess profits. And those of you that are incorporated undoubtedly know you're only allowed to take so much profit out of your own company every year without paying excess distribution taxes. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're taking too much money. Um, and there's an idea, for example, much proliferated, attributed to Rockefeller, which he never had anything to do with, that the, the, the top person's compensation in a company should only be a preset multiple of the lowest wage paid in the same company. And so there's a lot of talk about the outrageousness of CEO compensation has a ratio against what the broom pushing person's wage is. And so everybody's getting beat up on this idea of excess profits. And the ratio argument, for example, the CEO compensation is controlled by marketplace value. And if the guy takes too much money, too many times in a row, the marketplace catches up to him and he's gone. All right? So everybody like right now is screaming and yelling about Eisner and a handful of guys who took their $20 million bonuses last year even though shareholder value went down 18% and et cetera, et cetera. Well, if in fact he's being irrationally and unfairly compensated, a couple of years from now, he'll be where the CEO of Sprint is this year. He'll be gone. And he'll pay hell getting hired anyplace else. The marketplace catches up. Okay? But what the ratio argument completely ignores is his compensation is determined by marketplace value, even if, it, even if it's a trailing indicator rather than a predictive indicator. The guy who pushes the broom, that job has a finite definable worth. And if you base one on the other, there's no real rationale for that. It sounds good when you talk about it, but it doesn't make any sense. Further, incidentally, the longevity argument, big problem for those of you that employ people, right? Because employees, employee mentality has been taught that the longer you do a job, the more you should be paid for doing it, right? That are, the union is based on that. However, certain jobs only have a certain value. Doesn't matter how long you do them. If you tighten a bolt on the side of a doohickey, that's worth X cents, period. It can't be worth Y cents just because you've been standing there tightening the same bolt for 50 years. You didn't add any value to it. You're not tightening the bolt 50 times faster that would make the job worth more money. You're not tightening the bolt in a way that cut the recall rate by 50%. That would make the job worth more money. But just tightening the same bolt at the same speed just because you've been doing it for 50 years didn't add any value to anything. But as you know, if you employ people, 
what do they expect? Annual rate, sure, periodic raises. Why? Why is that job worth any more this year than it was last year? Arguably, it might be worth even less. <laughs> but it doesn't inherently become worth more, but people think it. And so they have in their head, I'm not, I'm not going to, I will stop and do it, okay? They have in their head now uh, that it should be. The second thing on the list is this, this entire topic of people who are less fortunate uh, than you are. Um, there are some such people. Um, I mean, there's a, obviously there's an enormous amount of economic ignorance in the country. And people who've never had any exposure, you know, you can't really fault somebody for not getting a bucket and a sponge and going out there and being entrepreneurial and getting rich if they've never seen it. If they have no exposure to it, if they don't, if they don't know it exists. Uh, but often, those less fortunate, that's a synonym purely for those less industrious. It's not that they haven't seen it. It's not that they don't know. It's certainly not that they couldn't go see it. They just don't. And to have guilt about them. But a lot of people have their money-making capabilities suppressed by guilt about these kind of issues. Oh, there's all these people less fortunate than I. Therefore, it would somehow be better if I didn't keep the next thing, the gap. If the gap didn't keep getting wider. Well, the gap, now here's some stats. This is really important because people don't get it. Inflation-adjusted incomes of families from 1998 to 2001 rose across all demographic groups. That's Ronald Reagan's rising tide lifts all boats. There's no way to raise the lower level without raising the top level. Can't happen. If we don't get richer, they can't get less poor. Can't happen. It's economically impossible. And so the old joke, the best thing you can do for the poor people is not be one of them. <laughs> Second best thing for you to do, do, do for them is get as rich as you possibly can. Because you're automatically going to pull some up. Why? Because you're going to spend more dumb money. And the more dumb money that's out there floating around, the more everybody benefits. But there's the argument about the widening gap. Oh, we got to do something about the gap. Got to do something about the gap. The gap's no wider than it's ever been. It's just more visible. There's always going to be a big gap. The issue of greed. Too often achievement, accomplishment, ambition is defined as greed. is getting the most money possible for the goods or services you deliver, greed or intelligence? Is it greed or ambition? Are you a better person if you voluntarily get less money than you could for the goods or the services you deliver? If these guys suddenly reduce their price on fire alarms to $1,400 from $1,700, did the door into heaven get any wider when Driscoll drops? Opportunist. American Greetings, maybe you've seen this in the news. American Greetings has rushed to the presses uh, with a line of greeting cards to be sent to the military in Iraq. And so if you have somebody over there you want to send a greeting card to, by the way, they're in the stores. Uh, and there's, um, there's what they call the romantic ones. Um, there's a picture of a great looking babe in a camouflage uh, uh, um, uh, line, piece of lingerie standing next to a bed. Um, uh, and the caption is, I've got some maneuvers to show you when you get home. 
Um, uh, there's ones for brothers, there's one for sisters, there's one, they've created a whole line. And they're getting massive publicity, by the way, as a result of this. CNN, MSNBC, Entertainment Tonight, USA Today. Uh, I saw the first big critical discussion of this uh, on some talk show uh, last night, in which it should come to no surprise to any of us that um, uh, Janine Grimofalo, whatever her name is, uh, thinks this is horrible, um, that we are profiteering, some company is profiteering on, 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 on this tragic series of events. And if, in fact, they are going to sell these things, they should be giving all the money away. Yeah. Um, well, of course, that's exactly the point. Good point. Yeah, Elliot said as if she's not profiteering from the interview. Of course. Uh, now, she may devoutly believe her position. I, by the way, I happen to think I would put her in a category with Hillary, and I mean, I think she believes her shtick. And, 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 and by the way, I, no, of course not. And I have, I have more respect for somebody I devoutly disagree with who devoutly believes their position than I do anybody else. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I don't begrudge her getting on TV and mouthing off about it either. But it is, it is an illustration of a position that is very often taken about this thing called opportunism. And yet what opportunism is, is entrepreneurship. That's what it is. See, every man's tragedy is somebody else's opportunity. That's commerce. Fire alarm business wouldn't exist if there weren't fires. You can't sell alarms if somebody wasn't having a house burned down around them. If there were no deaths, there'd be no business. So now they position their business as, as the mission to protect people, to save lives. That's how they sell it. But it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the tragic problem in the first place. Cops wouldn't have jobs if there was no crime. If we could eliminate all the crime tomorrow, we'd have, I don't know, how many cops are there? Clinton claims he put another 100,000 on the streets, so I don't know, millions unemployed. Now what do we do? Now what? See, all commerce, the whole flow of where money moves, a big reason money moves is tragedy, disaster, crisis, problems, ugly, horrible human events. So one man's tragedy is another man's opportunity. Entrepreneurship is all about Opportunism. Gas station raises its prices on the Friday before a holiday weekend. Is he an evil opportunist? What do you think? It's all part and parcel of what he must do in order to achieve maximum success in his business. Because at other times during the calendar year, there are price wars in his neighborhood. And he sells his gas for less than it costs him in order to stay in business. If he's in an extremely competitive environment, he sells his gas at a loss the entire time in order to get repair business into the bays. There's all sorts of fluctuations in his business. He better make maximum profits when the opportunity presents itself in order to compensate for the times when he can't make any profit at all. Person who owns the convenience store in the middle of a gang-ridden ghetto where nobody else will open a store. And he mostly sells to people who can't get 20 miles away to the nearest supermarket. Therefore, he sells at double what you could buy the same products for if you could get to the supermarket 20 miles away. Is he an evil opportunist? Well, would you go open a store there? If his store's not there, how do they get anything at all? 
his risk is enormously higher than the guy 20 miles away with the supermarket. Every time he walks into a store, there's a pretty good chance somebody's going to walk in the door and blow his head off or try. His theft rate's probably four or 500% worse than the supermarket 20 miles away. For assuming all of that added risk, shouldn't he be an opportunist? Getting all this stuff out of your head and being okay with being the predator is necessary for maximum money. About those less fortunate, by the way, I have my favorite list. Actually, I have two lists. Just trivia, but this is, this is the average person's list of reasons for not doing well. Some of them we hear from our people. Everybody in my city buys by price. Nobody in my town uses credit cards. Everybody in my town is whatever. There's a giant advertiser in my town. Uh, I never get the good leads. If you got salespeople, you hear that one. Uh, it's the time of year. There's already too many doohickeys in my town. That's the opposite of the people we talked about yesterday who are all panicked that some of them are going out of business. <laughs> um, I hear this from clients. I like this one. What I do is so unique nobody understands it. Uh, uh, let's see. It's the economy. It's my spouse, my staff. Now, here's, here's the less fortunate list. This is These are from actual interviews. This is people's biggest problem is getting to work on time. Hey, this is why they don't do well. Here's why they can't get to work on time. Sometimes my car won't start. Hmm? The damn bus driver comes early. Mm -hmm. these, are, I mean, I, these are actual interviews. I'm not making this up. I, I can't hear the alarm clock. I used to have that problem. I put a coffee can on top of it. <laughs> when it rings, you hear the sun. The dog hides my shoes. Is this incredible? I just can't get going in them. I'm not a morning person. Well, I shouldn't be required to get to work in the morning. I'm not a morning person. The seven is better. My mother was never a morning person. <laughs> it's mom's fault. I can't get to work on time. It's hereditary. It's just too tough. It's unfair to ask somebody to be there at exactly the same time every morning. Now get this. These are the less fortunate people you are supposed to feel sorry for while you're making money. They believe it. That they, of course they believe it. But see, their beliefs are not our responsibility. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not our problem. Mm -hmm. Our beliefs are our responsibility, not theirs. You can't, you can't in any way help this nitwit who thinks because her mother couldn't get up in the morning that she can't get to work. You can't help her by making less money. That does her no good. And you don't hurt her by making as much money as is humanly possible. She still get, ain't getting to work. She's not going to get there any later because you made an extra mill this year. She's going to be just as dysfunctional as she is now, no matter how much or how little money you make. Mm -hmm. I like on page 11, Andrew Carnegie. The redistribution of wealth deal. He says, give me two numbers, the world's population and the value of all my assets. Then give this idiot 16 cents because that's what it divides out to and get him out the door. <laughs> Best answer to the redistribution of wealth argument I ever heard. <laughs> you can divide it all up and don't make it. You can take it all away from everybody that's got it. There are three states right now who have proposed excess wealth taxes. All right. The first one is the state of Vermont, from which a presidential candidate by the name of Howard Dean is running. You might not have noticed. <laughs> um, uh, they have proposed a special tax on millionaires. This is a this is redistribution of wealth scheme. This is if we take an extra 
10,000 bucks a year from each of the millionaires who live here. They won't miss it. They don't need all that money. And then we can redistribute it after, of course, the government eats its 72% overhead. We can redistribute it to all the people who don't have any. And how will this help anybody? It won't. All it'll do is convince a bunch of millionaires to move to Connecticut. <laughs> That's what it'll do. I flew, people don't get this, I flew cross country one time with Walter Mont Mon Mondale as my seat seatmate. And we had a lively conversation. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to tell you something. Is that I, I came away convinced that he devoutly believes that, you, and, 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 and I'm not implying the man's dumb, because he's not dumb. He devoutly believes that you can actually tax business. He thinks that. Just like these people now think you can tax these millionaires, take money away from them, and have no ramifications. Well, see, businesses don't pay taxes. Customers pay taxes. Nobody that runs a business ever absorbs a tax. You guys know that. You run businesses. What do we do? We do one of two things. We raise our taxes, we raise our prices, or we cut jobs. We don't take a cut. I've never taken a pay cut. Somebody whacks me with a new tax. Somebody else is going to pay it. I'm not. Exact same attitude about my divorce settlement. <laughs> it's why it didn't really bother me I mean I said I don't know exactly who's going to pay this but it ain't going to be me mama <laughs> you know somebody else is forking this dough over well that's how business people think it's how you should think you get whacked with an excess tax you're not going to pay it Mondale thinks the business pays it and nothing else happens these redistribution of wealth guys think you can actually tax these millionaires and nothing else is going to happen. You know, they're just going to sit there and let you take money away from them and not go get it back. <laughs> they're going to get it. Housekeepers going to go from five days a week to three days a week. They're not going to buy a boat this year, which if enough of them don't buy a boat, there's a whole bunch of people in the boat business that aren't going to work. Somewhere, they're getting the money. And I don't care if they got $100 million. They can't stand to lose 10000 Nor should they. So Carnegie's argument was brilliant. Now, here's my question for you. What is, I don't have the slide, page 12. What is your entrepreneurial responsibility? What is the entrepreneur's responsibility. What must you do in order to be fair and just and deserve your place on the planet? Well, here's what a lot of people think. They think your purpose, your responsibility in life is to provide jobs. You see that reflected in the communities that are busily trying to pass laws, and in some cases, communities and states suing companies to keep them from moving or closing, because their responsibility is to provide jobs to the community. Is your responsibility to provide jobs? I hope you don't think so. A lot of people think your responsibility is to pay taxes. You were put on earth for the purpose. I, here's what I want now. I was telling somebody this the other day. I, th I think we'd all be happier with this program, by the way. I just got my tax bill. I want pictures like of Iraqi citizens and welfare recipients. I want like when you send money to the starving orphan deal and you get the picture and you get a letter once in a while, you know, about how they're doing. I think every taxpayer should get some of those and have people sign to them. So for your money, you got a picture up here of these 17 Iraqi people and these four welfare recipients and this retired guy. So you can put them all, all, all the people you're supporting up on the refrigerator and they should all have to write you notes every once in a while, let you know how they're doing. 
I'd feel better, wouldn't you? <laughs> is, is your responsibility to improve your customers' lives. Better get that out of your head. In our business, this is fatal. And it really isn't any other business. Now, it's pretty smart to sell them things that if they use them as you intended, will improve their lives. That's smart. But it's not your responsibility to see that it gets done. Nor should you lose any sleep over the fact that many don't. And in my business, see, a whole lot of what I sell, I mean, all kidding aside, the shrink wrap don't come off. And you will kill yourself in my business if you worry about making them take off the shrink wrap. Mostly, they just get mad at you. Not my responsibility. I didn't have any of the fun of giving birth to them. They ain't, they, 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 they ain't gonna support me in my old age. They're on their own. Here's the thing, use it, don't use it, don't matter to me. It's my, one of the great lessons I learned early in life in the multi-level industry was I didn't want to be there. Because your money is dependent on actually getting them to do something. Lousy position to be in. Want the money and then leave it up to them to do something. If they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. And so again, like in my business, look at the numbers. We got, what, 150 people here out of 46,000? <laughs> All right. Why? You're the 150 you took off the shrink wrap. Am I losing sleep about the whatever that number is, 45,800? No, I got over it a long time ago. You got to, too. If the guy puts the shed in his backyard and never moves the crap out of the garage into the shed and still can't park the car in the garage, or has a, has a more probable result, he moves all the crap out of the garage into the shed and then restocks the garage with more crap, <laughs> and still can't park the car in the garage, should Paul go out there and give him his money back? Hey? Well, yeah, sell him another shit. That's exactly right. Now we're getting it. Yeah. Sell him garbage removal service. Sell him uh, how to do a garage sales kit. Sell him something. That's sell him something. The entrepreneur's responsibility is this. Maximum profit and wealth to his shareholders. If you're the sole shareholder, that's you. Then your responsibility is just to play fair. Not lie, cheat, steal. Those Ten Commandment things. What do you want to bet, Jay? And actually, I, you may even have a comment on this. What do you want? Here's what Jay does, by the way, on one of his businesses, is with chiropractic offices. The inbound call. Well, with, with any business, by the way, but with chiropractic offices, the inbound call is critically important. You spend a lot of money on advertising to make the phone ring, and then Barbara is the one answering the phone. And there's all sorts of mechanical problems. Barbara thinks it's a receptionist function, not an inbound sales function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what do you want to bet that in many cases, Barbara's inability to schedule a lot of the patients and motivate them to show up is actually rooted in a lot of stuff going on in her subconscious about the fact that the doctor charges too much, he makes too much money, he's doing too well, he's driving too nice a car, and this poor, this poor person who needs care, it's unfair for that person to have to pay so much money. What do you want to bet? Jay, you got... They say, no, I don't have insurance. They say, okay, well, thanks for calling. And that's it. No insurance. No insurance. Yeah, he tapes all the calls. He private audits the calls. Right. Which, by the way, if you haven't done that, you've got to call your own, you've got to mystery shop your own store, your own office, your own place of business a lot. Because you will be really shocked at what happens. Get somebody who knows what they're doing, somebody in your mastermind group. We do it in our coaching groups to crisscross call and play prospect and tape the call for you. You'll be nauseated. 
You'll be sick. You'll be terrified. But a lot of it is this. And so they don't have insurance. Here's what goes through the person's head. Oh, my God. When we taught prepay, <laughs> we taught chiropractors prepay. That is, how many of you have been to a chiro chiropractor? Okay, good. So you know the drill, right? You go in, you examine the x-rays, the report of findings, which is the sales presentation. Okay. Well, it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, where they show you the x-rays and tell you your spine's going to fall out if you don't come in 18 times a week for the first six weeks and five times a week. You, okay, you got it, right? Well, prepay is case presentation. And so it's 18 times a week for the first three weeks and six times a week for that. And that all totals up to $7,862. And there's three ways you can take care of that. You can take care, you get your checkbook out, take care of it in one payment, and you save 800 uh, or you can do it in three payments, predate the checks, uh, or uh, we got a household finance contract here, and uh, we can get you a loan. Now, it's done a little more elegant than that, you understand, but that's the deal. By the way, you can take a chiropractor who's barely keeping the light bill on, and you can take him to $40,000 a month like this if he'll do prepay, because he only needs four new patients that he can close. When we talk prepay, the mechanical process of this, by the way, works just like their fire alarm sales presentation works. If the doc will actually do the presentation, if he's bad, one out of four will say yes. If he's pretty good, two out of four will say yes. If he's really good, three out of four will say yes. But even if he's bad, one out of four will say yes. If he'll just run the presentation, we had to kill to get anybody to do the presentation in part because they didn't believe anybody would give them the money, but mostly because they felt all kinds of guilt about asking somebody for $70,000 in advance. But then, if we could get the doc to do it, the next problem was the sabotage by the staff. Because where's their head at? This poor person with no insurance is coming in here, and they're an they're a office manager which is what I am, and I know they can't afford, and Doc's driving a Jaguar, that miserable SOB with his excessive profits. So how hard is Barbara going to work at scheduling that appointment? Not very hard at all. Consciously or subconsciously, she's going to keep that person out of the office. Happens in all kinds of businesses. The reason more stuff isn't sold, because of all the guilt. That's why more stuff isn't sold. Let's do one more before our break. Here's one that'll get us into all kinds of trouble. Let's try 13. Here's the key word on this page, just. If you want to underline something, underline the word just. Because the implication of this, here's how people respond to this if they believe it. They think that their lack of success or the way to be more successful, their lack of money or the way to get more of it, is to scrub harder, is to be a more deserving person. And they equate the fact they don't have what they want to them not being a sufficiently deserving person. And if I just scrub harder, things will turn around for me. Now, the medical... Now, the metaphysical version of this is equivalent. The metaphysical version of this is, I'm just not using the mental principles well enough. If I just think more positively, keyword just, things will turn around. 
It's another clue to why Hill was broke, Stone was rich. It's not the main reason, but it's a clue. Many of you know or know of Foster Hibbard. We're going to talk about some of this stuff a little later. When I got Foster, Foster was in the metaphysical version of this category. Foster believed in the word just, not justice, but the just. All you should have to do, all you had to do in order to attract unlimited wealth was to get this right, to live the philosophy. He didn't get that you had to apply it in an environment where it had a reasonable opportunity of producing money and you had to ask for the dough. Missed that part. So he's running around teaching prosperity to everybody with no prosperity, which pretty much, by the way, describes 90% of the people who run around and teach prosperity. If you want a great analogy to this to help you try and get rid of it, it's the argument that 9-11 was our fault in whole or part because we have so much and other countries have so little. And because we have an immoral society. And so if we were just more moral and we were just more generous, we wouldn't deserve what happened to us on 9-11 and it never would have happened. Therefore, we should close the Defense Department and take all that money and divide it up between the less fortunate people in all these other countries, and we should spend it on churches and moral education in this country, and we don't need a Defense Department. You like that plan? Well, if you don't like that plan, you can't like this plan either because it's the same plan. It's the same idea that if all we have to do is make ourselves more deserving people and somehow the wealth will then fall out of the tree. No, it won't. Some of the gentlest, kindest, most deserving folks on the planet are broke, stay broke, always broke. Some of the hardest working people on the planet. See, some people, some, well, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, but I'm always amused. I mean, some business people actually think they're working. I have clients say to me, I mean, there's a guy in the room right now who could be making four times the money he's making. Oh, I, don't want, you know, I don't want to run a 16-step sequence and worry about getting all that mail out. It's too much work. Hey, the people who are really working hard are the people making minimum wage. They're working. The folks who work for us, at the, you want to see somebody work, you come spend a day at the track. These people get 200 bucks a week per horse to take care of a horse. Most of them have, have three horses. They get there at 6 o'clock in the morning. They work until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm talking hard physical manual labor. Most of you may remember that. <laughs> I'm talking hard physical manual labor. Mm -hmm. At 1 o'clock in the afternoon, if they're lucky, they go take a nap. Five of night, nights a week, when we have live racing, they start again at 6 o'clock at night. Depending upon how late a race their horse is in, they get, they, they, they get done between 11 o'clock at night and 1 o'clock in the morning. And the next day, they're back at 6. In this climate, in the winter, the barn ain't heated. Right. In the summer, it ain't air conditioned. It's a barn. Right. So they're either sweating or they're freezing. They're getting stomped on, shit on, peed on, kicked, rolled over, all for no money. They work. Most of us wouldn't last a week. <laughs> I mean, you'd be laying on the ground. Huh? You want me to do what? <laughs> You know? Hey, a big revelation since I was there as a kid. When I came back, they switched to wheelbarrows. This is, a, this is, the, late, this is the big technological improvement in the whole deal. I'm serious. 
When I left, you put the shit in a big basket and you hiked it up on your hip and you carried it the length of the barn and then you heaved it into the big wagon where they come and haul the manure away. They have put ramps on the wagons. Somebody figured this out after 50 years. <laughs> they put ramps on the wagons and they use a wheelbarrow. They have that in garbage. Huh? This is the wall. This is the big technological improvement in the racing industry is wheelbarrows. Nothing else has changed. I was gone for 20 years. Everything else is the same. Okay? This is it. So now they use wheelbarrows. But I mean, still, this is back breaking manual labor, long hours. I'm sure it violates some kind of federal labor law <laughs> somewhere. Right? Chat, as, as bad as they may be, every one of his guys who actually goes out and does the pest control jobs works a lot harder than he does. They don't get near the money he does. See, it doesn't have anything to do with work. God forbid it should have to do. I mean, if we revise that whole system, let's pay people based on the hard work that they do. You can't run an economic system that way. You got the most money going to the dumbest mules on the planet. Nobody's left to run anything. It all collapses. So it's not work. Hmm. So whether we're into the Harrisons with their, again, I, whatever, Christian, Catholic, I mean, Jewish combination guilt thing that you guys got burdened with, or we're into the metaphysical sackcloth and ashes crowd, it's pretty much the same deal. Everybody's, everybody's focused on this word just in this paragraph, and if I was just better if I was just, now, does being better help? Yeah. Does being a better person help? Sure. Should you try and be a better person? Sure. Mm -hmm. Does being a more moral person help? Sure. But alone, is it going to get the job done? No. Mm -hmm. Some of the gentlest, kindest, most moral people I've ever met are walking around with empty pockets and empty refrigerators at home. And some of the hardest working people you and I could find anywhere on the planet got empty refrigerators and empty pockets. And a lot of them are trying to fix it this way. Well, maybe if I go to church four times a week instead of twice a week. Maybe if I go work in a soup kitchen. Maybe if I, if I just figure out a way to deserve it more, I'll get it. System doesn't work that way. Here's why. It's your next page. Now I've lost that one. Yeah, here it is. Money doesn't have a conscience. It's paper. That's all it is. It's just paper. It's not significantly different. We have some printers in the room. It's not significantly different than the paper that's in your book. It's green, and it's got some kind of woven crap in it so that theoretically we can't counterfeit it. But it's paper. Right? It doesn't know if you're a priest or a pornographer. You know, these days. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, it's paper. That's all it is. That's all it is. Nothing more. Nothing less. It's just paper. That's it. That's all. Okay. Doesn't have a conscience. Doesn't know what you are. Doesn't know what you do. Doesn't care. It just moves around. That's all. Okay. If it worked that way, there never could be an Enron. There couldn't have been a Jesse James. Same guys. <laughs> okay. Couldn't be. Because the money would stop before it got to them. It would say, it would put on the brakes, it would speak, it would say, wait a minute. 
you're doing, you're doing something we don't approve of. We're not coming into your hands. The stuff would work like, you know, Matrix movie stuff. It would stop, go back, and you wouldn't be able to get it. Well, it doesn't do that. Right? As a matter of fact, the second quote's a real good one. Money's attracted to go where it will increase the fastest. The stuff likes to multiply like rabbits. It likes to breed. It likes to go where it will have friends. You know, it doesn't want to be in a pocket by itself. By the way, that's why you should always carry a bunch of it. The stuff, I'm serious, the stuff gets lonely. You know? And if it's lonely, it goes looking for an environment where it's to have some friends. So give it some friends. It comes where it'll increase the fastest. Doesn't care what that is. Right? Now, that doesn't mean you should be a pornographer. I'm not suggesting that. It doesn't mean you should run and run. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is you've got to get out of your head that by not doing those things and by doing things that are, quote, quote, good, that that alone attracts and multiplies well, because it doesn't. It may make you know, make your next wife a better deal. You may be in the cool place instead of the warm place. You may not come back as a toad, depending on, I mean, whatever your belief system is. It may have enormous impact on that, but in terms of whether the money comes to this pocket or not, no, it doesn't, doesn't have any impact. If it did, you couldn't have, pick an industry. I mean, you couldn't have, Two-thirds of all the e-commerce today is still adult entertainment. Most people believe that shouldn't be the way it is, but it is. And a significant percentage, I'm always amused, people get all bent out of shape talking about pornography, but they own AT&T stock. Anybody own AT&T stock? Ah, AT&T stock. AT&T makes a ton of dough off 900 numbers. They make a ton of dough off the internet access to the porn sites. Anybody own Hilton stock, Marriott stock? Oh, damn. well, you're in all of it, aren't you, baby? <laughs> um, <laughs> hotel industry's in trauma right now because of the lawsuits that are beginning in certain states to try and block them from providing adult entertainment in room movies. Why? Because it's 20% of the bottom line. That's why. You take that out of there, you've got a big problem. Anybody own General Motors stock? A lot of people own GM stock. GM owns a company called Vivid Entertainment. Oh, some people know what Vivid Entertainment is. <laughs> You can't get more money just by being a better person. Keyword is just. You get more money by doing things that produce money. Let's take us a 15 minute break while we're waiting for people to get in their seats. A um, couple things mentioned me on the break you may find interesting. Make sure I don't screw this up now, Judith. But um, Judith told me of one of her employees who um, every year comes to her and needs a raise, which, of course, by the way, because they need it, you are, of course, obligated to give it. Um, uh, and so, man or woman, it doesn't matter, but... Okay, so she comes to Judith every year and needs her annual raise. And Judith says to me, and so I sit down with her and I say, fine, you've got a raise as soon as you enroll in this course, and you go to this seminar, and you study this stuff. And as soon as you enroll, raise is a done deal, not after you finish, right? As soon as you do these three things and get started, the raise is a done deal. My question to her was, how many years have you gone without giving her a raise? Okay? Her answer is 14. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt mentioned to me, I mean, it's priceless, Judith. It's priceless. 
Um, if you just don't use their name, I really would hate to lose it. Yeah, well, I, and I doubt that there's any risk of that at this point. I think, <laughs> I think, I think you could probably die and she'd come for at least two pay periods before she gave up. Yeah. Um, um, Matt mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Um, Matt mentioned to me, which which is really a very good example. Um, most of you, most of you know Jeff Paul. If you don't, you know of Jeff, and I'm sure you know the story that you know is in the little yellow book. You know, when Jeff came to my first seminar, um, he and Peggy and the kids were living in the sister's basement, and uh, he was up to a hundred and some odd thousand dollars on his credit cards, and uh, business wasn't working. And uh, he was close, by the way, because um, I really didn't do that much. Uh, but um, I think we pieced him into the seminar, as I recall, on five different credit cards. Um, so, I mean, I knew. Uh, they didn't go to any uh, mealtime. They disappeared because uh, not only, I mean, they didn't dare get stuck with a tab let alone eat in the restaurant. I mean, they came with peanut butter and crackers and stuff in a suitcase and went up to the room and ate all during the seminar. And it was a super conference. I don't know. I think it was 2000 bucks, 2500 bucks, you know, whatever it was. And um, I'm pretty sure we used, I'm sure he has said to me, we used the last little margin on every one of these credit cards. I mean, I got the last dollar there was to get. There was no more. And what Matt said is, wonder where he'd be today if you had felt any guilt about taking his money. And it's a very, very, very good point. And it's a double-sided coin. A, we never have the right. See, if somebody in a, you know, if somebody in a mobile home uh, with their kids not, you know, wearing shoes with holes in them, chooses to put a satellite dish on the roof. And that's their priority. None of us, especially the satellite guy, but none of us have the right to tell them unless we're supporting them. And that's a whole political issue. But otherwise, we don't have the right to tell them that that shouldn't be their priority. And if you want an extension of the Jeff Paul story, what happens if we don't let them have cable and cables where they see the Ron LeGrand infomercial that gets them to the free seminar where they find out how to buy real estate with no money down? And they never would have experienced that if they didn't have cable that they couldn't afford. Say, so, do we have the right to tell them they can't? And I don't have the right to tell Jeff, hey, you know, you shouldn't really, but maybe you shouldn't be spending your last dollar, you know? None of my business, not my responsibility. My responsibility is to get his last dollar. That is my responsibility, because my responsibility is to maximize profit for my shareholders, period. It's his problem that's his last dollar. It ain't my problem. Now, the good news is, in his case, dollar well spent. But that was entirely up to him. Not me. I didn't do anything. I talked for him, talked with him for 10 minutes at the end of the seminar and said, hey, I think here's your four problems. Boom, 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 go fix them. But that doesn't mean he was going to go fix them. And I promise you, I wasn't going to the basement to find out. Mm -hmm. Here's another whole head trip stuff. We're on page 15. The other big reason people don't wind up with a ton of dough is because they're afraid of it. Having money will create all sorts of problems for me. By the way, on the next page, just for fun, I gave you this great article I found the other day about Kenya millionaires, some kind of big accident, insurance settlement, and now there's all these impoverished people living in huts who suddenly got millions of dollars and all the problems they got and their marriages are falling apart. And <laughs> so having money will create all sorts of problems. 
Having money will alienate me from my family and my friends. Big issue for a lot of people. They don't want to be the only one in the whole bunch. Having money will make me a target to be taken advantage of. Having money will change me into a bad person. Well, the first three are true. So if you want to be afraid of something, go ahead and be afraid of the first three, because they're absolutely real. Having money will create all sorts of problems for you, and initially, you're probably not equipped to handle them. However, not having money has a whole bunch of problems, too. Which set of problems would you rather have? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not that money makes problems go away. I assure you, Trump gets up every morning with a long list of them. You know? But which, which set would you rather have? I've had them both. I'd ra I got a car right now, brand new car. Door won't close if you don't hit the lock button twice. Got a little electrical system defect. You know, the little doohickey that you set the seat so two different people can get in and out of the seat and it returns to the position. Never been able to make that work. Turned out wasn't necessary. Never been able to make that work. <laughs> Um, and you know those things are a little annoying but hey I've had the car where there was no floorboards and you couldn't change a tire I'd rather have these problems give me a choice you know I'll take these you know having money will alienate me from family and friends Will from some, especially if you say no to them. <laughs> Here's a favorite side strategy. There's a guy here in Cleveland. He was on the radio. A friend of mine has a radio show here. He's on the radio. He hit the lottery. Not big, but millions. Before he goes down to cash the ticket, because now he's going to be on the news with the check, and the, right? Here's what he does. He calls all his relatives and his friends, and he says, I got an emergency. I need to borrow $1,000, and I can't tell you what I need it for. Can you get over here tonight? And he checks them off. <laughs> As you might imagine, he don't have a whole lot of people running over with a grand. A whole lot of folks on the list have a reason not a check. The next day, they all see him on TV having won the lottery. This dramatically reduces the number of incoming calls <laughs> trying to tap the lottery winnings. Brilliant. I'm driving down the road, listen to this on the radio, I'm thinking, this guy, it, it's just incredible. He got it. Yeah. By the way, Louis Anderson's book, if you have family problems, Louis Anderson's book is worth reading because um, he's got his whole family, you know, who have been trying to tap him ever since he made a dollar. Um, having money will make me a target to be taken advantage of. Yep. The more you got, the more visible you are with it, the more people will try and take it away from you. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, yeah. The bad news is, if you, if, the only way not to have to worry about that is not to have anything for them to take. That's the deal. Having money will change me into a bad person. People believe that. They fear that. But money and character are, you know, bad people are bad people. And you know the old deal, so far in, in the entire history of the convenience store industry, there has yet to be a robbery by somebody who pulled up in a limo. <laughs> the getaway car hasn't been a stretch. Mm -hmm. One don't have much to do with the other. Making money too easily is wrong. Big deal for a lot of people. Goes back to the hard-earned dollars thing. I got a pretty strong work ethic. I work hard. Got it from I'm, I'm my father. But my father probably was also, to the degree that he has a superior work ethic, he's probably ingrained with this. If you didn't get it by working hard, you don't deserve it, and the only way to get it is by working hard. 
Well, do you believe, you believe that? Again, go take a look at all the hard-working people and see how much they got. You know, Ron's great slogan is, the less I do, the more I make. And man, there's a lot of truth to that in a lot of different ways. Rich people are unhappy. Having a lot of people will make me unhappy. Having a lot of money will make, make me un, unhappy. People who attract money think and talk differently than people who don't. They have their own language. Their language with others is interesting. I'll point out two things to look for. One is, you guys are all, you all belong, how many of you go to your, like, your trade association conventions or trade shows or those kind of functions? Okay, good. Here's how to know who to talk to. The only association I currently belong to, and for a number of years went every year to all the functions, is the, is the National Speakers Association, the trade association <coughs> of those of us who do this for some or all of our living, or pretend to. Um, and uh, um, at the National Speakers Association, 90% of the hallway cocktail party conversation among speakers is about the art and style and drama of, 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 of speaking. Translation, it's about the technical doing of the thing. Mm -hmm. Not only do they talk about doing the thing, they deliver their shtick, their stage stuff, now conversationally. You can't switch them out of it. If you go to a chiropractic convention, 90% of the hallway conversation isn't even conversation. They're busy adjusting each other. <laughs> they're busy doing for free to each other what they're supposed to be doing for money in their office. And incidentally, they won't touch a patient in their office without x-rays first. But in the hallway at the Aladdin in Vegas during the Parker Convention, nobody needs x-rays. They're up against a the wall, they're on the floor, they're bent over a chair, everybody's whacking each other. <laughs> and they're all and they're all talking to each other about their different technique. I do the Gonstead technique, I do the whoopy whoopy technique, I use the activator, do you use the activator? When we used to put the chiropractors and the dentists in the same seminars, they came to the evening seminar, they didn't know we mixed them. The chiropractors, of course, all thought we were selling only chiropractors until they get there. And you'd see them occasionally. There's a couple of them in the room before we get started, and the one guy's talking to the other one. I use the hoopy hoopy technique, and the guy's going, I, I've been in the deal 30 years, never heard of the hoopy hoopy technique. I was like, what? And one's a dentist, and one's a chiropractor. You know, it takes them like five minutes to figure out they're working on different anatomical parts. <laughs> Two years in a row, I spoke at the National Guild of Hypnotists Convention. What are they all doing on the breaks? Wooing each other. <laughs> this one's got the deal. This one uses the, the, you know, they're all out there hypnotizing each other. You don't want to talk to any of these people. Mm -hmm. There's maybe a few here, a few there. What are they talking about? How to get money. That's what they're talking about. They're the ones you want to talk to because they're the ones who got the money. The ones who are talking about the doing of whatever their thing is, I prom you can predict their bank balances. Because they're all focused on the wrong thing. They even think they're in the wrong business. They don't know they're in the money business. They think they're in the whacking, cracking, speaking, woo-wooing businesses. Right? They don't even get that. And so their conversation is all about what's real comfortable to them and all about, you know, the doing of their thing, which you know, is a tiny little piece of the puzzle. If you don't know that by now, in whatever business you're in, the actual doing of the thing is such a tiny little piece of the puzzle. I mean, it's all about how do you get money? How do you get a customer? How do you keep a customer? How do you build the value of a customer? It's all that. And so you don't want to be in conversation with any of these people.
you want to find the few. Now, there's times to have conceptual conversations and philosophical conversations and all that, preferably with people who you've already identified in your mastermind group or you've already identified are a whole lot more successful than you are and so forth. But for the most part, you want to be around the people who are talking about the money, especially if you want to increase your amount of money. The second thing about language with other people, here's a tip. Here's a clue. I, um, I saw on, a, on A&E or, I don't know, one of them channels about a week ago, they were running a biography of Dave Thomas from Wendy's. And um, most people have the view of Dave from the commercials, you know, the happy, jolly, kind of doofusy guy. Um, uh, Dave, pretty ruthless business guy his entire career. Um, and when he was still a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchisee uh, and took over failing franchises in Columbus, um, he quickly put two other chicken places out of business. And both times they had a huge celebration. Um, I mean, he wanted to put him out of business. He was glad he put him out of business. He was thrilled he put him out of business, and they celebrated putting him out of business. But what all of it, they interviewed a whole bunch of the executives and so forth. And I think this show was done before he passed, by the way, my thinking on this. And the commonality in all the people who worked for him, they said that you couldn't be in conversation with Dave anywhere, anytime, about anything for longer than five minutes without him asking, what are, oh, what are you doing to increase sales? What are you doing to increase sales? What are we doing to increase sales? That was always his question. Every day when I call my office, I think he's got a long list of stuff she wants to tell me. My question is, are we making any money? Money coming in over the fax machine? Yeah, 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 we're making money. We're always making money. I said, I mean, we're always making money because I'm always asking, are we making any money? That's why we're making money. If I wasn't asking, we'd stop making money. We'd be in some other business. We'd be in the paperwork business. That's the business we'd be in in a hot second. I don't want to be in the paperwork business. I want to be in the money business. <laughs> but if I stopped asking, a whole lot of people think they're in some other kind of business than the money business. Everybody I know who brings in a ton of dough is always asking about it. Tracy's father, who was really the first person I was in, who really, fatally flawed individual, but right about 95%. It's the 5% that kills you, but right about 95% of the time. You couldn't come back from running an errand and not be asked, did you get a check? Meaning, did you sell something while you were out? Because otherwise, why leave? Yeah. You know? I mean, did you get money? Dead of night. Didn't matter. Christmas Eve. Did you get a check today? Yeah. You know, and everybody tired of being asked. But good question. So they're focused on the money. That's the clue, if you want to know. They're focused on it. They're paying attention to it all the time. And it shows up even in conversational language, the first things out of their mouth. The self-talk's kind of a bigger issue. Um... <coughs> Uh, Vance said something yesterday, maybe I got it from him, I don't know, originally, but is this deal. What did you hear at the top of the stairs? Some of you in the room are too young, but most of us, we have this shared experience. Don't, I mean, the actual experience, not conceptual. We have this actual experience. They put you to bed. You snuck back out, and at the top of the stairs, you listened to the adults down below. How many, how many have the actual experience? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what you heard has enormous impact on what's going on with you today. And as Mike said yesterday, it's worth trying to identify what that was that you heard. Because it's playing a lot. 
and what most people heard. The, the statistics virtually guarantee it. What most people heard about money wasn't real good. Wasn't real helpful. So stop to think about it. Is what you heard when you were at the top of the stairs, did you hear a lot of abundance conversation or did you hear a lot of scarcity conversation? These tracks now come out in what you say. You know, the common stuff, there's a list of them on the next page, right? There's stuff people say about themselves. There's a license plate that says, off to work I go to pay the bills I owe. <clears throat> A, it's a crappy reason to go to work. It's really why she can't get there on time. Because she's going for the wrong reason. But it's also, what's it focused on? The bills I owe. Where do most people keep their bills? Where do most people keep their bills? Hmm? Kitchen table, he said desk. Let's do it another way. Where'd your parents keep their bills? Bedroom dresser. Where'd your parents keep keep their bills? Kitchen sink next to the sink. Really, a file cabinet, an advanced set of parents. Huh? Above the bar. Above the bar. On top of his desk. Okay, where? By the phone. How many, how many of you told her they had them in the kitchen? Yeah, pretty good little clump. Sure. Okay. A lot of them in the top kitchen drawer, a little doohickey. Okay. Kitchen, most used room in the house, where everybody gathers. Okay. There's the bills. Constantly visible, dealt with bills. Where do you keep yours? File folder, drawer. Yeah, get them things out of sight. Mm -hmm. They should be tickler filed. As soon as they come in, dumped, pay them when you want, you know, when they're due. But you don't want to be shuffling through them all the time. That's the other thing your parents did. They didn't have a tickler file. Not only were they always visible, but in order to figure out which ones they were going to pay today or this week, they shuffled through all of them. They give a month, they shuffle through a stack a lot. And you watched them shuffle through the bills. The thing you saw the most of was bills. My top kitchen drawer, I got full of cash. <laughs> I do. When I open that sucker, I want to see money. That's what I want to see. I just throw it in there. And when I need more, I go to where I got some, and I get a big handful of it, and I put it in the drawer. And then I just keep taking it out of the drawer until it needs more, and I put more in the drawer. Every time I open the drawer, there's money. There's other stuff that's in there. The only other thing in that drawer is the spoons, because I use the spoons most. So to get the drawer open to get a spoon, I see the money. All right. The bills, I put away. I want to see bills. All right. So what did you hear? So what did they talk about when you overheard their conversations? How many can remember your parents and friends having conversations about, any of you who live in the East, price of snow tires, price of groceries, price of gas? How many of you can tell me now what the price of a gallon of gas tank is? Anybody know what the gallon of gas costs? Huh? Be better if you didn't know, those of you who raised your hands. Person who knows the price of small things is focused on small things. It doesn't matter what a gallon of gas costs. You're going to buy it anyway. Now, a poor person might make a different choice. You aren't going to make that choice. You aren't going to go to the gas station and say, oh, my God, it's X today. I'm not going to buy any. You're not going to do that. If you need gas, you're going to get gas. 
So what difference does it make what it costs? Since it makes no difference, why clutter your mind knowing? It's irrelevant. I hear people talking about the price of lettuce. <laughs> Do you know what a head of lettuce costs? Good. They know. They know what a head of lettuce costs. It's incredible to me. Huh? Oh yeah, at two different stores. You know? Does it make should it make no? If you want lettuce, aren't you gonna go get lettuce? Then why know what it costs? People who know the price of small things are focused on small things. Everything, here's a big principle. Everything is programming. And anything repetitively stuck in there will accumulate and begin to govern everything else you do. So if you have enough conversation about the price of lettuce at two different stores, see, that's programming. And it's poverty programming. There's only two kinds of consciousness, prosperity or poverty. There's really nothing in between. And so everything's programming. Every conversation you have, every TV show you watch repetitively, whatever it is you read repetitively, it's all programming. You can watch Springer every once in a while for entertainment. I do too. But the person who watches it every day... If they're not already a candidate to be on the show, <laughs> they soon will be. Because it will create what they're watching. Your next slide is about acceleration. I'll tell you a story. When I, isn't that your next slide? Page 23. This explains to you, this will also explain to you why I have a drawer full of money. And when I moved from Ohio to Arizona, I left here in 1978. We had just had two consecutive record-breaking bad winters, and I'd had it. Um, I don't really like to talk on the phone, and I think Pete's here. I think I called him 20 times a day because I was trapped in my apartment for five days, couldn't leave. My first wife and I were trapped in the apartment for five days, couldn't leave. It was three days too long for that marriage. Um, um, I'm best taken in small doses. Um, um, anyway, right before I left, the big thing in the news in Akron, Ohio, was this very prominent judge. <coughs> Um, family, prominent. Um, I mean, this was very newsworthy because of who he was. Uh, he had gotten arrested for uh, molesting a little neighbor girl, very young little girl, and had sexually molested her. And I mean, it was like two weeks, TV news, newspaper news, you know, whatever. Somebody, one of the reporters, finally gets an interview with this guy. Um, and she asks him, you know, given who you are, you know, and all the good works you've done, and hum, 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 how could this happen? And he said, I've thought about it a lot. And he said, here's what happened. He said, eight years ago, I'm watering the bushes in my front yard. And a little girl in a short little sundress goes by on the sidewalk. And for a fleeting millisecond, I had a thought of what would that be like. And he said months later, and he described another, I won't bore you with the long story, but he described another scenario and he said, now the thought lingered for maybe a minute. And then, six, seven months later, described another scenario. And he said, at some point, about two months ago, 
it's all I was thinking about. And as soon as it was all I was thinking about, I did it. It happened. Now, what he described is how everything happens. This is how you buy a car. Do you first have a fleeting millisecond of thought about it? Do you see a car, an ad for a car, a car in a parking lot that you like? It's red, it looks good, it, whatever. You weren't shopping for a car, you weren't ready to buy a car necessarily, it wasn't on your radar screen, but a little thought. Now the, the door thing goes bad. This happens, that happens. Pretty soon it's a minute of thought, 10 minutes of thought, 15 minutes of thought. The day it becomes pretty much all you're thinking about is only a day or two before you buy a car. That's how everything happens. In terms of positive achievement, and see, understand, this is like money. See, the process doesn't discriminate based on morality or immorality or good or bad or Christian or Buddhist or black or white or poor or rich. The process is like money. It doesn't care or know. It works, just like money moves. So the same process that turns the respectable judge, patriarch of his family, Sunday school teacher at his church into a child molester is the same process that gets you to buy a new Ford this week, and it's the same process that makes somebody rich. Process is the same. And by the way, everybody is susceptible to the process having an adverse effect on them just as having a positive effect on them. None of us are immune. Everything happens this way. Now, the trick to faster achievement is getting to the last part of the process quicker. Because as soon as it's the only thing you're thinking about, whatever it is, it happens. Just for most of us, it takes a hell of a long time to get to the point where whatever it is is the only thing we're thinking about. This is how, most of you are married, this is how you got married. <laughs> Unless you were really, really drunk and in Vegas. But otherwise, this is how, you know, then it's a little quicker. But this is, and you might not have been thinking at all. But I mean, for the most part, this is how everything happens. The trick is just to get to the end of the process faster. Now, there's all sorts of things necessary to get there, clarity of what it is that you want. But... The programming issue, getting rid of crap so there's nothing in the way. And then, everything you can do to get yourself focused on the it that you want. Gimmicky stuff, picture on the refrigerator, drawer full of money, psychological triggers. Everything you can do to get you to the end of that process, then you get whatever it is you want quicker. The process is, in fact, works all the time. Like gravity. The process controls your entire life. Everything you got, everything you're ever going to get, everything you lost, everything you don't have, everything you've ever achieved, pretty much all of it went through this process. Sometimes it just takes a long time. People always ask me, well, how did you get in this business? How did you become a speaker? How did you do this? And my short answer to them is accident. I bumbled into everything. But the long answer to a lot of it is, if you go back and analyze it, it's this process. Ever so slowly grinding its way to a point where suddenly it accelerates. First time I ever thought about speaking, I was 16, saw Zig speak. I didn't think about it very long, but one thing, I stuttered. So a natural career choice is not Hey, I'll go do that. You know? But I mean, there was a thought because of the stampede, by the way, not because of the speech. I mean, the thought was, holy crap, look at this. 
You just did that, which doesn't look all that difficult. <laughs> and he and this is happening. Holy. It's funny how speakers Mike Vance, you know, no, we're not gonna change Mike. Mike's, I don't know, 71, 72. But most of the places Mike speaks, there ain't no stampede. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's doing GE and, you know, the National Association of something or other. His use, he doesn't really sell from the platform. A little more than he used to. Um, but, I mean, he doesn't do, like, a pitch like I would do a pitch. And in most of the environments he speaks, you'd have to fight for the right to do and all of that. So they don't see what they saw yesterday much, like ever, like three times probably, the three times he's spoken for me. Mm -hmm. Now, Diane, she's not 72. And she's... <laughs> Yeah, I'm a real bad judge of that, but I can get into the general neighborhood. Um, um, she's interested in the money. She's the one responsible for bringing in the money. She didn't see it the last time. She wasn't with him. She saw it this time. I had to kill her to get her to ship 12 units over here. That was like, huh? Huh? I said, no, Diane, remember the last time? Uh, 12 units. But now there's a glimmer of thought. Like, gee, could we do this all the time? You know? A couple of questions. Say, do you always put it in bags? Yeah, Diane, we always put it in bags. I was like, do you never let him just buy a book? No, Diane, we never let him just buy a book. <laughs> now, here's what's going to happen, see? She's off of it now. She's on to other things. But the, she had a little thought. She's going to see it again somewhere. Or it's going to occur to her now when they ship all the stuff. Hey, this is more crap going out of here in a day than it's going out of here in a month. And she's going to think about it for a little longer. And then she's going to think about it for a little longer. And at some point in time, Diane Deacon's going to be selling from the front of the room. She's going to figure out at some gigs, if he won't, she should go get up after him and sell from the front of the room. She's going to figure this out. And it will all have started with this tiny little... Now, she could speed it up. Because it's the long, and then, but when it speeds up, it really speeds up. Well, you can manually, you can do things to speed it up, and that means you can do one thing, you can get one thing done after another faster. Because you get the front end of the process out of the way, speed it all up, get it done, and get on to the next thing. But that's the process. If you understand the process, now it's just about manipulating the speed. Let's talk about expectancy a little bit. I think it's your next slide, 24, isn't it? The old Norman Vincent Peale approach to this, and I mean no disrespect to Norman, but the old Norman Vincent Peale approach to this has too much focus on the thinking. <coughs> It was a problem with the Napoleon Hill book. It's one of the reasons Napoleon Hill broke. Read his book, read Clem Stone's book, read them one right after the other, as if you were trying to look at them side by side. You'll see every difference I'm going to point out to you today, including the one at the end of the day. It's all reflected very clearly between the two. But now 90% of the books are the same. There's enormous commonality. There's just a few little tiny differences. All right. One of them, the big thing, the big thing I'm going to tell you at the end of the day, I'll give you an advanced clue for those of you that are really sharp, the difference is in the titles. Stone put it in the title. Now, let me, let's just look at Hill's title. Think and Grow Rich. 
Well, it would have been better to say think to grow rich. An even more accurate title would be how to think to grow rich because it's a particular type of thinking. But the implication is just think and you will grow rich. That's the implication. And the fatal flaw word is the just. No, you won't. You can go over there in a corner and think all you want. Think rich all you want. Visualize until you're blue in the face. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. Ever. Cobwebs will form. Nothing will happen. And they'll let you sit there and starve, by the way. This is a hotel. <laughs> okay. There'll be 300 more meetings. They ain't going to move you. They'll just put the flip chart in front of you and leave you over there to die. Okay. Well, the title mis misleads all kinds of people. Okay. So the, the Norman Vincent Peale approach, say, positive expectancy, you get positive results. No. Almost right. Not quite. Got to have a reason for positive expectancy. Then you get positive results. My favorite Akron story. When I grew up here, not very far from here, Fairlawn. Some of you heard this story, but it's a good story. Places have changed now. I'm sure the activity is the same. There's a street called Market Street. There's a big mall on the corner. And then there's a row of office buildings. And in the office buildings are insurance offices. They all clump together. And then there's across the street from all the insurance offices, there's a little coffee shop, breakfast place, called Egg Castle. And around the corner from that is a bar, a restaurant and bar called the Dry Dock. They're in the same little plaza. So in the morning, in the insurance offices, they have their sales meetings. right? And everybody comes to the sales meeting, all the sales guys. And they all, uh, you know, they, re they listen to a positive tape and they, uh, they watch a video, and they sing the company song, and they put on their suits, and out the door they go, now charged up, wired up, ready to go, and they go to the coffee shop. <laughs> and, they, and they stop at the coffee shop for the last, you know, dose of courage before going out into the world. Okay? And they're all there at the same time. <laughs> So all the sales meetings start at the same time, end at the same time. So they're all there. If you're standing there, you hear, you hear a Tony Robbins event. I mean, everybody, they're going to go kill him today, man, a million-dollar policy, today's the day. And then they all head out. This would be now about 9.15 in the morning. At about 4.15 in the afternoon, they all return to this plaza like vultures to a roost, all at the same time. They don't go to the coffee shop, though. They go to the bar. And by the way, if you ever desperately need to buy insurance, <laughs> 4.15, happy hour at a bar. They're all there. Especially if it's free food, two drink minimum, because they come in pairs. One goes to the John. They got a guy orders the drinks, and they both eat. That's the deal. So you'll find all the insurance guys at the bar that has a happy hour with free food. That's where you'll find them. So they all come back. Happy hour is always a funny term. So they all come back to the bar. But they've changed during the day. The conversation is now dramatically different. It, it, it ain't a Tony Robbins event. It's a funeral. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all to use positive and negative terminology, it's all negative. It's all, yeah, hard to sell insurance, economy's bad, everybody works for the tire company and has insurance, I don't get any good leave, it's, that's what's going on. What happened? Where did all the positivism go? It's bullshit to start with. Didn't take very long for it to go anywhere because it wasn't based on anything. Mm -hmm. They had positive expectancy with no justification. Mm -hmm. 
Didn't have any good appointments. Hadn't done any good marketing. Didn't have, you know. Well, that's how most business people are. They get up every morning and they kind of pump themselves up to come to the office or the store or the shop or wherever it is they work. Today's going to be a good day. Get in their car. They listen to a tape on the way to the place of business. They get themselves pumped up a little bit. And at the end of the day, when they go home, kick the cat, kick the kid, kick the wife, kick the wall, get a beer. Why? What happened during the day? Bullshit to start with. Didn't have any reason for the positive expectancy. Well, how many, how many pieces of mail did you do? What kind of voice bar did you do? No, no, I was just positive. Well, you know, there you go, cut it. Mark, Mark Victor Hansen's joke of trying to borrow money from the banker, the banker asked for a statement. He said, I'm positive. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't the statement they were looking for. Same. So a better approach it's not that you shouldn't have positive expectancy. You've got to have positive expectancy. You should expect my affirmations on the next page. Today's going to be a money day. I believe that every day. There'll be a whole lot more money here at the end of the day than there was at the beginning. Most people, but by the way, don't think that. They think the other way. They think at the end of the day they're going to have less money than they had when they started the day. <coughs> Some people even leave their money locked up up at home so it doesn't dissipate during the day. They won't carry it with them because it will evaporate. They're afraid it'll go away just during the day. My mother gave my father an allowance. An allowance. Incredible. Even then, I thought, what? <laughs> what? An allowance. And so he would parse, he would only carry so much with him each day because it had to last a week. And if you carry too much of it with you, it goes away. No, no, no. During the day, you get more. It arrives. You know? It doesn't depart. It arrives. Carry it all with you. There'll be more when you get home. People don't get that. So the positive expectancy is important, but you've got to have a reason. And so the old Dale Carnegie thing is smile a lot and you'll be successful. Vance didn't say it yesterday, but Vance's answer to Dale Carnegie was create a reason to smile a lot. Then you'll smile. Then you'll be successful. Yeah. said last night, you know that Greta Van Susteren woman that does the news talk, you know, that did you hear Len Leno's joke? She had the highest, she's had the highest ratings this past week of any of those shows, and so she got her cosmetic surgeon to put a smile on her face. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's, that's sticking it on with no reason to have it, isn't it? And that's what people try and do with this positive thinking stuff. And then they'll tell you positive thinking doesn't work. Right? Because they tried it with no reason to have it. It's the first time I really got interested in marketing is I, I, it dawned on me. I've got all these motivational tapes on the seat of my bad old car. I'm listening to them. Got myself pumped up every day. Best attitude in the world, no better than the worst attitude in the world if you don't have somebody to use it on who might part with money. If you can't figure out how to get somebody to sit across from you who's got some you could trade something for and use your attitude on them, you might as well have a crappy attitude. It ain't going to hurt you. The trick in the process, it dawned on me, it's not the attitude, it's the guy with the money. And guess what? When you can figure out how to put yourself in front of somebody who's got money who might part with it and trade it to you for something, it's easier to have a good attitude. <laughs> hey, this thing works in the opposite direction. A lot easier to create positive expectancy when you have a reason to have it than it is to create positive expectancy with no reason. So most of the people that 
buy all the tapes and go to all the seminars, they eventually wind up all frustrated and disappointed because they work only on the think part. My friend Foster Hibbert, he had the think part down. What he didn't know how to do was put himself in front of people who had money, who would part with it, and ask them for it as a missing link. He even got in front of people who had money and would part with it. He just didn't ask. Thought they were just supposed to give it to him because he was thinking right. Well, maybe, maybe has a, has a trick Dave can get up, go over to somebody, make them look them in the eyes, and they'll part with the money. You got to worry about him. But he's probably the only one in the room who can pull that trick off. The rest of us, like, got to ask, and we got to hold up something they might want to trade for. He wasn't doing it. Next point. Attract, don't pursue. <laughs> There's some real nonsense about not being focused on the money. You have all heard, somebody actually asked me this last night. You have all heard the, the approach that says, figure out what it is that you love to do so much, you would do it for free and then do that as your business, and that's how you will get rich. Your passion will create your wealth. Let's see. I like to lie in a hammock. <laughs> I like to eat pizza. I like to read. I like to watch football. And I like to gamble on horses. I have yet to figure out how to get anybody to pay me to come watch me do any of those activities. <laughs> they won't come. Doesn't matter how much I enjoy it. My enjoyment can multiply, and still nobody will come watch me have that joy, let alone pay. It's a flawed formula. It's silly. Businesses have to be market-driven. They can't be your personal joy-driven. Because, right. the, the, see, the money don't care about that, nor does the market. Nowhere, anywhere on the planet today, is there anybody who got out of bed hoping you would have passion and joy. <laughs> Not even your mother <laughs> did that this morning. She had something else on her agenda. Honest. There's not a soul, let alone anybody who would give you money. It's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me last night, you know, what of this I enjoy, oh, what of everything I do I enjoy so much I would do it for free. I said, none of it. <laughs> and, and I mean, they were mystified. Not a thing. Not just mean I don't like it, I like it. Do I draw satisfaction from it? Yes. Do I take pride in the accomplishments of the people? Yes, yes, yes. But I wouldn't do it for free. <laughs> I got a whole list of other things I'd rather do for free. If I'm not going to get paid, I can think of other things to do. This is business. It's an enjoyable way to make a living, but it, it's an enjoyable way to make a living. Mark Twain said, no one but a blockhead writes but for money. Mm -hmm. People forget about that. There's not a whole lot of literature that was created for free. They kind of wanted to get paid. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you don't focus on it is wrong. On the other hand, if you are if you are pursuing it from a need position or a desperation position or a uh, money purely for the sake of money position, you probably won't be very successful with that either. 
money's like consulting clients. There's a perversity of too much pursuit run in the other direction. You got to figure out how to kind of let it come to you. Now, that's not by going over in the corner and thinking about it. Mm -hmm. That's by creating positioning, a business structure, a market, a reputation, things that attract and putting them in place. And then you will quickly have people trying to give you more money than you can take and more people trying to give it to you than you can handle. That happens pretty quick, actually. And there's people here in the room who have that problem right, right now. I mean, there's people who are to the point where they have in their business what I call a capacity problem. They don't have a marketing problem. We solved that. Now they got a capacity problem. They got more people trying to do business with them than they can handle. There's a guy who dropped out of our coaching group on the West Coast because in his practice, he's booked out 12 weeks ahead, can't fit anybody in, overloaded with people trying to give him money, has no marketing problems, obviously, <laughs> thinks he has no marketing problems. He's got a capacity problem. And he didn't like the advice about his capacity problem. What do you think the advice is? Yeah, 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 yeah. Multiply himself and keep raising the price until some of them go away. Drive them off. Create a vacuum. Then you'll have a marketing problem. That's one I know how to solve. Right? I don't want, well, I don't want him to have a problem I can't solve. I want him to have a problem I know how to solve, right? So keep raising the price until a bunch of them go away. That problem we can fix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't get that. Um, I have studiously made a point over many years to do my damnedest to make it look like I'm not trying to get money from anybody except when I sell from the front of the room stuff because nothing else works there. But all the rest of my business, it's only, I, go, I go through gyrations to make it look like I'm not trying. Mm -hmm. I'm reasonably successful at it. And the more of that I do, the more of it I get. Halbert, the first Halbert seminar I spoke at, again, I'm not saying anything I wouldn't say if he was in the room, he'd say it himself, fatally flawed individual. But 95% right. First Halbert seminar I spoke at, $7,000 person seminar. About this many people in the room. Didn't know Gary very well. Gary shows up 10 minutes late. Wanders out on stage. We're in Florida, so this is somewhat defensible. But he wanders out on stage. He's got on shorts, flip-flops. One of them net shirts, you know, what hold, what looks like it's got holes on it. Mesh shirts, you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> Cap on. Cap says, clients suck. <laughs> Big letters. Can't miss it. See it all over the back of the room. In case you missed it, he points it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does the first 20 minutes on how miserable all the clients are, how he doesn't even want the ones he's got, doesn't want any more, don't be asking me to do anything, don't try and hire me, don't follow me to the restroom and bother me on the breaks, leave me alone, I don't want any work. Mm -hmm. They're surrounding him at the urinal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's trying to hire him. Everybody's giving him money. By the end of the seminar, I don't know, eight, 10, 12, $25,000 copywriting job. Had he done it the other way, would have got less. Would have got less. All of the inaccessibility I do. Now, that is personal preference. 
and in some respects it started out of necessity. But largely, that's marketing for me. That's intentional. The harder it is to get to me, the less price resistance there is when they finally do. They're already past price resistance. They're just focused on getting me. They're not focused on price anymore. I can charge whatever I damn well want to. Hardly ever comes up. Some don't even ask. They're just so thrilled to have finally tracked the guy down and gotten him to talk to him. They ain't gonna screw it up. Well, that's strategy. Get it? <laughs> that's not. I mean, I am antisocial and all that, but I mean, but 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 it's deliberate. It's intentional. It's a means of letting it come to me. And I've done a lot of things to put myself in a position where there's a whole herd of people to draw and all that. But so you can't really chase it. But you can't be afraid to focus on it either. The two things are not mutually exclusive. They're not incongruent. They're congruent. Not that this is uh, unique with him, but uh, Foster introduced me to one of the most... Oh, I know what I want to talk about first real quick. Had a good question. The question is, the question that was asked, as best I can see if I can get it verbatim, is... Is the only way you measure success money? Mm -hmm. And here's, here's, here's an analogy answer and then a direct answer. The analogy answer is, is that there's a, 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 a movement gaining some ground um, in academic environments, um, in, in school and amateur sports, to eliminate keeping score. Uh, because doing so damages the self-esteem of the kiddies who don't win the game. So this, hey, this has gained enough ground. You apparently don't recall, maybe, but right after uh, Bush too got elected, they put in a big softball deal on the White House lawn, and they had the kids' softball tournament thing there, and they played the game with no score. And if anybody ought to know better, it'd be him. Um, uh, I mean, you want to count every point, don't you? Um, um, so this deal is gaining ground. The idea being you should play the game for the benefits of playing the game and the building of self-esteem and character and teamwork and camaraderie and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and not muck up that whole process by keeping score. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is it's a game. And by definition, if you don't keep score, there's no game. The answer to the question is, in business, yes. The way you score success has to be with monetary points. It's the only way to measure success. Now, if you want to expand it to a big philosophical conversation about success in life, no, not necessarily the most. The issue is getting what you want. And in money terms, that's a different number probably for everybody in the room. And by the way, it's pretty useful to know your numbers. Um, uh, 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 and there are all sorts of other issues, you know. Are your kids healthy? Are your kids smart? Do they get at least to age 18 while they're under your uh, supervision without being drug addicts or criminals or marching into a school with a shotgun and blowing away people, and if you accomplish that, that's certainly uh, a part and parcel of a definition of success. Um, the problem with all of that other stuff is it's very hard to measure. You know, uh, does your self-esteem improve during life? Well, it's hard to measure. Uh, but in business, we can measure. 
and we measure with dollar units. We measure how we improve the value of each customer. We measure our profit margin. Not necessarily gross dollars is not the only measurement, but all the measurements are dollars. And all the measurements should be dollars because it's the only way we can measure. So the couple of people that were disturbed by all that, there you go. Now, uh, Foster introduced me um, to a very interesting idea that, as the FDA says about health products, I have only anecdotal evidence for you. Um, there are no double-blind, placebo-based studies that I know of to prove the efficacy of what I'm about to tell you, and I'm going to give you the short course. Um, he managed to get two days out of this. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, the truth is you can get two days out of just about anything if you really take a whack at it. Um, <laughs> I mean, hey, you can get two days out of having people come and stand up and do all the work themselves. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> um, hey, if I'd known the options guys were going to be down the hall, you know, I could have sent you all down there for half a day. Talk about um, the less fortunate. <laughs> Um, uh, Foster taught, and it's a, it's a discipline that I now have used for many years, and I know there are some people in the room who use it. Um, uh, Jeff Paul and I share it in common. Jeff adheres to it exactly as Foster taught it. Um, Foster taught the wealth account and the saving account. But the premise behind this, so that you understand that first, because the mechanics are extremely simple. The premise is, is that, um, remember that everything is programming, and so the subconscious mind is programmed by everything to either uh, a, a, a sense and multiply prosperity or sense and multiply poverty. It's the two judgments it's always making uh, about what it is that you are. And so the premise is, is that by having habits that reinforce the idea of prosperity, you attract more of it. That's the premise. And the key word there is habit. And most people's habits, of course, are, you know, we, got, we all got a long list of ones we'd probably be better off without. These happen to be two that work pretty well. So now the mechanics are pretty simple. The mechanics are as follows. Two bank accounts that are different from all of your other bank accounts. And now you can get fancy with this and do money market accounts. For the giving account, you can do a charitable trust account, you know, far beyond anything I should be talking to you about. I don't care what kind of accounts you do. But they're two separate accounts. One is a wealth account, which gets labeled that. <laughs> the other is a giving account. When we taught this to the doctors, by the way, we finally, in fact, I don't know if you know this, Tracy, Rodney and I, I don't know if Tracy's in the room, but Rodney and I went and got a bank to do this. We made all the doctors open up their wealth accounts at least 500 miles away from their office. <laughs> Restricted to written withdrawals only. So it would be inconvenient to tap it. Because the idea of the wealth account is it's keepsies. It's supposed to accumulate. You know, when it reaches certain points, you may want to take the money out of the wealth account and put it into something that draws a higher rate. But you're not supposed to be buying cars and clothes and jewelry and stuff with it. So you got two separate accounts. You have one that is your wealth account. You have one that is your giving account. The, you then establish a minimum percentage of every dollar that comes to you that is going to go into each of those two accounts, therefore not being used for anything other than the purposes of those two accounts. Now, as Foster used to say, 0% is too small. <laughs> and uh, most people, uh, you know, a good range is somewhere between 1% and 10%. And so most people want to make the wealth account 10% and the giving account 1%. And uh, that's okay if you start there. 
you'll pretty quickly change, change, change your uh, mind uh, for reasons that we'll talk about in a second. But so each of these accounts is a separate account from anything else you do, and into it you will deposit somewhere between 1 and 10 percent, pick a number, uh, of all of the money that comes to you. Now that, that part's important, the all part. It doesn't matter whether it's income, capital gains, money you find in the street, somebody who owed you money you never thought you were going to get back, shows up and pays you, none of that matters. The fixed percentage, yeah, I'm not, I shouldn't do this, but go, what, what, what's your problem? What? Percentage of the net or gross? No, gross. gross. Here we go. <laughs> <coughs> net. If you do net, there'll never be any deposits. Okay? Garner's still looking for the net from Rockford Files, you know? There's a saying in Hollywood, there taint no net, you know? You'll have everything coming off of there before, no, gross. Well, if I take 10, 20% of my gross, I no, because your gross will expand. That's what this does. This is not like take away 20%, only have 80 left. You'll take away the 20 and you'll have 200% left. Hard math for the engineers in the room to get. But, but, but I mean, you should be able to get that math. You're looking at me like a deer in headlights. <laughs> You're the metaphysical, you know, sandals guy. You should be, you know. <laughs> For God's sakes, you're charging people to press their body with thumbs and reconnect their electrical circuits. <laughs> and you're looking at me like I'm doing something weird? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Year for $4,000, whoop, your circuits are reconnected. You feel better? Oh, I feel good. And he's, and he's looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Just stay with me for a minute. Mm -hmm. Percentage, somewhere between 1% and 10% of your gross into each one of the two accounts and all the gross. Gift from grandma, found money, sell your house, sell your car. All right. Into the accounts goes the money. Second key part of the formula the frequency of the deposits. The more frequent, the better. Get money, make a deposit. If you put money into your regular account, the same day should be the deposit into the wealth account and into the giving account. This is not something you clean up once a month, not something you clean up once a year at tax time, not something you clean up when you get around to it because not for mechanical reasons for subconscious programming reasons. The frequency matters, because every time you make the deposits, you're telling this thing, oh, I'm doing really great because I'm making deposits to my wealth account and my giving account. Right, so it's the programming purpose. The actual locking up of the money is even less important than is the process and what it does to your subconscious system. So the frequency of the deposits is important. I actually, because I know you guys want to know what I do, I'm actually depositing ahead. I mean, now, he never taught this, but then he never had one of my other weird habits. I'm slow at making bank deposits. Now, this will be foreign to people, and I'm not necessarily recommending this, but I'm I know you want to know what I do, so I'll tell you what I do. Like Ted Thomas is, I think Ted's here, and he's frustrated because he gave me a check in January. We haven't deposited yet. Um, I run three weeks, four weeks, five weeks behind. I shouldn't tell you that because every once in a while I do one on time, so if you're counting on float. <laughs> um, um, there's a problem with this truth business, you know? Um, but anyway, I let them lay around for a while. And then I do big deposits. Some because I'm busy. Some because I like the programming of having so much money coming in, I don't even have time to deposit. So I let it pile up. Um, but I do these deposits at least every week 
as the money comes in, even if I haven't got the money, into my regular accounts. So I'm actually ahead of the game in these, rather than simultaneous, and most people want to try and trail. Right. So frequency is important. Right. So the money goes into these two accounts, and it should be a fixed percentage of all of the gross that comes to you. Um, and it should be the deposit should be done as frequently as is humanly possible. Now, Foster used to teach, except for the doctors, because they would all steal the money back out of their wealth account. He used to teach going and doing it physically. Right? And I think he's right, by the way. I think there is something to the physical act of taking it in and handing it across the counter and all of that. However, we're all busy people, and so I will confess to you that I don't do it. Okay? Mine go by mail or FedEx. Um, and, uh, and I try not to set foot in a bank any more often than is necessary. Um, but So that's now the mechanics. Now, the money's in there. In the wealth account, if you want to take money out, it should only be for transfers to other appreciating assets, not depreciating assets, like real investments. And I know a set of golf clubs is an investment in yeah. happiness and peace of mind. I, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, like, I don't take any money out of my wealth account to feed the racehorses. I mean, that money's got to come from someplace else. Well, you know, it's the old deal. I mean, you know, I got eight, well, I got 16 horses now, and they all eat while I sleep. And the ones that we have in partnership, I got the end that eats. <laughs> um, <laughs> And they're usually only lame in one leg at a time, and it's always on my end of the horse, too. I don't know how it, um, all right, so we got these two accounts, in flows the money. And in it goes as frequently as is humanly possible. Mm -hmm. We used to get the chiropractors to do it like twice a day. Do all your money that came in before noon, make your deposits. Do all the money at the end of the day, make your deposits. Do it twice a day. Mm -hmm. The more frequently you do it, the better the programming, because this is all about repetition. Mm -hmm. So now the money's in there. The money can come out of the wealth account only for other wealth purposes. Mm -hmm. The money can come out of the giving account only for giving purposes. Now, back to the math. The wealth math, everybody gets. Right? If I got $100, gee, I wonder where the torn 100 went. So bellhop somewhere with a roll of tape. <laughs> all right. That's what it's for. Um, so, um, I hope it's a bellhop and not one of you. Um, you want to know, by the way, as an aside, cheapskate behavior is poverty consciousness based. It's not prosperity consciousness based. You, you schmucks that are carrying around the little chart to figure out precisely 14.8% tip on the restaurant check, you know, and are worrying about redeeming a coupon, it ain't helping. Um, so, we got $100, we put 10 of them into our wealth account, we lock it up, it's our wealth account, we only take the money out for things that build our wealth. Just about everybody has no problem with that. When I heard it, I didn't have any problem with it. I got, okay, I get that, because I, I still got the 10, right? I just took it and I put it over here, but I still got it, right? It's still mine and it's growing, right? So that I got, okay? It's the other part of the math that's kind of difficult to get, right? Because you take the 10 and you make it go away. And somehow now you got more money, not less money. I said, no, I don't know if I don't buy that. Mm -hmm. The odd thing about it is he's right. Mm -hmm. And the principles on one of the pages here, I don't know what the devil it is now, but here it is right here. You can, it multiplies by disappearing. It's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. You give it away, and you somehow wind up with more of it coming in. And you can't possibly believe it until you do it. Hey, doesn't, hey, doesn't take long, though. Try it for a month. A month. You'll see the results. It makes no sense. 
There's not a math course in the world. Makes no sense. But it happens. Now, here's a real important caveat, though. Your next page. Here's one you guys may not like, like so well. Do this for the right reason. This is strategy, not obligation. It's the only way I ever bought it. So maybe it'll help some of you buy it. See, most people's giving is all reactive. It's forced upon them. It's sold to them. They're put into a confined space and guilted into doing it. <clears throat> no offense intended, but that's the, perp that's the church service. We put them in a confined space. We pass the plate from person to person. We make sure we have a plate where you hear things when you drop them in, just like the metal tray in a slot machine in Vegas. Okay. And everybody feels like a schmuck if they don't put something in. Every once in a while, somebody takes one out. Okay. And a few people figure out they can have a little thing and bang it against the side of the plate. But, 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 but well, look. Um, but basically, it works. Works with a small group, works with a big group. Works if it's Benny Hinn with 10,000 people in an arena. Works if it's 30 people in an arena. United Appeal, 80% of the money is raised where? In the workplace, under pressure. Um, almost all nonprofit charity fundraising requires all the same marketing principles we use to sell stuff. They just don't deliver anything tangible for the process. But almost all giving is done for the wrong reasons. It's done because they're guilty about what they have. Now, here's a real clue. The really wealthy people don't give for those reasons. The Ted Turners and the Bill Gates of the world are not giving out of guilt or compulsion or obligation, they're giving for very practical reasons. On one side of the practical ledger, they're giving because they're buying PR. They're buying it. On the other side of the practical ledger, they're giving because they have figured this thing out. One way or another, they have discovered this odd financial formula that you give it away and you get it back plus some, which makes no sense, but it works that way. But you, you should be doing it for the right reasons. Now, the last thing, of course, to talk about is who do you give it to? Far be it from me. And it don't matter. Your choices are your choices. I will, however, because there's curiosity about me, I will tell you some things. I'm not a big fan of organized charities. I've done enough work for enough of them that, uh, with rare exception, I'm not a big fan. Um, they're too close to the government in their economics. Right. Get in 100, 70% for us, 20% to raise more money, 10% to actually do something for somebody. Um, not my favorite formula. Give you a little, insight, little inside secret a lot of people don't know. If you give to any one of the big charities and you get their annual report, there's going to be a wheel in it, you know, a diagram, and it's going to show how much money went to services, how much money went to education, how much money went to overhead, et cetera. And one of the big ones is education. Mm -hmm. Here's what counts as education. They need in four pages of anything, they need a paragraph of educational information or navigation to a place you can get educational information to count the entire expense of all of that as education. So I can take a fundraising letter and I can put a whole paragraph at the bottom of it that says if you suffer from X, whatever the X is we're raising the money for, then you can go to www.whatsis and get information about X. And I can take the whole cost of the fundraising mailing and not show it in fundraising. I can show it in education. There's a similar little glitchiness to services. So if you really want to know the deal, you take the wheel 
and you take about two thirds of what's in services out and move that over to fundraising, and you take about two thirds of what's in education out and move that over to fundraising, and now you got the right wheel. That still may not dissuade you, and that's okay, but, um, but uh, a lot of what I choose to do is direct. And there's a habit that goes with this I would suggest to you. I think it's a good habit. Over tip the people who do a good job. Most of these working folks are first of all working harder than you are, but secondly, uh, most of them, you know, are raising families, they're paying bills, they're, and they don't know what we know. They're economically ignorant. So they don't know how to fix where they are. But they do good work. Over tip them. It counts. Mm -hmm. I go on a trip, I take a hundred bucks out of my giving account, I get it divided into tens, and I over tip. Mm -hmm. For me, that counts. It's also another reinforcement habit. Because just like making a giving deposit twice a day, if you're giving away the money 10 times a day. Rockefeller used to take rolls of pennies when a penny was worth something with them every day and give pennies out to the street urchins. Start the day with two rolls of pennies every day and give away pennies. Right. Now, why did Rockefeller do that? Do you, if you've read anything about Rockefeller, you can't possibly think. It's because he had this enormous amount of love and compassion and concern for the street urchins. <laughs> That wasn't it. Somehow he got somewhere, give away a bunch of pennies, somehow I get more dollars. Amazing he never figured out, give them dollars. <laughs> <laughs> give them a buck. So there's the mechanics of this whole process. It's as weird as the day is long, and if you do it for 30 days, you'll never stop. It ties to your page 33. Most people are very, very, very uncomfortable with money. They don't carry much of it. They keep it locked up someplace. You won't wander into their office or house and see it laying around anywhere. People cringed when I tore the $100 bill. It bothers them. Not everybody, but I mean, there's faces who cringed. Um, years ago, I used to bring somebody up and make them set fire to one in an ashtray in front of their own. And as Dave knows, if you pick, you know, you pick the right person, you really get a reaction. <laughs> um, it makes people very, you know, very uncomfortable. They don't get it in paper. So most people are very uncomfortable with money. Um, uh, money's attracted to somebody who's okay with it. That's really what all this is about. And so the physicality of it can help you, being more at ease with it and more casual with it. You should carry some, like all the time. I mean, who knows, you might want to buy some. And even today, you might be someplace, they don't take plastic. It still happens. You don't get the same subconscious thing from spending with plastic. You get from handling the money. I know, tax deductions, receipts, yeah, I know, I know. And I use credit cards too, but put some cash around you. Don't be so uptight about it, you gotta have it all locked up tight. All wrapped up somewhere. Leave it lay around. Coins are good. Moment at the end of the day, dump all your change, but dump them all and pile up someplace visible. You know, not hid away in a box someplace. I got like five spots in my house. I got big bundles of them. Vases, glass jars, pots, baskets. Pile it up. Got one in my car, you know, change cup, great big, you know, why don't you ever dump that? Oh, I do dump it, but I like a full one. <laughs> don't want an empty one. Different message, right? So when I dump it, I just skim the top off and then I put it back. Mm -hmm. Have some, be casual about money. Take some with you, spend it, lay it around, let it build up a little bit before you do anything with it. The stuff, honest to God, it attracts itself. It multiplies. And most people are real, real uncomfortable about it. 
And the worst thing you can do is totally deal with it only on paper, where you never see it. God, I hate direct deposit. This idea of the check directly into one of your clients forces you to do that, that's no fun. <laughs> I want to handle the checks. I do all my own bank deposits, always have, for years. I don't want anybody doing bank deposits but me. One of the reasons is I want the, uh, the action, the impact of doing the bank deposit, of seeing the checks, making out the bank deposit slip. People delegate that. Why would you delegate that? That's good subconscious programming. Don't delegate the thing that helps you make more money. It's not a task, it's a celebration. Handle the stuff. Um, then you have psychological triggers. There's about, I counted them up, and I meant to make a list, and I didn't make a list. So. But if you carefully went through my house and my office, you'd find over 250 deliberately placed, acquired and placed visual psychological triggers. Now this is anything from, from money laying around to the, to the million dollar bill stuck up someplace, to uh, a collection of foreign currency framed on the wall, to uh, money plates, to a photograph or a plaque or something that means something to you, um, you to books with the covers visible. You would be hard pressed in my work environment to look in any direction, high, low, or in between, and not see something that was visually representative of wealth. That it's not an accident, and it's not because it's my decor choice. Right? It's because it helps. Mm -hmm. There's also about 100 psychological triggers that have to do with time, because I'm very big on making time work. I got a lot of clocks. Half of them haven't got reset since the... <laughs> but, you know, they're still there nagging. They're just wrong, um, which, you know, Describes people too. <laughs> the caption says, When you said you were rich, I never dreamed you were this rich. <laughs> Our point being, it's all relative to what people's experience has been, right? What their exposure has been. I mean, you're, you're welcome to. I mean, in, indoor plumbing, you know, for some people, big deal, right? Um, which brings us to who you hang around with, who you associate with. Right? There's a nice big list on page 35. <coughs> but the one biggie is you don't want to be hanging around with people who think that's rich whose perception is a lot smaller than what yours is or what you want to be. They will restrict you. You can't, you can't make yourself immune to these influences. Television programs you watch, books you read, but by far the people you associate with. Because their association gangs up on you. You know, there's more of them than there is of you. And if they're all walking around with poverty consciousness, or a lot less prosperity consciousness than you have, they will bring your game down to their level. You can't help it. But you can avoid them. Nobody says you gotta hang out with them. Lots of people. Almost unlimited supply of people as there is money. You can replace your friends. You can limit the time you spend with them. You can get new friends. You can elevate your game. Uh, here's a little side tip about this. I have a test I suggest to everybody about the people they choose to associate with in a business way. I have several clients who devoutly wish they had listened to me about this test. 
I can name three that it's probably cost them at least a million apiece hard cold cash to ignore this piece of advice. I can name one it's cost them 15 million and I can name another it's cost 20. Then I'm sure there's some I don't know about. Nobody ever likes to hear I told you so and so there's a short supply of people who you know and to Jerry's credit for example not this but a whole another issue um, I got a fax from Jerry what a week ago or two weeks ago the headline on it says, Jerry Jones is an ass. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, wasn't that the headline? Jones is a big ass. Jones is a big ass, yeah. And it's a confession about a little bet he and I had about a piece of advice he didn't like that, um, you know, every once in a while, I've already made that mistake, usually more than once. Um, so here's the test. And it's really very simple. And when you hear it, it's very sane, but it's amazing how people can figure out a rationalization to ignore it. Here's the test. You're gonna associate with somebody in business. They gotta be able to give you the names and phone numbers of at least three people they've done a deal with who would do another one with them. Now that ain't asking much. Out of somebody, I mean, everybody's got people that don't like them. I can give you a long list of people who would back a car over me, right? but I could provide a few good references. I mean, out of somebody's whole life, three is not a lot to ask for, is it? If they can't produce three, everybody they've ever been involved with would never be involved with them again. What makes you think you're gonna be the exception? <laughs> right? You're not going to be an exception. You're going to be roadkill just like everybody else. But smart people ignore this test. Very smart people because they find ways to rationalize because they want the end result the guy's promising. They find ways to rationalize their way around this test. It's even a good test, bigger, broader. You know, just letting them into your world. If they can't give you three people who have really good things to say about them, who aren't related, I mean, three's not asking a lot. You would also be surprised at how many people can't come up with three. Every one of these people my clients should not have done business with couldn't come up with three. I knew they couldn't come up with three. If they'd have just done the test, they wouldn't have come up with three. One of them couldn't come up with one. <laughs> one he couldn't come up with. I promise you. So you don't want to be around that person and you don't want to be around them. When they, when, when they go bad or blow up or self-destruct or whatever it is that's happened to them repetitively that is going to happen to them again, you don't want to be within like collateral damage range. <laughs> you know, barn falls over, it knocks over a fence and then the fence falls on you. You didn't have to be in the barn. You just had to be close. So you got to be very careful for practical reasons as well as programming reasons who the devil you hang out with. Now here's a goodie. Page 1. Well, I'll tell you this first. Name James McDermott mean anything to anybody? That's a cool story. No. There may be one, but this guy was actually, Dennis, I'm surprised. This guy was head of one of the biggest investment banking firms in the world of investment banking. Um, and a very uh, wealthy and prominent and powerful person. You will remember the story without remembering the name because very recently he was very publicly uh, prosecuted and sent to jail for insider trading for giving stock tips to a stripper who he was hanging out with. And now you nod, it resonates with you. Now, on the surface, if you're this guy, 
who through a couple of linked indiscretions and bad decisions, you have wiped out your reputation, your business, your family, your house, the works, and you are off to sit in the joint for six months or a year. This probably does not look like a piece of good news. However, interesting story about him. If he hadn't been in the joint, where he would have been is up at his big, fancy, giant office in the World Trade Center on September 11th, where 66 of his former employees were, and they all died. Because his office is right where the thing came in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, being in the joint's a pretty good piece of good news. <laughs> and that's the principle. The principle is, a big characteristic of wealthy and successful people is resiliency, and where it comes from is understanding and believing that ultimately all news is good news. Now, you couldn't have sold this to McDermott when they're putting on the cuffs. Couldn't have sold it to any one of us either. Turns out, though, piece of good news. Because the other piece of news was worse. If you don't buy this, you never really get any momentum going. Because you're always kind of starting and stopping as you get pieces of what appears to be bad news. I don't have time to do what I originally intended to do, but here's a little list of some, at the time, pieces of bad news, unpleasant things, things that didn't work out for me, but what they led to. And so every one of these things embodies a day or more days where it was bad news. And every one of these things embodies a whole lot of good news that arguably would never have occurred were it not for the unpleasant experience in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, you might notice not being able to go to college. Hey, I avoided college. Um, um, I, um, well, you can't see all the way down the bottom, can you? There, there's the rest of them for you. Um, uh, I, for example, um, really my very first close business relationship uh, learned an enormous amount from this guy but also went through absolute hell with this guy and uh, it's not really a piece of good news when you are a very young guy and your now business partner uh, is arrested, prosecuted and sent to jail and um, you know, between him and his brother I think we went through $300,000 trying to get him out and it was $300,000 neither one of us had um, um, at the time, you can't do this anymore, by the way, at the time, the banking system was kind of slow, and so you could get multiple credit cards if you were willing to drive all around into different counties, because they did the thing by county. And so if you applied for them all the same day, you got multiple credit cards. I mean, I think I got $60,000 worth of plastic all in one day. Um, now, when they catch up later, they're not happy, but... Um, and I mean, I buried my ass in debt. Uh, and at the time, none of this looked good. But there's a whole lot of things I wouldn't know and might never have known were it not for that experience. I probably wouldn't have found my way into speaking without that relationship. Uh, and so what looks really ugly and unpleasant at any one given time is more often than not, in fact, maybe in the 90 percentile range, I mean, there's some obvious exceptions exceptions, terminal illness, um, but especially short-term terminal illness, um, you know, like, hey, tomorrow. Um, um, but, uh, but setting the obvious exceptions aside, for the most part, if you backtrack every wealthy entrepreneur's list of life experiences, you build a list like my list. You build all these points in time where they were in misery 
or they were humiliated, or they were broke, or they were in trouble, or something horrible happened to them. But then you can draw out from that one thing, two things, three things, four things, five things that arguably could never have happened without that, all of which are good. Iacocca, when they fired him from Ford, everybody figured he's dead. You're never going to see this guy doing anything of any importance again. Turns out the best thing that ever happened to him. Didn't look like it the day it happened. Didn't look like it the week, the weeks. He's getting beat up in the press, you know, as the loser of the month. Didn't look good at all. But arguably, the whole rest of the career wouldn't have been possible if he had stayed buried at Ford. And everybody's got this list. The trick is to know it and respond appropriately. That's the hard part when the bad stuff happens, is to get out the other side looking for the good stuff quick. Most people, it takes a long time to recover. Successful people have quick recovery, real quick, because they know. I mean, as dumb as it sounds, it's, oh boy, there's going to be some new good stuff now, because boy, this was a pile of shit. Mm -hmm. All right? I mean, this is just not good. So, hey, something, I'm going to find something in this. All right. Um, Man, look at Thomas Watson who founded IBM. We had a, we was famous when somebody would come say we got a big problem. He'd say, great. Yeah, yeah, Watson, yeah. And, you know, it's easy to give lip service to, obviously, as well as to try and be entertaining about, but it's a really very serious point. And the people I've been around, uh, again, who, bring, who, who really like have the Midas touch when it comes to money, they're really very good at this. I mean, this is not, this is not hype. I mean, this is the way they respond, is boom, some horrible disaster happens, and they are immediately out the other side of it. You know, like hours or days at best. Whereas most people, it's weeks, months, Average people, it's years or never, you know. But they could be. They're just not. Uh, I had, I told you, I had two cars re repoed in the same year. And um, um, uh, one of them was repossessed in front of a seminar. <laughs> um, uh, everybody is standing in a room with a big glass front on it, looking out at the parking lot, all mingling before going in the back for the deal. And um, they're repoing my car, which is parked right in front of the place. Everybody knows what my car looks like. And I know what they're doing. I mean, it's the second one, see, I knew. <laughs> um, first one you don't know, but the second one, you know, that ain't no car thief. Um, and uh, at the time, I said very loudly, oh, excuse me, they're here to go de de detail my car. <laughs> and uh, I went out, rapped on the window, and the repo person hesitantly wound the window down this far, and very visibly in front of everybody, I handed him a couple hundred dollars. I'm probably the most surprised repo person. <laughs> Maybe the only repo person ever to get a tip in the history of America. Uh, I didn't have a giving account at the time. Um, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but I called home and said, hey, good news, we're getting a new car. Um, uh, now, it's a minor example, and it's meant to be funny, but it is... It is a very necessary reaction. And it is the way that wealthy and successful people react to these things that happen. And like the joke I made earlier, I mean, the emotional issues of the end of a marriage aside, um, the sudden disappearance of half of your money um, <laughs> is an interesting motivating factor. Um, but I mean, seriously, well, the first thing about the money that came into my mind was somebody else is paying. I don't like the number, but somebody else is paying. I'm not going to pay. So really, the number doesn't matter. 
right? No, none. It could have been twice what it was. Might have been a little grumpier for a few days, but I mean, somebody else go pay for it anyway. I just got to call in some more, you know? And yeah, I might have to do a little more work, but you know, I'm young. Um, but actually, I haven't. I just raised prices, by the way. And everybody else pays. You all paid. Um, so, if you liked her, congratulations. Glad to help out. Yeah. <laughs> Section two. Let's do some practical stuff. Before we take a break, we'll do what? We'll, 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 we'll do the very first start of the practical stuff. I'll give you the biggie. 43. Here it is. This is as simple as you can get about wealth. Only two things you got to do. Be the wizard and beware them. Be the wizard and beware of the wizards. Get that? You kind of got it. All commerce is fundamentally based on mysticism. Yeah. Here, somebody left this up here to show me one thing. I found something else I wanted, but I don't know who left this up here. But you're actually, I wanted, th I want this. But here's a full-page ad, direct response ad in some papers. This is your local. It's all direct response. Oh yeah, it's all direct response ads wedged, wedged into a page. Okay. And we're giving away free coins. We got some whiz bang new device that's the secret key to weight loss. Uh, we got a smart clock that uses a satellite in, on the moon to correct itself. We got weight loss gear, it's popular spa weight loss gear being given away free, and then it's a weight loss product, patent lean. Um, which of course has magic patented ingredients that nobody else has from Kuala Lumpur that uh, burns off the fat while you sleep and makes you not want to eat and grows hair. <laughs> Welcome to commerce, okay? Now, you know, we tell everybody to study the National Enquirer and everybody assumes their customers are smarter than that, but see at all levels, the seminar down the hall, Watch, it's all mysticism. There's a wizard who's got a secret for making money with options that nobody else knows, and everybody has come to the wizard to get the secret. It's all about Steve Wynn. We were talking about Steve Wynn at lunch. Steve Wynn decides he's going to build in Las Vegas, which is currently overbuilt, in a recession. He's going to now build, since he sold the Mirage and the, all the other properties, the Bellagio, he's now going to build the biggest ever. It's the biggest, the tallest, the widest, the fattest, the most expensive casino hotel anywhere in the world. Hmm? The ground floor casino has a full service Lamborghini dealership in the casino. <laughs> he raised the money for that. They went public and raised the money like this. I forget how many. Does anybody know the number, how much he raised? I don't remember the number, but it's, it's like a hundred something million dollars. More than that. Yeah? It was more than that. It was more than that. And it was like, you know, 20. Half a billion? Okay. And it's all in in 24 hours. Yep. Why? Because it's Steve Wynn. That's why. The plan, to me, is preposterous. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter. He's the wizard of Las Vegas. He did the Mirage. He did Treasure Island. He, he transformed the Strip. Now he's the wizard. Mm -hmm. So the first part of this is you've got to find a way to some constituency that will give you money to position yourself as a wizard. 
You've got to be magical. You've got to have secrets. You've got to be what they want to be. You've got to present them with a picture that mesmerizes them. Then the second step is be careful not to fall victim to anybody else playing the same game. <laughs> well, you know, my friend Bill Brooks' definition, you know, the consultant is the guy who knows 365 sexual positions and can't get a date any night of the week. Uh -huh. um, you know, experts, see, we make ourselves into experts. Well, so do the other experts. And it's dangerous. Now, there's good experts. I'm one of them. But you've got to use a lot of discretion here. Mm -hmm. Because the tendency in all of us, which is why the first part works so well, <laughs> the tendency is to want to give up responsibility, control, authority, liability to somebody else who is bigger, faster, wiser than we are. Mostly because it gets us out of responsibility. And we're all guilty. That's why this works. So what you want to do is use it, but not be used by it. And as long as you're going to play the game, you might as well play the game to win. See, everybody does the be a wizard thing. Anybody in business does it. Most just do it badly. Most just do it a little bit. So the media, you guys have all watched by now probably at least once Dr. Phil. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. He says some smart things. Mostly though, he's regurgitating Alabama sayings from the 1950s. You know? I mean, if you watch Letterman when they do the Dr. Phil minute of the night, but you know, I mean, I, I, I've now lost count of the number of times his answer to somebody's problem is, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> well, you know, that, it may be true, but it ain't new, you know? Um, he actually said to somebody the other day, if you come to a fork in the road, you should take it. I mean, um, now I'll tell you, there's a couple of interesting things about this Dr. Phil guy. Right now in America, there are probably, how many, does anybody know, um, uh, Bob Olick would, would, would know, is Bob, okay, hundred, how many? Okay, there's 140,000 psychologists, therapists in private practice, and 139,000 of them are pissed off, hmm? because they look at Phil and they say, I got better credentials, I'm a better therapist, I've been at the game longer, I work harder, he has no right to be there. And they're stomping around mad. And the more they see him, the madder they'll get. To the point that their anger completely, completely blinds them to learning anything from what it is that they are seeing. National Speakers Association, where we live, well, there's 5,000 members, probably 2,500 of them are doing personal growth stuff, and 2,499 of them, every time they click on the TV and say, and see Tony, they want to just kill somebody. <laughs> they, well, you know from the NLP crowd. There's a whole slew of NLP guys walking around, starving, yeah. and what they all have in common now is they're all mad at Robbins. Mm -hmm. How dare he? Mm -hmm. They don't get, they don't learn the lesson. These guys, Phil got an opportunity, and he took it. You know, he was the jury consultant in Oprah's hamburger trial. And then he was on the Oprah show. And now he's the biggest thing. He's going to wind up bigger in Oprah if he doesn't follow it up. And all those other therapists may be right. Everything they say may be right. They may be better than him. They may be, but see, but they didn't get this. They haven't gone to work to make themselves into the whiz. And he's making himself into the whiz. So the money's in being the wizard. 
You can be small in a constituency, you can be big, there's money in small numbers, as you know, but this is an important principle. And we'll talk more about it when we come back in 15 minutes. Here's why people give money to other people. Literally, why money moves. And you will see several of them have to do with the wizard position. So those are the ones I want to talk about. One is this issue of authority, and I'm going to say several things to you about authority. One is the transfer of responsibility. Understand the vast majority of people, and again, we got to be careful not to be guilty of the same thing, make a lot of choices and a lot of decisions to relieve themselves of responsibility for their own actions. Hire a money manager. You laughed, we laughed, yeah, I know. Well, you know, Dennis, no disrespect, but you know, it's the Woody Allen joke. I'll manage your money until there's no money left to manage. <laughs> um, but, but, but seriously, why do most people do it? Why? Because they're out from under the responsibility for the result. Mm -hmm. If it goes good, they get to take the credit because they picked the guy. I'm a genius, I picked him. If it goes bad, they got somebody to blame. Cabot Robert, one of the kindest, gentlest guys ever to walk the planet, the only sort of semi-mean thing I ever heard him say was, most people are walking around with their umbilical cord in hand looking for a new place to plug it in. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a lot of money in being the place to plug it in. Mm -hmm. They're all doing it. Mm -hmm. I sat... Um, uh, how many of you remember Est, have paid, paid some attention to Est? Okay. Um, yeah, Life Spring after that, if you didn't pay attention to Est, Life Spring was like Est, or now the Forum, which is what used to be Est. For those of you that don't know, at one time, Est was the big thing in personal development for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, but uh, Werner Erhard, I, I sat, I had my hair cut next to Werner in, in, in Pat Fripp's hair salon in San Francisco when Pat Fripp still had, was not a speaker. She, she was speaking part time, but she had a hair salon in the financial district. And um, I was there doing a seminar and went and got my hair done at Pat's place, and Werner Erhard's in a chair next to me. And uh, so we, you know, we had a conversation. And one of the things I said to Werner, we had a conversation about sell it by zealot was what most of our, which is their marketing method. But I said, boil the whole S thing down for me in a sentence. He said, no problem. He said, we sell independence and breed dependence. Now, you can Call it the most cynical thing you've ever heard. Or you can call it accurate thinking. Take your pick. Okay. But you know, of the 17 principles in Think and Grow Rich, the one people like the least, but he did include it, is accurate thinking. It's the one everybody is least interested in because it's a little uncomfortable to deal with it. But if you don't have an accurate assessment of the marketplace, of the public, of who you're dealing with, who you're selling to, who you're going to get your wealth from, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. If you sell to the affluent, you need to know a lot about the affluent. If you sell to mainstream rank-and-file America, you need to have an accurate assessment of what mainstream rank-and-file America is. If you sell to small business people, you need to have an accurate assessment of what small business people are. Not what you'd like them to be, not what they should be, what they are. And Werner understood this. He understood the vast majority of the people didn't want independence. The money was in giving them a place to plug in the cord. 
So, on our list. So, one thing is transfer of responsibility. Right. Belief their life will be improved for them. Right. Understand, hardest thing in the world to sell, self-improvement. Right. Do it for them, fine. Mm -hmm. So they give you money because they believe their life will be improved for them. Those are important words. And you're the only known source. Not the only source. The only known source. That requires you to define yourself and what you do to whatever your constituency is in a way that makes you the only known source. Now, as Kit Grant pointed out to me, you could even fool, you could even follow up a monopoly. Mm. Okay. They, may, they, they, they managed to see how fast did he make Air Canada go broke? Didn't take long. I mean, he got Air Canada, the CEO got Air Canada debt free how long ago? Oh, no, the government turned it over to private enterprise in 1976. Okay, so in 76 it was debt free. And they're a total monopoly after, for the last 15 years. And now they're broke. Yeah. yeah. So you can even screw up a, a, a monopoly. Okay. Canada's done it in the airlines. We did it with the postal system. Mm -hmm. um, but usually, monopoly is a good thing to have. Right? As a practical matter, it's hard to have, and technically it's illegal. Um, but perception is reality, can, you know, so you can create monopoly. It's a positioning issue. You want to be the only known source. Somebody questioned me yesterday when I said, Somebody asked a question, you, uh, uh, the, oh, it was Mitch's vague, you know, why are you successful question. You said no competition. Yeah, and I said no competition. And I was corrected later, actually, because there's a better answer to the question, um, which is actually a completely different answer. And Tracy remembered it from a tape, and it is a better answer. I probably actually have more discipline than most, um, which means I do more. I might not do it better. I just do more. Um, but but the, the competition answer, I mean, well, is Jay Abraham a competitor or is how? No, no. Because I've defined and positioned what I do in a way that is really different enough from everybody else. And so this is a positioning deal. And you have all the rest of the week. I want to talk about authority a little bit. Number three is real important. And I really don't care if you run a restaurant, if you run an auto repair shop. And it doesn't matter what business you're in. A big step up in money is personal self-aggrandizement, is making yourself the wizard. And you can't do that politely. This is no place for subtlety or grace. Um, this is a place to run it all over them. And I actually don't like it. And I resisted it. For a number of years, for example, none of my literature had my photograph in it. I don't like being photographed. I don't like photographs of me. Uh, and so by personal preference, there would never be any but I'd rather have the money. Um, and, and, and so it turns out that that's important. And since it's important, I change my attitude about it as best I can, and I do what works. Um, most people, you and I, have had, we've had this conversation in coaching. We're still trying to fix you on this issue. Um, most people are too... Um, I don't want to say humble, they're just, they're reluctant to do this. And some of it probably all the way back to childhood programming. Some of it is the issue of, you know, not deserving the exalted position. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that big of an expert, which is the, in the land of the one-eyed man, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed one man is king. Um, 
Uh, it doesn't take much, really, uh, uh, to know enough. Earl Nightingale said an hour a day for a year, and you're one of the top experts in any field in the country. Uh, because really hardly anybody studies at all. I mean, you know, the last book, they closed the last book when they got out of whatever level of school they left, and, you know, since then. You gotta remember, by the way, the last year, 80, 81% of all books bought in bookstores and bought from Amazon were bought as gifts. 81%. Not bought for personal consumption. So if you take the rest of that and divide it and assign it to the 5% of the population that are serious students, you know, the rest ain't reading nothing. So it's not like there's a whole lot of people out there right now trying to become expert in anything. Uh, 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 they're, they're not. And so to know more than whatever your herd is doesn't take a whole lot. To know a lot more than whatever your herd does doesn't take a whole lot. I mean, I, you know, we're right now working with Ron Romano on the funeral industry. Up until a month ago, what I know about the funeral industry, you know, we could fit on a three by five car. I bet now I know more than 80% of the people running funeral homes. And I mean, it's not like it's been my full-time project for the last month. I mean, but you know, they don't, people don't read their trade journals. They don't, they like to get fixed in place and stop. But a lot of people feel reluctant to appoint themselves. You know, there's the whole issue of they think they should be appointed by somebody else. You know, the who will certify me, who will graduate me, who will diploma me, who will anoint me. You know, wait around for that, you will wait a long time. In fact, in most fields, that process, the anointing, certifying, licensing, my friend Pete has a saying that anything you gotta have a license for is a bad deal. Um, <laughs> and, and well, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, the the people doing the anointing, certifying, licensing, recognizing, usually have a vested interest to slow your ascension. Not to, not to speed up your ascension. They're in your way. Because the fact that they can issue the doohickey, they're a rung or two up what they perceive as a vertical ladder above you. Well, the last thing they want is you up there with them. That, that's bad. So the whole process is tilted in the first place. So you appoint yourself. The self-aggrandizement deal, I don't like it, but the more of it you do, um, you got to make yourself bigger than life. The other thing to know about authority is this and it's a corollary to the umbilical cord statement. My friend Herb True, who just retired, but he was teaching in Notre Dame for a number of years, had gone and had been at Notre Dame as a professor and then left and was out in the real world for 20, 25 years, um, and then came back. Um, Herb had me uh, come in and speak at a couple of his classes which is very dangerous. Um, but he and I were talking about the students. And now these are bright kids. And, you know, they're in their second year in business courses at Notre Dame, which whatever their parents are paying, it ain't nickels and dimes. And he said, the funniest thing is, he said, I'm like the only guy who assigns them three books on a subject that disagree with each other. And what they come back and want to know is which one is the, the, note the word, the right book. Because that's what everybody wants to know. They want the right answer. Now, on a higher level, we're all smart enough to know rarely is there such a thing. But it's what we want. We want the diet. Just tell me what to eat, tell me what not to eat. 
If there was one, there'd only be one. As you might have noticed, there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. If any of them was the diet that actually worked, there'd be the diet. But everybody wants this. And again, there's a lot of money in positioning yourself as the person who has the right way. The answer. It's an extension of the magic pill. And you give that to yourself. You create that for yourself. Skip the next one for time. Let's go to page 47. Get paid. Corollary, do nothing free. Especially dispense advice. There is nothing more futile on earth than giving anybody free advice. At best, they don't appreciate it. At worst, they resent it. But they're not going to benefit from it. Huh? And if it turns out bad, they'll sue you. Well, yeah, well, it's, you, yeah, I'm not even worried about that. But I mean, it's just futile. It's futile. And everybody does it. We all have the experience of really trying to help somebody. Mm -hmm. And if you're in our business, if they're the one you put in the seminar for free, they're going to be your biggest problem. Uh, if they're the one you cut your price, do nothing, get paid. They won't pay on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And Stuart Wilde's quote, by the way, some people have asked me for resources. Now, everybody I'm going to recommend to you is a fatally flawed individual. So when you, when you find that out, don't invalidate the message. Mm -hmm. okay. If you invalidate the message based on the messenger, Earl Nightingale said, no messengers left. <laughs> so, uh, but, but Stuart Wilde's worth reading, W-I-L-D-E. Um, and Stewart's deal is when they show up, bill them. Do nothing for free. Um, you shouldn't let yourself be manipulated into doing anything for free either. And people are always trying to manipulate and guilt you into doing things for free. Uh, we have, um, in our speaker association, because it suits their purposes. Um, they, it's such a fascinating thing. You know, we kid about, we've been joking about yesterday with everybody doing all the work and me getting paid. I at least did a little. The National Speakers Association has three events a year. They have a national convention and they have two workshops. Hmm? What's it, a kid, I'm out of the loop. What does it cost now to go to the national? For, yeah, what does it cost to go to the national? Okay, six, 600 bucks to go to the national. How much to go to a workshop? 400. 400, okay. And, and how many go to a convention? 2,000. 2,000. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, 500 maybe go to the workshops. Mm -hmm. These are professional speakers, understand. This is a trade association for, for professional speakers which one of the definitions of being a professional versus an amateur is you get paid to do it, right? All of the speakers on all of these programs are attendees. Right? They all speak to each other. None of them are paid to do it. Not only aren't they paid to do it, they, they don't get their registration fee waived or anything. They pay to go and work for free. It has never occurred to any of them that there is anything strange about this. NSA has brilliantly sold them that it is a privilege to be selected. NSA is also very good at getting as many of them on the program as is humanly possible in the time available. A lot of breakout sessions, a lot of panels. Why? Because the more people you put on the program, the more come. Mm -hmm. They're getting them there by putting them on the program. Now, I don't fault any of this. I just point it out as an anomaly, as an interesting thing, 
And it's amazing that it has never occurred to anybody participating how the paint defense deals work in here. The whole business is based on paint defense. All the revenues from paint defense. There's nothing else but this. The entire model. And so everybody's working for free. So NSA has this culture. They obviously encourage this. And so when I was on the Peter Law events, as you might imagine, there's an endless number of speakers who want to get on there. And um, you know, most of them are destined for failure because they can speak, but they can't sell. But that's neither here nor there. So I started to get the calls of how could, tell me how to get on. Tell me, uh, connect, I'm going to, they would send their stuff. Please give this to Peter. Okay. Now these are people, we have nothing, I mean, we, I don't know them. We belong to the same association. Okay. They, I'm in the directory. But it's not like I've been getting Christmas cards from any of these people. Some of them have never spoken to me prior to this call. Okay. But all of a sudden, we're compatriots in arms with an obligation to assist each other. I have one who's still mad at me. He's in Phoenix. And um, he calls up out of the blue, and he wants to drop by my office, first of all. This is a bad idea. Okay. This is not even a lunch invitation. This is drop by my, he's too cheap to even say, drop by my office and take you to lunch. No, he's going to drop by my office for a couple of hours. Because <laughs> Peter's put him on, he's given him a try. And he wants me to coach him on how to do well. An officer, by the way, for your information. And he is shocked, stunned, and astounded when I am not excited about this prospect. And he proceeds to lay on me the guilt trip deal, right? NSA has been very good to you. You have an obligation. All the words, okay? All the guilt words you can find, this guy's packed into one telephone call. He just picked the wrong guy. Mm -hmm. But it would work with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And in their own way, there's people trying to do it to you all the time. They do, you have no such obligation, and you do them no favors. Because here's what would have happened if I had done it. I'd have wasted two hours of my time, and one of two things is true. He either would have ignored everything I told him to do, so all I would have done is peed away two hours, or he'd have wound up mad at me because he wouldn't have liked the advice about what was necessary to do well. The only prayer, I, if I had wanted to actually help him, which in this particular case I had no interest whatsoever in doing, but if I had actually wanted to, so I made no attempt to sell him, but if I had actually desired to help him, the only prayer I had of doing so, and the only hope he would have of actually benefiting from those two hours is if I had made him pay for it. Because then he would have paid attention. He might have still got mad, but he would have fought within himself not to get mad because he was paying for the advice, and he might have actually used some of it. But had I let him guilt me into giving it for free, futile. How do I know? I did it early on. Not they didn't guilt, I just did it. Were the ones that were on the program. You know, you'd see them struggling and they weren't getting it. And so I did it with a couple of them. Take them aside, sit them down. And Peter would ask me, can you help? Yeah. Take them aside, sit them down. Let me explain to you what, you know, what you're doing works where you speak normally, but it don't work here at the circus. Here, this is what, it, what you got to do. And if you don't do this, you're not either huh or P.O. One or the other. Futile. There's only one guy on that whole thing that I ever helped. And I made him give me money. My fee and 5% of his gross for the rest of the year. 
I said, you're struggling. Peter wants me to fix you. If I don't fix you, you're going to be gone. But I ain't fixing you for free. Here's the deal. Now, PO'd, but PO'd with a good result. Instead of being PO'd with no result. Plus, I made money. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Him I fixed. Went from like dying to numbers almost as good as mine. You got to get paid. Next principle, real important. Now, not later. This is a biggie for a lot of reasons. Because it's the key difference between poor people and rich people. Rich people get paid for the work before they do it. Poor people get paid for the work after they do it. That's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Because the poor are getting paid late, the rich are getting paid early. If you're getting paid early, you've got money. Real, I mean, real working poor people, think about their existence, because it's an analogy. They go work all week or for two weeks. Then they get paid. Why? Because we, the employers, want the use of the money for the two weeks. We're smarter about money than they are. So they work for a week or two weeks, then they get paid. They're chasing their bills, and they're buying under the worst possible circumstances. They buy their groceries by the day. They buy everything by the day. They pay the highest prices. They pay the highest interest. We are paid before we do the work. We got the use of the money. We got cash. Cash is king. We can buy right. We can buy big drums if we want to. We can get better prices. We can pay lower interest because we can put more down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to get paid before, not after, early, not late. The whole concept to me of invoicing, I did it for like a year in business and I quickly figured out, bad idea. You know, I've done the work. Now I'm invoicing, now I'm waiting. How about eliminate waiting? <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, not later. A whole lot of business is part of their problem. Now forget the working poor, go to the small business guy. A whole lot of them are in trouble for the same reason. They can never get ahead because they're always getting the money behind. They're always late because everybody's always late paying them. Our business and the speaking business, a very good friend of mine, he insists on invoicing. Fees and expenses. Now, this used to be the way everybody did it, by the way. At any one given time, he's paid, think about this, 30 to 50 grand of American Express bills for travel that he hasn't yet gotten back, and he's running up another 50 on the Amex, and somebody is being paid in his office to keep track of all that and chase these people to get them to pay for it. And these are expense reimbursements. There isn't even any profit in it. And who's he work for? General Motors, GE. Do they really need Al Schwartz to be their bank? No, but they'll let him be if he's dumb enough to do it. They plan on that. Net 30 means net 90. Mm -hmm. Al Lowry used to have a sign in his office that said, we shall pay no bill before it's time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you something. You don't want to be the guy invoicing Al. That's a real bad position to be in, see, because the sign has another sign. Mm -hmm. So you want to get paid before you do the work. Mm -hmm. You want to structure. That's why prepay was so good in chiropractic. And it's such a shame more chiropractors won't do it. And you want to know something else about prepay for chiropractors? It's better for the patient. You know why? <laughs> Compliance. Compliance. They prepay for $7,000 worth of care. They might show up. They might actually do the exercise you tell them to do. 
because they're so heavily invested. Good deal for the patient. Best reason to do it, good deal for the doctor. So get your money early, not late. Look at how you can be paid long before you deliver, not when you deliver, and certainly not after you deliver. You'll be a happier camper. Mm -hmm. uh, supposing you're working, say, say as a speaker, and you're working and from a bureau, and the bureau saying, well, we won't get paid, and, and so on, like that way. So how would you put it that way? I'd get rid of the bureau. <laughs> mm. Well, I mean, that's my answer. And I mean, Kit and I have this conversation all the time, and he's well, you know, and, and but he gets a lot of business from bureaus. And see, the trade you make, I mean, I'm giving you a simplistic answer to a complicated problem, but but here here's the deal. When you have any layers, let's genericize it now for everybody. When you have any layers between you and the person giving you money, you got problems. Okay? You have vulnerabilities in your business. And you have bigger problems than the one you just identified. Okay? That's bad. But what's worse is you are dependent on someone else to feed you who may be happy feeding you today, but may not be happy feeding you tomorrow. What happens if their brother-in-law decides to do what you do? What happens if they decide to do what you do? Hey, this is so good. He's making so much money. Any nitwit can stand up there and do this. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. What happens if somebody else comes along and gives them 35% instead of 15? What happens if, say, so the trade-off and, I, and the positives, we, okay, we don't need to enumerate those for the rest of the group. There's always positives. But you're trading away control of your destiny. And it's a bad trade to make. Now, do you go home and fire them tomorrow? No, I don't suggest that. But I suggest that you create a plan to wean yourself off of them and take control of your marketing and your direct relationships with clients as quickly and aggressively as possible. Manufacturers who sell through stores or distributors and have no contact with their end user, they're vulnerable. Oh, I'm selling a lot of stuff through Walmart. Yeah. But what happens? There's a whole lot of people who were selling a lot of stuff through Kmart. Now they ain't selling a lot of stuff through Kmart. See, because they couldn't control Kmart screwing it all up. Somebody's selling a whole lot of stuff through McDonald's. They just closed 300 restaurants. This CEO managed to screw up McDonald's. <laughs> I mean, you would think that would be impossible, wouldn't you? No. So what, I mean, there are too many things can happen at Walmart. Now, Walmart's a great account. Do you want to sell through Walmart? Sure, but you, QVC ton of money to be made on QVC, but the real fallacy in the deal is you have no control over the end customer. So it's my real objection. It's a double whammy in MLM. It's my, and I'm not philosophically opposed to MLM, but I think people ought to understand the vulnerabilities. The, war, the thing about MLM, you're, you got it at both ends. You don't control the distributors and you don't control the vendor. You go to bed every night, neither one of them can disappear by tomorrow morning. Right. You want to be in control if you can. And so a manufacturer, at least, there's a guy, oh, God, Woody, been to some of my seminars. What, you know him, Bert, the, the, um, he's a speaker, but he's, he, got, he owns the, um, the cat clock thing from the 1950s. Um, Woody, um, oh, yeah. Woody Young. Yeah, and you guys all know the clock. It's the, it's the clock where the head and the tail move, you know. Everybody had them in their kitchens in, in, in the 50s. Well, they sell a ton of them. Okay? And they're in a ton of catalogs. And they're in retail stores. And I think he's been on Home Shopping Network. Every box has in it. I just got one for somebody. The pitch to join the, what's the thing called? The Kit Kat Clock. There you go. Good. Okay. There's a pitch to join the Kit Kat Clock Club. 
right? And you get a T-shirt and you get a thing and you remember the Kit Kat Cock Club. Why? Because he wants the name and the address and the email address so he's got some control over his business because he's in direct communication with the end users. Now, he may choose to drive them back to a store. Last year, I think it's the first year they came out with Kit Kat clocks now in neon colors. Okay, they got them in pink, banana yellow, turquoise. I think they were all black before. Okay, so he's probably going to do an email blast to everybody and say, hey, we got them in eight colors. Now, he may not direct sell it. I don't know if he does or he doesn't. He may drive them all back to the stores. Go to Kmart, go to Walmart, go to whatever and get your turquoise clock. But he's got the ability to do that. And if Walmart takes them out of their stores, he can email them and say, go over here. Because he's got control of the end user. So he's a manufacturer who deals through wholesalers and sells through catalogs, but he's smart enough to get as much of the end user names as is humanly possible. All right. So you've got to be deeply concerned about a business where you don't have control. Because they may feed you today, but they may not feed you tomorrow. Uh, page 50. There's, there's really two things about this. I'll actually do the second first. There's a really dumb thing that's told to everybody. It's, it's gambler superstition is really its origination. Uh, the Kenny Rogers song. Don't count your money when you're sitting at the table. It's gambler superstition. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people transfer it and believe it in business and in life. Mm -hmm. And it's dead wrong. You want maximum money, you're focused on money, therefore you're always counting. When I call in, I want to know, are we making money? The second question I want to know is, how much have we made today? Matt and I talked about it at lunch. Same thing. He's always watching his numbers. How much have we made by 10 o'clock? How much have we made by 12 o'clock? If he's away and calls, he wants to know. Larry and I had a conversation. Do you, by the way, Larry, where are you? There you are. Um, you're either shorter than I thought you were. There's a couple of really tall people in front of you. Um, do you want me to keep your numbers to myself? You don't care? Okay. He's having his first $450,000 month. Um, he's going to wind up up 300% this year over last year. Uh, and today they did, what, by, the, by lunch, your top guy had done what? Okay, 7,500. Here's what's important. He knows. He's counting. He's paying attention. He's watching the money. It's amazing how many people don't know. I can stump them with marketing questions, but I can stump them with money questions too. Same day this month versus last month, are you ahead or behind in sales? Huh? Well, if you don't know where you are on the 10th of the month, by the time you figure it out on the 29th, it's too late. You're not going to make it up on the 30th. You got to know now. When we fill boot camps, when we're doing, right now, we're in the marketing for Ben Altadon is in the fall, Mike Storm's in the fall, Joe's in the fall. I got to know where we are today as compared, if this is the 18th day of the marketing cycle, I got to know where we were on the 18th day of the marketing cycle last year in order to know if on the 18th day of the marketing cycle this year, we're ahead, we're in trouble, do we need to crank it up, is there something wrong, is it going great, do we need a bigger room, do we, I got to watch it day by day. He should be watching it half day by half day. Watch the money. And I have a little thing I've always done. You might want to play with this. 
I've always, here's what, mo, what do most people kept, keep in their checkbook balance? A ledger. Oh, by the way, how many of you delegate the checkbook in your business just for the hell of it? Oh, good. Very good. Only a few. Very good. Lots of reasons, not lots of practical reasons not to do that. But there are psychological reasons too, just like the bank deposit. Um, most checkbook ledgers just track the balance. That's probably what yours tells you. Um, every time I look at my checkbook, there's a constant tracking of where I am in relationship to the amount of cash I want to have on hand by the end of the year. Total cash assets. So there's a continual list that I'm continually updating of what's in this account, what's in that account, what's in that account, what's sitting over here in this, what's sitting over here in this, what's due to me, which there isn't much of that, and what that total is in relationship to what the total is supposed to be on December 31st. So I'm down X dollars. How much ground have I made up in the last 30 days? Where am I in ratio? And so you could go through mine, and if you went back enough years, you could see you could see the progression against the first million. You could see the progression against the second million. You could see the progression against the third million. You could see the sudden disappearance. You could see the progression again. You could, um, but, but I track that daily. I want to know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars I am away from the number I'm supposed to hit by the end of the year. And I want to know if I'm making up ground, if I'm not making up ground. Do I need to crank it up? Can I coast? Somebody yelled out one from the back. Okay. It doesn't matter whether you do that or not. The most important thing to do is to measure. All right? And the more ways you measure, the more frequently you measure, any athletic coach will tell you, and most athletes will tell you, Absent any other changes, measurement improves performance. Absent any other changes, no change in diet, no change in conditioning, no change in, in training, no change in anything, measure the performance more, the performance improves. But we're dealing with performance here, our own. The more we measure, See, most people don't, be there's all sorts of things in business they never measure. Jay knows the inbound call. Can you believe this? There are doctors who couldn't tell you. Forget about the ratio. I know what you're thinking. They're supposed to know the ratio. How many appointments for how many inbound calls? There's doctors who can't tell you the first number. How many inbound calls did we get this week? I don't know. Now, they might know how many appointments they got, but it's a meaningless statistic. You can't improve that without monitoring the ratio. And they don't know that number. People don't know their average transaction value. Michael in the, re in the restaurant business. I'll bet he knows his average tra transaction value. I'll bet he monitors it and works on improving it. You can't improve it if you don't know what it is, if you don't have benchmarks. Transaction value in a restaurant vital. You're dealing with small transactions to start with. If we can get every customer up by a buck, and we do, we seat 300, and we do three seatings a night, that's a thousand, it's 900 bucks, six nights a week, 5,400, four months, is 20, 21, six. By the way, you ought to be able to do money math in your head, not with calculators. I'm no good at any other kind of math. And I, got to, I was given a C in algebra because I had the algebra instructor in my Am Amway group. Um, <laughs> um, I can't, I, 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 but I can't do any, uh, but I can do money math. And, and it's amazing how many people can't do money math. They can't even figure this stuff out. You should be able to do that in your head. Right? But you've got to figure out what all the vital statistics are, all the vital money statistics in your business and in your bigger picture of where you're trying to get and the more you monitor them, the more you measure them, the more you set short fuse targets. See, the reason Larry knows how much they did today is because he's got daily objectives. Some people have hourly. Mm -hmm. Because that way you stay ahead of it. You don't get behind it. Mm -hmm. if, you got, 
if you're managing X number of customers, you may be measuring how much they spend and looking at their spending patterns. Every business is going to be different. But if you put most people to the wall, they're sloppily and occasionally monitoring four or five numbers, four or five stats. And the rest of the stuff they're getting is history. The bookkeeper or the accountant does it, and they see it a month afterward, a quarter afterward, or a year afterward. It's the equivalent of the annual performance review for the employee. Too long. You, know, you do that with kids. Imagine, annual performance review. Well, after they burn down the entire neighborhood, okay, got to be more often, right? I have a client who said, I was at his place. Well, it was Paul Johnson. He don't mind me telling him. I'm at, I'm at his place. We're shooting his infomercial. And we're there on a day real business is happening. And now, to be fair, here's how good his market is. Paul in the room, is Paul here today? No. Good. Then I can really talk about it. Here's how good his marketing is. It's like a 70% give or take close rate of people who come. They get to the facility, 70% of them buy. But this is total testament to all the pre-marketing because I've seen the sales. The sales guy. Oh, up pulls this couple. Anybody in the room here, you could know nothing about sheds and you could have made this sale. Up pulls this couple, about a five-year-old Cadillac, immaculate, gleaming. I'm a Marine license plate holder, flag thing in the corner, Marine decal in the other corner, right? Guy gets out, about 55, casual clothes, but pressed. Mm -hmm. Nice little wife with him. She looks like somebody stays home, bakes. He's got... A brochure, he's got the brochure, he's got the testimonial booklet, and he's got a clipboard. <laughs> Comes up, there's four different shed models. He's in and out of the sheds, they're outdoors. He's in and out of the sheds, exactly what you saw on the show where we were shooting. He's in and out of the sheds, finally he's back in one of the sheds, she's trailing along, he's writing on his clipboard. Out comes the sales guy. Young guy, goatee, sunglasses. Never takes the sunglasses off. Never asks a question. Answers questions. Never asks a question. Now, I've seen the script. He's supposed to be asking questions. Like, what are you going to do with your shit? Hey? Never asks a question. Answers questions until he's answered the last question. Never tries a close. They stand there. They look at each other. Problem is, they don't know how to buy. See, he's supposed to know how to sell. They haven't been trained how to buy. They part company. Sales guy goes back inside to sit down and watch TV or drink Coke or whatever it is he's doing in there. Couple goes back to car. Comes back from car. Goes back into one shed, is in there for three, four minutes, comes back out, goes to car, drives away. I'm ill, right? <laughs> I mean, it's all I can do. I'm thinking, geez, I mean, what a lay down this is, right? Now, keep in mind, they're getting 70% with this going on. Mm -hmm. I say to Paul, I tell him, we're driving now to somebody's house to shoot one of the testimonials. I said, you know. <laughs> and I, he said, you know, he said, about a year ago we did some sales training and we did get a bump. A year? They forget their job over the weekend. <laughs> okay? Monday you do sales training. You're spending all this money to get them there. You've got to have the functional person. If you're stuck in a business, you got people. I don't envy you, but if you're going to have them, you've got to fix them daily. And you've got to measure their performance. So here's the question I ask. How many leads did he, whatever the doofus's name is, which I now forget, 
How many people did he meet with last week? I don't know. Therefore, you can't know what his closing ratio is because you don't know what the starting number was. He doesn't know how many total people came, but he doesn't know how many Al dealt with or how many Bill dealt with. Got to know. Got to be on top of that. Got to measure Al's average transaction size because there's upsells. There's window boxes. There's windows. There's solar panels. There's The money's all in the upsells. If you're running a car dealership, you don't just monitor the number of units the guy moves. You monitor the average sale. You monitor the margin because they have flexibility in, in the margin, right? Guy, guy could be the third best guy in total units, but he could make it, be making you the most money. So every business has a bunch of stats that you need to be on top of all the time. And your own money stats. Where are you? Where are you trying to get to? I'm also big on figuring out ahead of time where the money's going to come from. Because if you figure that out at the beginning of every year and then you recheck it every month or every week, depending on how you get your money, then you can figure out what the dollar amount is that you want this year that you don't know where it's coming from, that you have to create something to get it. So every business has some stable sources of money, I hope. I mean, even mine does. So at the beginning of the year, I know, well, I get this much from platinum. Done deal. In fact, we've already collected most of it. I got this much from my coaching programs. We got this many people who are due for expire this year. I know what our renewal rate is. I can do the math. I know what we're going to get from renewals. All right. uh, I pretty much lay down. I'm going to average a consulting day every month. So I'll plug in 12 times $7,800. Okay, that's known. That's a known. Figure up all the knowns. Deduct that from the amount of money I want. Here's the number. I don't know where it's coming from. It's X. Now I got to go figure out where to get X. What are we going to do to make X happen? Guy running a restaurant, he's got a certain number of customers who come in twice a week unless they're dead. Well, okay, and their average ticket size is X. We know we got that. He's got a certain number of customers who come in four times a week. I don't know what that is. The cop comes in every night and orders pie and coffee. Okay, 30 nights. Pie, coffee, boom. We could figure up what the, what's going to be there for sure. Now, if we want it to be 50000 this month, and the total we figure up that we know is going to be there is twenty five. now we got to figure out where we're going to get, how are we going to make the other twenty five happen? What are we going to do? If you don't do these calculations, you're running around flying blind. You may be doing more than you need to do, and you could go play golf. You may be doing less than you need to do. But if you're not monitoring, if you're not working the numbers, you don't know. And remember, you know, remember just specific to marketing. Marketing boils down to behavioral psych and math. That's it. <clears throat> the math part's just as important. It's just not as much fun. By the way, I hate all this. Wasn't any good at it. I don't like it. I detest it. I'd rather not do it. But if I don't do it, I don't get the results I want. The second thing about then about targets is you want to be very, very careful. You want to set targets. You want a lot of targets. There's some theoretical, there's some people running around right now. There's a couple speakers. There's a couple books out. The book sold very well because it told people what they wanted to hear. Uh, in fact, I think the title of the book was Don't Set Goals. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Am I wrong, Michael? It's out there, isn't it? Living Without a Goal? I was tempted. Huh? No, there's one called Don't Set Goals. Now, there may be another one, Living Without... Don't Set Goals made it to the Times bestseller list and the Amazon list. It was up there for a while. It's not quite as dumb as the book Non-Manipulative Selling, but it's close. Well, I mean, that book, by definite, non-manipulative selling. Can you think of a dumber title? All selling is manipulation. What else is it? I mean, it should be a two-page book. Non-manipulative selling, bankruptcy. That's what it should be. 
<laughs> you know? End of story, you know? So this thing, don't set goals. And so there's people running around, don't set goals. because Here's the rationale. Because most people who set goals don't get them. Well, most people don't do anything with anything. That's why the Federal Trade Commission law, it's the worst law ever written. And we all have to live by it. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the typicality of claims law. The typicality of claims law says that the claim, the promise you present to the marketplace, contextual, including your testimonials, should represent the typical results achieved by your customer. Okay? So in the way, well, since 95% of them do nothing, that kind of on a bell curve brings the average way down, doesn't it? Now, if you could use the five, and, but, and, and, but and just do the ones who did something. So in weight loss, for example, typicality of claims says you're only supposed to be, that's why you see all the, they'll show you other stuff and they get, and it's risky, depending on how you do it, but they're always, average or typical weight loss is, you know, a pound a week or a half a pound a week or whatever, because that's the real story. Not that you couldn't lose 20 pounds a week with this product, some people do, but there's 90% of the people who buy it who never take it, right? Or they don't follow the diet that comes with it. They take the weight loss pill and then they eat, eat pizzas, right? Well, they're going to screw up your average big time, right? So it's a, bad, it's a very bad law. So the deal, oh, we're going to tell everybody not to set goals because most people who set goals don't get them. Well, most people who do anything don't get anything, the results from it. That's most people. God forbid we should make our decisions based on the results most people get. You'd never do anything. Right? You'd never attempt anything. You'd never do anything. You'd put yourself in a cocoon. Right? So that's a bad justification. Every high achiever I know, tons of goals. One of the most successful guys I work with, he's working 300 to 500 at a time, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, carries them around in a big book. It's the only thing he schleps around with him. Goal book. I'm constantly trying to find out where he is. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Counting, 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 counting. Mm -hmm. But, very important, when you set your goals and you set your targets, don't restrict modus operandi. Other than the list of things you won't do for money. You should have that list. That list is okay. You should have it. But once within that list, be very careful about defining your goals in a way that restrict modus operandi. Most of the five major changeovers of my businesses in the last 20 years, my plan and strategy has been behind the reality, not in front of it. It started and I saw it. I said, oh, okay, now we'll create a plan. Because what's happening by accident, we could make happen more on purpose. And this is better than what we were doing before. But if you restricted the modus operandi, it never would have been allowed to happen. You get it? Let's go to, let's go to nine. None of this is new. I'll be quick. But it's important. I'm amazed at the problems, like in coaching. You can divide everybody in my coaching groups pretty much. Here's one of the ways you could divide them. There's a, there's a third of them who are maximum get doneers, month to month, lots of stuff. Boom, 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 boom. All right. I mean, they're into implementation. Yesterday, we had one guy who implemented during the event. I don't know, he, was one, he took, it was Richard Roop, and he took um, Tony Rubleski's strategy for, for collected testimonials that he presented the first day, had a website up, did an email campaign during the night, and had 47 testimonials by the end of the next day. I'd love to have him in coaching, say, because he's going to be fun. Those are going to be good calls and good meetings. There's a third at the other end who pretty much never get nothing done. They're around because they like the sound of my voice. 
All right. But pretty much, not, they think it's a big month if they got one thing done. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got a guy, this is two years ago now because I bounced him out. I'm trying to get him to do a broadcast fax campaign. It's two years ago. The conversation, one, the second month after we talk about it is, I called the fax company. Yeah. That's it. In a month. In a month. Next month, I wrote the fax. Three months before this is out. You could have mule trained it. And I mean, well, I'm so busy, I don't have time. Totally out of control. Mm -hmm. Then you got people who are in their state. Women, you wouldn't know this, but men actually now are talking on the cell phones at the urinals. Yeah. Honest. Am I lying or not? Huh? They're talking on a cell phone at the urinal. <laughs> their life is so out of control, they can't even pee in peace. You got trouble. I almost stopped and kicked this guy's butt the other day. I'm driving through my neighborhood, and here is this guy out in his front yard. He's playing catch with his kid, talking on the cell phone. I want to just kick his butt. Either put the phone away and pay attention to the kid or leave the kid alone, but don't send him the message, you know, that you are of such trivial importance that I can't take 50 minutes here without being interrupted with a phone call. I mean, I just wanted to take the phone and boom. Uh, so people are just, they're just out of control with this thing. If you can't get control of your time, you aren't going to have to worry about managing money. Mm -hmm. So the list, nothing new. You got to, you, you got to escape the pure exchange of time for money. Pure billable hours businesses, you can make money. You're not going to get wealthy if you can't find a way to transcend the exchange of time for money. Because ultimately, you'll reach a point where you can't get any more per minute, per hour, per day from a straight exchange. I have a few clients right now that we've pushed. Neither they nor I can figure out another way to shove their minute, hourly, daily rate any higher than we've got it. We're like 20 times the average in their industry. We're, we, I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Fight for the highest and best use of your time. you got to fight for it because people are constantly getting you to do a bunch of crap that you shouldn't be doing, that somebody else should be doing, that doesn't contribute. I mean, on one hand, I went two years without buying gas. Somebody else had to put gas in the car because I ain't got time to buy gas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a minimum wage. I mean, you know, somebody can go get gas. You know? And I mean, on one hand, as a result, I mean, I actually now occasionally enjoy going and getting gas. It's like, hey, normal life, this is what it's like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but really, I shouldn't be doing it now either. Mm -hmm. And I got to stop. I got to get somebody to go get my gas. I mean, I, Pete's wife did a great, I mean, it's laughable. I mean, I laughed, but if we did it with 20 things, it'd be good. She comes and helps when we have the coaching meetings at my house here. And so I tell her, you got to go to the store because I, you know, I haven't had time to get anything to the store. You know, one of the things we need is we need paper towel. Donna comes back with like, 10 lifetime supplies of paper towel. I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, a package, right? She comes back with a truck. I mean, I got enough paper towel. Uh, it, it'll outlive me, I promise you. But really, good deal. I got space. One more thing I never have to do again. <laughs> and, and it actually appreciates better than the stock market or real estate. <laughs> so really, it's an appreciating asset now stored in my business. you you got to fight to stay on the highest and best use items. And you've got to be willing to let things not be dealt with at all. 
in order to do that. I got faxes from people I haven't answered in a month. They're in the month-old pile. Some of them are on their third, and these are people trying to give me money because I separate that. <laughs> I mean, I, that's the first, that's, by the way, the first thing I do when I look at anything. Is this somebody trying to give me money or is this trying, somebody trying to get me to do something for free? Because right? anytime they're not trying to give me money, they're trying to get me to do something. I may need to do it, but that's neither here or there. The A piles are always giving me money. But there's people I've responded to in a month, and some of them, you know, they're on their third. I've been trying to, you know, well, yeah, but I got my priorities. And so this will just sit. And if it's still there, great. If it's not, you know, there's another bus coming. You know, they'll wait. You've got to be willing to just set stuff aside and not do it. People in their businesses, what do they do when the mail comes? They stop what they're doing. They all, in a big office, they all whoop out of their offices. If there's not a mail room, they're all out there. They want to look at the mail. Rarely is there anything in the daily mail that requires immediate attention or is more important than what they should already be working on. You know, wait. You know, faxes. You know. Just because it, it's fast to send it doesn't mean you email. Oh, I, got, I mean, that, what's the other thing they're doing? They're at their urinal with the cell phone checking their email. <laughs> you know? Please. I mean, get with it. The, note the word mail. Mail. It's just another pile of mail. You know? When the mailman comes, if you're in the middle of peeing, do you stop, do a Kegel exercise, run out there and get the mail? No. So don't do it for email either. It's mail. There are people checking it every 10 minutes. I mean, they're owned by it. Get more than one paycheck for each job. Get paid from more than one source. Figure out a way to leverage your herd, your influence, your relationship with your customers, what it is that you do. My business as a consultant, hey, I'm going to tell, oh, you need recorded messages. You don't have recorded messages? Great, we're going to hook you up with this guy with recorded messages. You need this, going to hook you up with this guy. Why? Because I'm money. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get eight paychecks from one deal. That's the way it's supposed to work. Stack up passive income. Passive income is better than active income once you have enough active income. I'd rather have, well, I'll tell you, because it's, cause, cause it's a good example. Andy said to me, after the, when we went to lunch, he said, you know, he said, that inaccessibility thing may not work for you as good as you think it does because the fact that I know I can't get to you to get a question answered or to get a critique lickety-split is what's driven me to buy from John Carlton and to buy from Bill Glazer. And so you've given John, how much you're in his top deal? So you, what? A couple, couple thousand bucks to John, a couple thousand bucks to Bill. I said, yeah. And I got half of the money from John and I got half of the money from Bill and I don't have to do anything. I'd rather have half the money and no work than all the money and all the work. I'm delighted. John, Bill, have at it. All right. I still got them. I'm still getting you are here. All right. But now I got passive income. I like passive income. I even like the little ones. My Amazon.com check. I'm excited. I didn't have to do anything to get it. Oh, a check I did nothing for. That's like worth four times a check I got to do something for. Because right. I'm at capacity. I'm a guy that's got a capacity problem. I'm already doing all the work I want to do. So now it's, it's like travel to me. You know, travel now is an anathema. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to do it if I can possibly avoid it. I mean, when I started flying, we were talking about this the other day, the old movie. Remember the old movie Coffee, Tea, or Me? Yeah. 
airline. They were called stewardesses then. Sexy, happy to see you. First class, two passengers. There's a stewardess for every passenger. Oh, what can I get you? You know, it really was coffee tea or me, right? Now it's a cavity search and a snarl, okay? <laughs> it, 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 it's just not my idea of fun, okay? So $5,000 at home, to me, I'd rather have 5000 be home than 15000 go get it. You got to know what your own multiple is. You got to know these things. If you're going to manage your, you're going to run out of time. Let's jump to 58. I will relentlessly. I will not give up. First of all, you got to have a price strategy. You may not like mine. You may want to be Walmart for one reason or another. Walmart, very successful company. Can't argue against their price strategy yet. But you at least got to have one. And here's what it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the things that artificially suppress price. Your price strategy should not be motivated by fear. It shouldn't be motivated by guilt. It shouldn't be created by industry norms. Hey, let's see what everybody else is doing and do that. It shouldn't be by easy comparison because you can fix that. You can change that. And a big thing that suppresses price is the absence of a sales system. And so, because we got a bad sales system, we have to have low price. No, fix the system. Paul can raise the shed prices by another $1,000 if he fixes the salespeople. Still the same number of salespeople. Still the same commission. Same everything. Just fix them. And then raise his prices again. Because okay, now, maybe they'll, they're closing 70% now being bad, if they can close 70% being good, but we can charge $1,000 more for every shed, better business. Mm -hmm. When you raise your prices, all these good things on this list happen to you. Mm -hmm. There's too many good things to ignore. So you want to be, in my opinion, your price strategy is premium price, top of the barrel, as high as you can go. McDonald's, we talked about that. Just, I just love this deal. McDonald's. Two months after launching their, oh, they, they copied the value menu deal, mm -hmm. their dollar menu. Two months after, this is the slow boat thing, Tom, you and I were talking about. Two months after they launched their dollar menu, they determine that charging folks only a buck for a burger, I'm reading to you, not, I'm, I'm not even... I'm not even paraphrasing. Charging a buck for a burger tends to lower profit margins. <laughs> <laughs> Two months to realize this. <laughs> the fast food company then posted its first quarterly loss in 38 years as a public company. Wrong price strategy. What did they, where did the price strategy come from? Wendy's. Wendy's, that's right. It was a reactive price strategy because they lacked better marketing or selling systems in order to be able to compete at a higher price point. So the answer was, we got to be a buck too. No analysis of what happens to us if we are at a buck. Two months later, hey, we're losing money. <laughs> <laughs> well, big surprise. What you were selling for two fifty, you're selling for a buck. Hey, you know how many more of them you got to sell? It's your next page. This is biggie. You get this, you change the way you do business. Size matters. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's getting late, huh? It it's, 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 get, it's, get, it's getting late, huh? Yeah, stay with me here. We got two more hours. I'll give you a break in a minute. Let's say you want 200 grand a year. If you're going to do it at 99 bucks a pop, you need 2,000 of them. If you're going to do it at $4,000 a pop, you need 50. What do you think's harder? Finding 50 or finding 2,000? Finding 2,000 is harder at any price. 
And finding 2,000 and 99 is harder for a whole bunch of reasons, including the fact you don't have the money to spend to go find them. For a million, the numbers are even bigger. You want to do it at $99, you want to do a million dollars a year, you need 10,000 units. 10,000 units of something. Then you got to have infrastructure. You got to have somebody to ship 10,000 units. You got to have inventory at 10,000 units. You're handling returns from 10,000 units. You're keeping accounts on 10,000. Now, there's reasons. I mean, I can make uh, other cases, like building up a business to sell it. I mean, there's things we can talk about. But if you want maximum wealth from your own high transaction value, and even if you have low transactions, you ought to have a high transaction end of your business slack adjuster to make up some of the slack. That's the problem. Is Ott here? Aren't you? There, there you are. I mean, that's, that's your whole problem. You think it's because you're not getting done and you're not doing... See, so he, he can't... He's, a, he's an office supply, retail office supply business. Okay? And he's doing... Phenom- you can't do better marketing. Forget it. You aren't going to get any better. You're already great. You're just in a bad business. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you something. You can't fix bad economics with good marketing. You can't do it. I have clients trying to do it all the time. we got to make the ad better. Don't matter. If we double the results, you're still in the toilet. The math sucks. And we can't double the results anyway. We already got a good ad. I mean, I have a guy come to me this was about a month ago. He's got a full-page newspaper ad he's running. Halbert did it. It's good. At his worst, it's good. It appeared to me, looking at the ad, Halbert actually worked on this. <laughs> I mean, I mean, at some point in time, he, you know, focused. And he, and he did what he's capable of doing. Hey, let me tell you something. Pound for pound, dollar for dollar, he's so much better than I am, it isn't even funny. If you can get him to work. And this is good. And this guy comes to me and he wants to hire me because all he needs to make money is a 6% improvement in response. I said, are you out of your mind? And nobody's going to get it. It's not going to happen. I mean, I might, maybe, maybe, I might find a way to bump it a little. What I want to do is knock it off, you know? <laughs> the guy shows me his numbers, I'm thinking, you bonehead, give me this deal. All I got to do is raise the price, turn the offer from a single item into a silver gold, in, into an upsell level, add an upsell, change the back end. There's six million things I could do. This thing's running at a tiny little loss. Full-page newspaper ads all across the country. Oh, give it to me. He's wanting to fix the ad. You can't fix the ad. You've got to fix the math. A lot more ways to fix the math than there is to fix the ad. See, people think the solution to their problems is all in the marketing sector. That's good for me. All right? It's nice that they think that. They just too narrowly define what marketing is. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the answer's not there. And a lot of times, the answer's right here, transaction size. Because in many, many instances, it costs just as much to sell it for X as it does to sell it for Y. Larry said yesterday, doubled his transaction size. Yeah, he's about to have his $450,000 a month. Well, a year ago, that would have been a $225,000 a month because he doubled his price. Hadn't changed his conversions. Now, he's improved his marketing too, but hey, a lot of this is price. It's transaction size. And in many cases, there's elasticity. There's ways to move it. If you're selling too much, too easy, you know. Guys all know that. You know, we have that when we sell something one-on-one. Guy last week came home and said, you know, you want to sell that horse? I said, you bet. Everything's got a price. What do you want for it? 
I paid three for it. We're racing it in a $4,000 claiming race. He could actually go claim it for four like an idiot. I said five. He said, great. I have to check. Guess what I immediately think? Yeah. Could have got 5500 easy, and maybe I should have kept him. Um, <laughs> well, you always wanted more after, you know, before nobody wanted him but me. Now somebody wants him, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Um, uh, but, you know, we all go through this. So a lot of this is transaction size, okay? And a lot of people don't, don't work on it enough. Let's take our break. And when we come back, we'll go back to the Napoleon Hill W. Clement Stone question. I earlier, I meant to mention, and I didn't, and now the page is gone. Ah, nuts, the marker's gone. These are, um, these are the Napoleon Hill magazines Phil brought from 1921. And um, there was something I was going to read you, but not. Uh, Phil, oh, here it is. First, one of the interesting things, by the way, a lot of people didn't know this about Hill either. I mean, he wound up, you know, being rescued by Clem and making a lot of money, enough money, late in his life as a sales trainer. Uh, but Hill supported himself his entire life uh, as a direct response copywriter and kind of an itinerant sales trainer. And he did a lot of it. And uh, the one thing the old guy knew how to do was pitch and get a check. And the magazine... There's one pitch after another. It's magnificent. It's the pitches to hire him to speak, pitches for seminars, pitches for books based on lectures. I mean, the thing's at least half pitch. Um, this just kind of links to the all news is good news deal. Um, and of course, nothing is new. Here's an ad for a new lecture by Napoleon Hill, The End of the Rainbow. It's brief, I'll read it to you. Uh, this lecture, like all of Mr. Hill's others, is built out of his own experience. It covers the seven turning points of his life, each of which was marked by what looked to be an irreparable failure. Throughout this entire lecture, a certain principle may be seen, running like a golden thread that binds each incident of the experience into a guiding line that leads finally to the end of the rainbow. The lecture will take you back into your yesterdays. It will bring back to memory those disappointments which seemed to end your happiness but later turned out to be blessings in disguise. It will carry you back over a pathway that was laden with thorns and watered with tears back to the day that Napoleon Hill first began as a laborer in the coal mines. After you have gone with Napoleon Hill down through the valley of the shadow and up over the mountains of toilsome heights to the end of the rainbow, you will love mankind more than you did before. You will be more tolerant than you were before. You will be bigger and broader than you ever were before. And you will be inspired to undertake more than you ever thought of undertaking before. This lecture is Mr. Hill's crowning career masterpiece, and if he never contributes anything else for the good of this and future generations, this one lecture is enough to ensure him a place in the hearts of his fellow man for a long time after he has passed over the Great Divide. And then, of course, there's, there's a call to action. It's great copy. Uh, all right, so our friend Napoleon Hill winds up, after all of this, having to be hired by W. Clement Stone. W. Clement Stone is inspired by Napoleon Hill and winds up with a ton of money. A number of differences, many of which we talked about during the day, but here's the big one. Now, if you remember, we talked about the title of Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. Who knows the title of Clem Stone's book? Tell you that, okay, his first, I'm sorry, his first book. That book stinks. Yeah. Bingo, The Success System That Never Failed. It is the book you should read. But you don't have to read it to get this, because he put it in the title. The difference is on page 66, and the key word is system. Throughout his entire life, Napoleon Hill never devised any system for turning himself and his content into money. He had an unsystemized business. W. Clement Stone applied the philosophy in an environment where he was able to create a marketing and mostly, a, in his day, a manual labor selling system that was reliable and predictable. It used human labor, but pretty much did not require good human labor. They could be plugged in and out. He had a true sales system, 
And that's the difference. If you look at, if you look at Guthy Ranker, now I started to work with Guthy Ranker when they thought, talk about restricting modus operandi, they thought they were going to be the infomercial company that sold the world self-improvement and success information. It's why they got into the business. Well, they got into the business for a money reason, too. Uh, Bill was manufacturing all the tapes for the Get Rich and Real Estate guys who did the first infomercials, and he, and he understands margin. We got 50 cents worth of cost of goods. We're selling this thing to them for 57 cents a tape. They're selling it for 50 bucks a tape. Be better to be on their end of the deal. So there was profound money motivation, but also, um, uh, uh, Bill particularly, um, uh, in, in love with, as many of us have been at any one given point in our time, self-improvement, wanted to share it with the world, and so they believed they were going to be the self-improvement company driven by infomercials. Hence the first show, Think and Grow Rich, done with the foundation. The second show, Personal Power, done with Tony. Gradually came to realize that it was hard, that, that now you would pretty much exhausted the ability to have hits, uh, discovered how hard it is to sell self-improvement, um, but had made it, but knew how to make infomercials work. If you look at the company today, which the year, the first year Tony was on the air, they maybe did 20 million. Last year, maybe 750 million. This is a big business. But the business is nothing like it was. But the business is now systemized. And all they're doing is cloning the same system over and over again. And I've said many times there's a lot of things they don't do well, but there's enough things they do really, really well, and they've gradually decided to do only those things they do really, really, really well, that therefore they're making a lot of money. They've mastered continuity, continuity retention, Continuity marketing, they've mastered continuity of consumable products, and they got it down to a science. And so if you analyze their business today, it's the proactive acne treatment business, the Victoria Principal skin care business, the comprehensive vitamin business, and anything else that they attempt fits the same system. It's got a star. It's got a consumable product that you either smear on, you eat one way or another. It's the old Rich DeVos rule. One way or another, it's got to eventually go down the sink. Okay? It's got to get used up, so they need more of it. And now we can auto ship it every month. Okay? So everything fits that system. And then everything's the same. Everything to retain the customer is the same. Everything to upsell the customer is the same. Everything to expand the product line is the same. The move from the infomercial to QVC is the same. Everything's the same. It's just what's the next thing we can plug into the system. The wealthiest people I know, their businesses operate by system or systems. And the total absence of them is a real problem. It's not one that you can't necessarily overcome especially if you can make money in big chunks. Uh, but still, it's much better to be systemized. I've never completely achieved it in my business. I have systems. I don't have the most important one, um, which is customer acquisition. My system for customer acquisition for 15 years was manual labor. The fallacy of that system is if you don't want to do the manual labor anymore, you ain't got no system. Um, and when you're not niched, it's very hard to conquer that particular part of the business. Uh, not a mountain I want to climb at this particular point in my life, but, um, and it's a mountain Napoleon Hill was never able to climb. Tried a lot of things, by the way. Franchised, like Dale Carnegie, tried to franchise. Um, tried the seminar sales system route with the local coordinator and the sales team. I mean, they did a lot of stuff. He did a lot of things. Could never... Could, could never get the front-end system right. W. Clement Stone applied the philosophy in an environment where you could get a system right. Don Dwyer, who was a client of mine, um, was at one time um, uh, the marketing slash recruiting director for SMI, Success Motivation Institute, which sold a franchise to be in the success business. 
to the best of our knowledge, there is one successful franchisee. Um, thousands of franchises sold every year, up until recently, one successful franchisee. After a few years, Don made the W. Clement Stone decision. We got a system that works, except we're applying it to the wrong thing, because it's too hard to take Joe Spadats off the street, who's inspired, and have him go out and sell success. We can't get John able and prepared to do that. We can sell to John, we can get John to come up with five grand, 10 grand, 15 grand to buy our franchise. Now John can't do the franchise. So Don started Rainbow Carpet Cleaning and sold carpet cleaning franchises. Did everything else the same. Same advertising, same marketing, same bring them to Waco every weekend. And so for a while, the only people coming to Waco, except that one time, <laughs> the, um, are, are the only people coming to Waco every weekend. It's not like a tourist attraction, you know. Uh, we're, we're all coming there for, to be sold by SMI. Now, every Friday, there's all the SMI guys arriving and there's all the rainbow carpet cleaning guys arriving. And they're going off to their respective seminars and the seminars are like almost the same, all head trip stuff. Just at the end, the thing you're going to apply your newfound soaring confidence and sales skills and ambition to is not the success business, it's the carpet cleaning business. Why? Because it's easier to take John off the street and, can, and teach him how to go get a carpet cleaning customer. And once he's got one, his confidence builds a little more, and then he gets another one. Rainbow, over a handful of years, sold about the same number of franchises that SMI did, and they have hundreds, if not thousands, of successful franchisees. Look in the yellow pages in your city, you're probably going to find one. You're probably not going to find an SMI guy. So the philosophy works. It mostly doesn't work to sell itself. And there are certain environments where, for one reason or another, like we have to fix Ott's business, you could apply all the philosophy and all the profound marketing you want, you want, but the business is still flawed to such a degree that it doesn't matter. If you can't systemize it, it may be so flawed, it doesn't matter. And so the difference between Hill and Stone was systems. And if you read the two books now side by side or one behind the other, um, you will uh, see a dramatic difference. Um, I got some. Okay. We want to do these questions. Yeah. Oh, this is a leftover one. I like this. I want to do this, though. It's Ron Carruthers. It's the one you chose to skip. Uh, Ron's still here? Okay. I didn't have the stones to ask this during his presentation, but what in the hell does Tom Morent do to justify his $48,000 fee for his coaching program? I'm not complaining. I'm intrigued. Uh, and then the form, the, the form from yesterday had a place for second choice question. No second choice. Answer my first one. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> and you ask because the price point surprises you. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, let me suggest a better question. The better question would have been, rather than, what the hell does Tom O'Rent do to justify his $48,000 fee? The better question would be, how does Tom Orrent sell his $48,000 coaching program? Okay? Because the sales mechanism is far more useful for you to discover than is what is being de delivered. However, since you asked the wrong question, you get the answer to the wrong question. <laughs> um, we have a joke, in the because Tom's a VIP member, and this was kind of birthed in the coaching program, our joke is, this is his for $48,000, I'll be your friend program. Um, uh, 
these are dentists. These are cosmetic dentists, high-end cases. Okay? The, transaction, the average transaction size is between thirty and forty thousand dollars. Therefore, the justification, regardless of the delivery, is all you need is one really good case all year long. You wouldn't have got otherwise, and the program costs you nothing. If we can't get you one, we should both be shot. If you only got two, you wouldn't have got otherwise. You got 100% return on your investment. Right. Now, there's a lesson there. It's the need to make whatever they buy free. That's why the pots and pans are free, because you save so much on utility and you save so much on food that really these $1,700 pots and pans don't cost you anything. Surely you'd want them for free. Okay. The window replacements don't cost you anything because you save so much on heating and cooling. The new windows pay for themselves. You know, bill collector, bill collector called the blonde, said, hey, you haven't you've had these windows for two years. You haven't made a payment. She said, you told me in two years they paid for themselves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everything needs to pay for itself. Okay. And so part of the selling argument, that the amount you can get is determined in a business-to-business -business environment, and a lot of times it's determined by what their transaction size is and how you can make the argument that they're going to get the money back and then some. So he is fortunate for starters to be in an environment where his customer has such a high transaction value, which allows him to make a low hurdle argument of how this can be free. If he's selling the same coaching program to chiropractors, average case maybe is four thousand dollars. Takes ten patients you wouldn't have got otherwise. So the dollar relationship and the way you figure out how to make the price go away, the investment is irrelevant, is very, very, very important. Now, the delivery, it's really very much a standard. Um, it's very much like Gold Plus VIP for dentists. Okay? They meet several times a year for roundtable brainstorming sessions. The group size is limited. Uh, they have telephone coaching time. They get his lower levels of things bundled in. They come to the annual event for free. They have one 911 emergency thing that they can get to them if they need them within 48 hours. And so it's a coaching package. Hmm? No, he sends somebody. Staffed goes. No, first year he went. Staff goes. And there's a trainer. Um, um, there is a $70,000 program as well. Um, no one has bought it yet, but it helps sell the $48,000 program. <laughs> you didn't ask that question, but... All right. Oh, here's a goodie. Okay, that was, if you're keeping track, Michael, that was Ron Carruthers. Hey, you know, okay. Greg Neal. Greg here? Greg here? Too bad, it's a good question. Well, he can't win a prize. Funny question. Is there any way to get your attention without having to pay you a massive amount of cash? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, no. no. <laughs> um, hey, fire didn't work. Fire no, it was on fire. I, you know, it took time for get to get my attention. And I was still trying to finish the phone call. Yeah. You couldn't park your Jaguar in the garage with a tarp on it? Yeah. Your attention? Yeah. Well, that might. <laughs> um, briefly, though. Um, you have four months and a bomb... Oh, here, 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 here you go, pa Pamela. Uh, whoever's got a mic, we need to get Pamela a mic. This, this is so easy, Pamela's going to answer it. <laughs> this is worse than I thought, though. You have four months... We'll make it 12 months if that helps you. And a bomb has been implanted inside of you. If you do not generate $1 million, the bomb detonates. 
you can't use any of your current contacts or anyone you know. <laughs> we'll leave that part out. I'll answer that part. Okay, you got a year. Okay. Okay. Well, actually, four months, I guess. Yeah, I'll give you 12. Right, you give because, me a year. Because your story is 12, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I didn't 12 is good enough. Okay. <laughs> Well, there, I, the reason you're throwing that question to me is that uh, I, about a little over a year ago, I sold my company, and I um, proceeded to get it back about three months later, <laughs> which was not quite what I had in mind, was not what I was looking for, and uh, I... It, but it opened my eyes, and, and so I really had this opportunity. I was, I was basically bored with a lot of what I was doing, uh, I know. It, it, nonetheless, I was bored with what I was doing, so I, um, I thought, you know, this is my opportunity to really start fresh. I could do anything I want. Not only that, what about all the stuff I've learned over the years through Dan and all of my other mentors? And what if I actually used all that stuff right from the start of building a business? And uh, so, what happened? It was it was about almost a, a year ago today that I uh, got the business back. And then I, I just thought, all, all these things that I've learned, like for example, one thing that Dan always said that really struck me, and you didn't come up with this but yourself, but it was just like the principle of massive action. And I got, I decided I'm not gonna do things on a small level anymore. I'm gonna do things big. And I work in a niche industry. I work in the uh, financial service. I work with insurance agents and financial services agents and so on. And it's, a, it's not a tiny industry, but it's not huge. But I wanted to stay within the niche, and I wanted to do something totally new, but I wanted to do it on a massive scale. And uh, so what, the other thing that happened was I decided that I wasn't even going to promote my own stuff, which, you know, I mean, that was a big, little bit of an ego blow. Um, Many years ago when I first met Dan and I started consulting with him, he told me, he sa I, I, I said, you know, I sell mostly to financial services professionals. Ninety percent of my clients are male. And here's what my closing ratio is and here's what my back of the room ratio is. And he says, well, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are. There's going to be some men that are never, ever going to buy from a woman, which was total news to me, you know. <laughs> Because <laughs> I never had any kind of image of a glass ceiling or anything like that. But uh, everything that kind of came together, I ended up promoting somebody else's idea who had a wonderful idea that, but had never really been able to promote it, didn't understand anything about marketing, and he had remained a, a, a total secret. And in a, I'm just going to give you a nutshell of what it is. Basically, it's a way to recapture all of the interest that you pay to credit card companies to uh, car finance companies for your mortgage and so on, recapturing all that money that would normally just piss away and give to banks and finance companies, put it back in your pocket, plus quite a bit more, usually double or triple that amount. And so I took somebody else's concept, started promoting him, and um, used everything you have ever taught me about about marketing in terms of customer ac acquisition. We went to, you know, I didn't have enough customers to, of my own to do this on that, that level. So we started going to joint venture partners. We started buying customers through associations. We started buying customers through uh, the, the uh, different media that, that advertise and that, that have connections with our customers. And we did it just on a, on a, on a much bigger scale. And um, we're getting numbers that none of my colleagues in the industry have seen in terms of number of people that will like sign up for a teleseminar or sign up, show interest in this particular topic. And um, part of, the, of, of doing that was I did a massive amount of work on all the principles that you're talking about here today. It isn't enough to just have, it wasn't enough to just have learned all those things from marketing. And it, it wasn't enough to have a great idea that everybody seems to want to get their hands on. But I mean, every single, every single day, I spend probably close to a minimum of one hour every single day just on wealth attraction principles alone. And I, I, I've done it more religiously, I've done it more uh, formally than I've ever done it before, and all I can tell you is that it works. I mean, it just works incredibly. And your, your psycho-cybernetics program is phenomenal. Everybody in this room should have it if it's still even available. Yep, yep, yep. So in 12 months, you went from zero to we what? From to a standing start to what? From a standing start to a million dollars. Good.
Thank you. <laughs> right, right. Knowing what you know now, what would you do differently to create and retain wealth if you were just starting out today? <clears throat> Whose is that? Yours? And your name for scoring purposes? Denise Clement. Denise what? Clement. Clement. Probably only going to be one Denise. You can just get close. <laughs> close enough for government work. Knowing what you know now, what would you do differently to create and retain wealth if you were just starting out today? Well, I mean, my dream is, you know, a second life, but keep the brain. Um, I'd niche. I'd niche rather than being a gen generalist. Um, uh, simply because it's easier. Um, it's much easier to solve the customer acquisition system part of the problem. Um, I would, um, hmm. I do what Pamela said, I would probably, because I do it now and I didn't do it early, I would work more on the head trip stuff every day in a more formalized way uh, rather than catch as catch can, you know. Mean? Well. Uh, uh, a scheduled time, block time for it, uh, a curriculum plan, you know, rather than uh, listen to this tape, listen to that tape, idea here, idea there. I don't, I don't know that it's fair to say I would have changed any of the evolution of the business or not. Um, I would have been selling at higher prices early. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind now, for example, that our success track business in chiropractic and dental, we should have been at twice the price we were from day one. Um, so God knows I made that mistake. Um, I would have, this is small, but I would have bought my own office building. Um, I'd like to have all recapture the interest. I'd like to have all the rent. All right, we got, what's the biggest difference in thinking that can take people from a million a year to 10 mil million a year, year or more? Whose is that? Hmm? Anybody? Could to claim it? If you're not going to claim it, I'm not going to answer. Yeah, I'll claim it. <laughs> you said you didn't... I want to hear your answer. <laughs> <laughs> you the title? No. No. no, but but we'll give him a running shot at it. Yeah, 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 give him credit. Put him in the contest as if it was his question because we're going to make him answer it. Oh. <laughs> Where's the mic? You were in like the last two days, didn't you? Huh? Yeah. Well, he's smart enough to answer this question. He doesn't need me to answer this question. All right. You've gone from zero in your business to what in how many years? Yeah, and, uh, to whatever, between uh, a million and 10 million. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mul multiple millions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you ain't working all, all that hard. No, we take vacation. Yeah, yeah but come vacation. on, this, this this boy works damn hard. <laughs> huh? This boy works damn hard. Oh, please. Oh, please. I'm, so, uh, what, I'm, I'm not shoveling ditches, but... So, know, what's, what's the answer? It's hard work. Do you want to uh, hear your question again? No, I know the question. Okay. I know the question. All right, off the top of my head. Delegate everything on my plate as fast as I can. Only do the stuff that I know makes money. Uh, do lots of stuff that doesn't make money, but I don't know it till the market tells me and I get kicked in the ass. Uh, so execute really, really fast. Um, That's a biggie. Yeah, execute really fast. But, but that only happens with the first one, which is because I, I keep creating stuff to do. I got to just spin it off and find other people to do it as fast as I can. Uh, well, we we do a number of things, uh, mostly having to do with marketing and advertising and entrepreneurship in the insurance industry. That's a vague answer, but we've got four businesses, so um, you yeah, know, lots the, of stuff in that area. The question specifically is difference in thinking. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, number one, I ain't the only guy that can do really important stuff. Uh, I may be the only guy that can do the, the highest level of marketing in my business, but there's a lot of stuff in the business that I'm really, really good at and tend to hold on to. 
So not going to get to 10 mil on your own. I ain't going to get to 10 million on my own. That's the um, biggest bad news part of the answer to this question. Yeah, it's going it, to be very tough. What's if that? You like, yeah. It's going to be very yeah, tough. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, I, I mean it, it's going like to require it, it's going to require uh, growth in team. Yeah. I mean, if you yeah. like to play it lean and mean like I do, you're going to in most in our kind of businesses in information driven service driven businesses, you're going to cap out at right around two and a half to three mil a year. And you're not going to be able to go any farther without people. Yeah, I, I would say that's a really big difference in thinking. Mm -hmm. is is the um, the plate of stuff that I think a lot of entrepreneurs tend to hold on to is uh, and, and they're good at um, is a lot of there's a lot of stuff on that plate and they ought to probably get rid of 90 percent of it because that it's it's isolating those two or three things that make a lot of money that you should be spending almost all your time on mm -hmm. all right. In my area, I'm the best marketer at what I do, which he is. In your area, hell, probably in the country, he's in the painting business. My competition doesn't come close. So since this is the case, the question in short is, how come I'm not rich? <laughs> this is a very good question, right? because it applies to a lot of people. And there's several parts to the answer. One is the business itself doesn't lend itself to making you rich. I was afraid you were going to say that. Well, I didn't tell you you were going to like it. You know, you want you want you want an answer you like, or you want a good okay. All right, it's a business that doesn't lend itself, right? Uh, it's very hard for you to multiply yourself. I'm not going to say it's impossible, and it's probably a line of thinking you should already be involved in. Franchising, licensing, licensing the marketing system. You know, they finally managed, one of my coaching members is the guy that owns the big handyman fran franchise company. And they're managing to the franchise handyman services. Right. So I wouldn't rule it out, but it's not like it's, you know, Hamburger bun, picture on the wall, what the sandwich is supposed to look like. Um, it, it's, a, it's a business in your area to even double the business, your problems, people, more than it is marketing and supervising in such a way that you can deliver quality work. Another reason is what he just described. Right? Is there stuff you're hanging on to and doing that unless you stop doing it and go and do the next level of things to grow the business, you're in the way of the business growing. And you may have to temporarily take a hit. This goes back to what you wanted to talk more about. I said yesterday, or the day before, it's all a blur now, um, after a very long-winded prelude that I won't put the people who are here only today through, that you can really get good at a set of skills that totally are in your way of developing the set of skills you need to do the next level or the next thing you want to do. And so, for example, you can be so good at financial survival, I mean, uh, half of them wouldn't apply today because a lot of things have changed, but I mean, you know, I, I lived pretty good even when I was broke. And I mean, I, I mastered survival skills. I know every which way there is to float a check. I know. I mean, listen, I had checking accounts four different parts of the country. So you could write it from the furthest point away to the place that it needed to go and buy the float. I know about you take the X-Acto knife and cut through the numbers, which takes it out of the automated sort and into the manual sort, buys you two days. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I got a lot of survival skills. Does that bother you? Oh, uh, you never knew that? I'm surprised. I, um, I, uh, but, but here's the problem: you get so good at the financial survival skills, they're in your way of developing prosperity skills. The analogy I used the other day from personal experience is: you can get so good. If you have a drinking problem, you can get so good at the skills of functioning drunk 
that they're in a way of the skill of getting sober. So in your business, and I know your deal because you're, you know, you're in the coaching program, like one of the things you're really, really good at is the personal sale. And that's a set of skills you've mastered and you're good at and you're, as he said, loath to let go of, but there's no way in hell your business can ever make you rich as long as you're doing the personal selling. So take Chet Rowland, who's here. Now, Chet, in the pest control business, is like you are in your painting business. He goes out and makes a call, he'll close them. Right? If you go do a, tent, a termite tent presentation, what's your closing rate? Well, I get most of them, but you're always going to have the guy that just wants to lowball this. Yeah, I know. You're going to be, I know. You want them all. But I mean, you're like, what, 80% plus? Yeah. What's your best guy? Uh, probably 52. Yeah. Okay. He's got to be willing to calibrate the economics of the business to be okay at a 50% close rate and not go make the sales calls. And the temptation, because otherwise he can't have. How many customers you got? Oh, I got over 3,000 actually. Okay. And how many pest sprayer guys you got? I got five guys that actually brought Tex. So you can't do that if he's going to go sell every new account. So even though he's got the best skills, and even though he can't replicate himself, he'll never get any of these guys to 80%. He could train them from now until doomsday, and he ain't going to get them to 80%. But... No way he's going to get that business to a size where he can sell it for a ton of dough and walk away and be rich with him going out and making all the sales calls. And you just sold Orlando, didn't you? You sold one city. So there's a lot to it. There's the business itself. There's how can we re-engineer, reinvent the business. See, because lots of businesses can get, you can make a living in a lot of businesses. You can make a very good living in a lot of businesses. You can be a high-income person doing everything yourself. It's very hard, though, doing everything yourself in a traditional business. See, there's no way in your business with my anathema to employees and excess... See, I couldn't do your business. And doing it alone, you know... See, I can do mine alone, and I was able to generate enough income to achieve my wealth goals but I'm in a big high transaction price elastic business. I'm able to transcend billable hours by the royalties where I'm getting paid for something I wrote five years ago, multiple streams of income from the same client. I got a lot, you know, I got a lot of opportunities that you don't have in your business. So you've got to figure out a way to re-engineer that business. You got to take a look at getting out of your own way. I mean, there's very real reasons why, the answer to your question, why you're not rich, that have absolutely nothing to do with either your technical competence or your marketing competence and may not have much to do with this head trip stuff. So in essence, it's the same day I'm thinking, when I started in the business, I was completely alone with painting with a lower brush and sprayer. I had to let go at some point to hire employees who weren't as good as me to get that decision emotionally do that. That's right. Now you got the same emotional hurdle, you know, if you were going to say, for example, now go work four cities instead of one and have a joint venture partner in each city and you're going to control the marketing and they're going to have the crews, you got to make the emotional adjustment never to go make a sales call again, right? That's the deal. That's the answer. And it's kind of the million to 10 million. It's the, you know, it's all of that. And it's very hard for the sole proprietor, particularly in a service business, to let go of doing the service. That's the first problem. And he got over that because he says he used to be the guy who, ro who rolled the paint in the carpet cleaning industry, getting them to have a second truck and send somebody out to do the job is like pulling teeth because they know the guy's not going to do the job the way they would do the job. They fear the reprisals, the reputation damage. They know the guy's going to quit, and they're going to have to replace him, all that stuff. But you can't make, you hit the ceiling. So you got through this once. Now, the good news is you already know how to get through it. See, it's what I say to people. 
I told people earlier, when I started harness racing driving, awful. I mean, God awful. I'm barely competent now. I've crawled my way from awful to barely competent. All right? But here's the deal. Well, but here's the deal. Everything I've ever done, I was awful when I started. I know the process. I know how to get from awful to competent to good to really good. I know the process. It's a system. I can overlay it on just about anything. Right? I've already been through the process. I know, I know what's going to happen next. I mean, I can feel it happening. So you've already been through this process. Now you've got to take the process you already did successfully once and apply it to the new set of circumstances you have to conquer. Then you can get rich. And you just got a lot of value. You're welcome. Um, Ah Chin, when you were at, this is Ah Chin for the scoring purposes. When you were at your lowest point in your life financially, what steps did you do to start thinking about breaking through all the bleakness? I strongly suggest to you a trip to the record store and buy a lot of comedy CDs. Um, that's a practical answer, and also you need to lighten up, my man. Bleakness. <laughs> what a word. <laughs> uh, uh, I hurt. Bleakness. <laughs> What's the phrase I always said? I'm, I've been... I've been broke, but I've never been poor. Um, broke's a temporary condition. Poor is a state, state of mind. Broke's fixable. Poor is a lot harder to fix. Here's, here's the most practical answer to your question, though. When you're in a crisis or survival or perplexed or fix-it mode, make this a short answer because it probably just apply to many people in the room you simultaneously must create, have, and be working on a more exciting plan to do something big. Variation of what she, she did. If she had come, because this business in three months was a mess. I don't know. I mean, it, was, it wasn't great when you gave it to them, and then it was a mess when you got it back. Right? Like, probably a big mess. Right? Yeah. If she came back to that thing and all she worked on was the crisis, how can I fix this? How can I stick a thumb in this hole? Just to kind of get it back to where it was, she might never have got that done because of all the attitudinal issues. Okay? But she did that while at the same time whole new big exciting plan that motivated her and was inspiring to her mm -hmm. um, I never wound up doing it but for example um, in 19 um, let's see when did I get general I got general in 1979 in 1979 or 1980 whichever it was when I got general set corporation I mean this is a company that is doing a million dollars a year gross and managing to lose a billion a year. Um, this thing didn't have a, this thing the entire time I had the company, we never had a positive check, checkbook balance. I would, I mean, who knows what that is? Um, and this thing, especially early on, state of massive crisis. Uh, we had really severe quality control problems. Uh, we had massive absenteeism problems with 42 people but never on any one day. Um, um, we had like 80% of our product, something was wrong with it. Labeled wrong, content wrong, packed wrong, went to the wrong place. Our assembly line was like gods for snowflakes. Every item unique. Um, um, Old shtick. Rolls around in the subconscious. Um, um, and, and, and I mean, so and vendors cutting you off, not shipping stuff. I mean, every day was crisis. 
And from the moment, you know, first thing in the morning to the end of the day, there's always one problem after another. You know? And part of it, if all you did was focus on the survival, and I did for a little while, and it, to my detriment, I mean, I'd have gone nuts if I hadn't been simultaneously working on a bigger, better plan. I mean, at the time, one of the things I was working on was buying Nightingale Conant. Never did it, but it was part of the bigger, better plan. The bigger, better plan changed, but nevertheless, if I had just been working on the stick the whole thumb in the dike deal, you know, I'd have found a tall building somewhere probably before that thing was over with. I mean, because it is ugly. And so the answer to this question is, it's almost the same answer as to Bob. I mean, you've got to get, Vance's term, you've got to get out of the little box you're in and completely re-engineer your business plan. Doesn't mean you've got to quit the business you're in. But you got to completely re-engineer your business plan. You know, I mean, not that this is your answer, but remember, Quill, who I'm sure you gnash your teeth every time you see their catalog out, but Quill, which I believe is now the largest mail-order marketer of office supplies in the country, that was two guys in a little office supply store somewhere who weren't making any money. They had a retail store, and they were getting their butt kicked. And that was before Office Max. And those guys, new plan. All right. So the answer is you got to be working, even if you're fighting for survival half the day, the other half of the day, you better be working on something that's exciting, that gets the creative juices going, that keeps you sane, that, you know, so you got to be running two things at the same time. Um, Okay, Robert um, Scrob, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, the first one's more general. Obviously, you work more on your business than in it. Um, you may give me a little more credit than I deserve. <laughs> Obviously, you work more on your business than in it. What are the skills that you have developed to leave the details to others uh, or to chance? Is that the rest of the question? To change from okay. Side, uh, okay. So that you can sell. Okay. Let me give you a useful answer, but that is that answers actually a slightly different question. Here's a regimen most people would not think I have, because I cultivate that I because I try and convey that I don't. Every single day, no matter what I am doing in the business. I make sure I've done at least one thing to fill the pipeline with new business. I'm not going to go to sleep without doing one. Last night I had to do it when I got home. This morning I did it at 5.30 in the morning before I left. Got one fax out. Only got one. But I got one. I'm going to do something every single day, no matter what I'm doing, to fill the pipeline with new business. Because otherwise, at some point in time, the pipeline's empty. Maybe not. Maybe mine would fill itself now. But I got enough paranoia. And it's Andy Grove at Intel who said, you know, paranoia is healthy. Charlie Jarvis said, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Yeah. Um, um, so, no matter how much you're in, see, now, like, his challenge is to get out and work on. And it's more of a, like Michael said, it's more of an emotional adjustment, you know, of letting go of things and letting them not be the way you would do them or as good as you would do them. And so, with Carla and now Vicky in the office, I don't go there. Never did, no matter how much time I spent in Phoenix, no matter how much time, not in the office. Used to make the joke, disturbs the staff. It does. I never went there. Why? Too small of an office. I hear things. And I hear stuff that's not happening the way I would do it. And I'm going to be in it. 
All right? And I'm going to be working on it. And am I going to make it better? Yeah. Am I going to force them temporarily to do it exactly my way? Yeah. But the numbers are okay the way it is. So I leave them alone. I'm the macro manager and have been for years. I mean, there's stuff I couldn't tell you how it's getting done. You know, I think he came in and, you know, Carl to her credit built her a monstrous procedure manual and everything the way it was being. She says, can I change? I said, I don't care what's changed. Do it any way you want to do it. I don't even want to know. I'll fuss about it if, if my numbers go bad. But otherwise, I don't care. Move the furniture, make it blue, change the filing system. I don't care. The only things I, the only mandate I got is we do refunds first thing in the day. That's the only mandate I got. Other than that, I don't care. Make the list different. Is it the way I do the list? No. Is it the way I? But you know, so you got to let it be. Just like Chet has to be okay with a 52% close when he knows he could get 80. You know. And the carpet cleaning guy's got to be okay with the fact that they're not going to move the heaviest piece of furniture in order to clean behind it. She's never going to know the difference. The guy they send out on the truck is going to clean around it, and he would move it. But to have a second truck, so it's, this is emotional stuff more than it is practical stuff. You know, and you buy the time that you, to use the Gerber terminology, you buy the time to work on the business purely by not working in the business. Can't do both, right? Can't do both. Now, I've never, I won't say never, maybe four or five times in my entire life have I used a junior copywriter to do rough, rough drafts for clients and then fixed it. I always, I do that myself. That's working in the business. I have done it for my own stuff, by the way, but I haven't done it to clients. Right? Um, but there are, there are people in my business who do, and it buys them time to work on the business. Because something that I would bill at $30,000, you could pay a junior copywriter 3000 bucks to get you to rough draft, and it's perfectly acceptable. Uh, it's, it, it's, so you could fault me for that. Um, but you look for things that you can unload that aren't deadly, that aren't fatal, you know, that aren't crippling, you know. I mean, in the tr transition and in the change now, and, and it's, no, you know, there's some mistakes made, but, you know, none of them are fatal, none of them are crippling, and, and, and none of them have affected my numbers. And it's all about the numbers. You've got to get yourself a herd. It ties to what we talked about earlier, the contact with the end user, you know, the customer. You've got to control the end user. In my type of business, which would affect Bert, Michael, Pamela, a lot of people in the room, in my type of business, there's a formula. 2,000 herd, million dollars plus a year. How many millions a year you want? It's as predictable as the day is long. Give me the 2,000, I get you the mill. Huh? Net. Net. Um, people in all kinds of businesses. Now, the exception to this is the high transaction value business where there's no lasting lifetime customer value and there's trade-offs pro and con to that. You know, the guy selling a $45,000 cosmetic dentistry case, uh, should he worry about putting people on a continuity program from mouthwash and toothpaste to $29 a month? The answer is no. Just go get another $40,000 deal. Okay. Um, but for the most part, the surest wealth formula is a herd. Raving fans who will give you money repetitively for whatever it is that you do. And a lot of businesses understand focus on this principle. They just, they, they're based on the principle. They just don't really do it very well. Guy owns a chain of hair salons. What's that business all about, really? It's about the herd. It's about the customers who will come back month after month after month after month after month and not go anywhere else and come in there and get their hair done. It's about the herd. It's a herd business. 
Now, most people running it don't thoroughly get it. They kind of do, but they don't get it the way we get it. For example, they may be leaving the contact of the customer up to the stylus. So they're doing that, they don't understand the, the wealth is in the herd. Got to own the herd. The stylus are replaceable. Mm -hmm. What happens in the hair business, by the way, more often than not, because of this, stylus moves, takes customers with her. She's usually pretty successful at taking 70 or 80 percent of them. If the guy owning the salons was really doing his job, she'd barely get 20. Mm -hmm. Big difference. I've seen it both ways. I've had the same hairstylist, by the way, for 28 years. Longest relationship I've ever had with a woman. <laughs> um, I can't count the number of salons she's been in. I've lost track. Moves, 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 moves. Doesn't matter. I've trekked right along. So have a whole slew of her other customers. For the most part, you really need to focus on this. W. Clement Stone devised a system to build a herd. His business had renewable income. He was in the insurance business. You should either have big transactions, and then you don't care about this, or you should have renewable income and continuity income, or both. W. Clement Stone built, applied the philosophy, had a marketing, had a sales system, built a herd. Ultimately, he sold his herd for a ton of dough. I don't remember now what a GS paid for combined insurance companies of America, but big. Right. The herd has value. Napoleon Hill never developed a herd. You asked me earlier, how many people have you influenced? God knows, Hill, millions, millions. They sell like 100,000 copies of the book every year by accident. No promotion, no nothing. Millions of people influenced. No herd. In our speaking business, there aren't 10 of me. But there's people who could be. Zig's one. Certainly far more people influenced by him than I would ever dream of. I love him more. He's more lovable. <laughs> Hadn't got a herd. Only as good as tomorrow's gig. Any business where you're only as good as tomorrow's gig would scare me. So a restaurant owner, how much business are you going to do today? I don't know. Depends on who comes in. Oh, no, no good. <laughs> Bad answer. Got to know ahead of time how many are coming in. You got to have some of them who bought membership cards that are dinging their card every month and shipping them five coupons for the meals they're going to come in and buy. I mean, you got to re-engineer that business. You got to have a herd. You got to have such a program for them, they're going to come in three times a week instead of one time a week. You got on and on and on and on. The, most, the best practical advice I can give you is continuity income, renewable income, build a herd. Fence them in. Keep them. Watch out for poachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take good care of them. Nurture them. Spend money on them a little. Right. They'll support you in style. But the people without a herd are vulnerable all the time. Yes. Uh, is this on? Yep. Uh, you mentioned one of the factors in your success was uh, your self-discipline. Uh, besides your upbringing, was there anything you did deliberately to develop more self-discipline? Anything we can learn about that? Is that psycho-cybernetics too, or what? Um, it beats starving. Um, <laughs> um, when you're short on talent, discipline's the best substitute. When you're short on talent, discipline's the best substitute. So, uh, but some upbringing. You know, as an aside, we've discovered a, a hiring secret. You and I have talked about it. Would you guys like to know how to actually dramatically improve your chances of hiring somebody worth having? My clients and my platinum members and I have finally all agreed on a valid litmus test. Here it is. Don't hire anybody whose parents didn't run a business and the kid worked in the business. 
One more time. They don't hire anybody who didn't work in their parents' business. They were growing up, their parents had some kind of a small business. A restaurant's real good because they worked long hours, they worked odd hours, they didn't get to go do some of the things that the other kids got to do because they had to work, it was grunt work, they didn't like it, uh, and, they, and they learned work ethic, and they learned discipline. And we were talking about this and talking about this and talking about this, and gradually it's so profound, it's so evident for every one of us in either the best people we've ever had or the only ones we've ever had worth keeping, uh, this is the commonality. Um, and so some of it was upbringing, but some of it was discovery. Hey, see, I, you know, John Carlton's deal that, you know, nothing in life, nothing on the planet would ever have happened without a deadline. You know, we must assume that God made the decision he was going to rest on the seventh day before he started the process, you know, <laughs> or presumably earth would still be happening, you know. Um, so it's deadlines. I mean, I, you know, I'm disciplined, but I'm lazy. I mean, like anybody else, I get me into gear ain't the easiest thing on the planet. And so deadlines are what do it. I had a good day. I hope you had a good day. Appreciate your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you.